audio. A movie in your mind. Graphic Audio presents DC Comics It's Superman by Tom DeHaven. Copyright 2014 DC Comics. Superman and all related characters and elements are trademarks of and copyright DC Comics. Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. By special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. Narrated by Richard Rowan. With performances by Joel David Santner, Eric Singdalson, Eric Messner, Laura C. Harris, Dylan Lynch, Thomas Penny, Colleen Delaney, Scott Graham, Kimberly Gilbert, Tracy Lynn Oliveira, Tim Getman, David Jordan, Stephen Carpenter, Katie Karkoff, Sasha Olenek, David Coyne, Alyssa Wilmoth, Christopher Sheeran, Patrick Bussink, Barbara Pinellini, Michael John Casey, Kenyatta Rogers, Lily Beacon, Andy Brownstein, Nanette Savard, Jonathan Church, Michael Glenn, Christopher Graybill, Jeff Allen, Will Cook, Matt McGee, Nick DePinto, Scott McCormick, Ken Jackson, Terence Aselford, Faith Potts, Dwayne Beeman, Yasmin Twazon, Nora Ashradi, Daniel Corey, David Harris, Alexander Strain, Matthew Bassett, Deirdre Starnes, Gary Tells, Catherine Aselford, Thomas Hogan, and Mort Shelby. Our version of the story opens on the last Saturday of May, 1935. When he got the call an hour ago, Sheriff Bill Dutcher was off shift at home in Linden. He has motored 30 miles through drizzle and dust blow to this clodhopper town. He's in fine spirits, especially once he discovers those federal glory hogs out of Topeka haven't showed up yet. A craggy man with steel gray hair and long sideburns, Sheriff Dutcher's wearing tan slacks and a barn jacket over a maroon polo shirt. His star is pinned to the pocket. He shakes hands with two deputies that meet him at the door, even clapping one of them on the shoulder. Then he speaks privately with Doug Parker, the local chief of police, both of them turning together to cast brief looks at the farm boy, 17 years old and hunched low in a varnished chair near the chief's desk. Judging by the kid's shiny eyes and heavy breathing and the tense fist that he rubs back and forth on his thigh, any minute he'll put Bertie to his dinner, plus whatever popcorn he had earlier at the picture show. You might think of giving Sergeant York there a waste paper basket while I go and see Jiggs. Straight back. You can't miss him. Beyond the lavatory door with its tractor calendar stands a long sawbuck table where Mr. Jiggs Mackley, for some years a presence both on wanted posters and in rotogravures, has been laid face up. A chunk of that face, however, is blown off, and the rest of it, including a cheap theatrical mustache, is covered with blood, not all of it dry. His big eyes are open and staring. Hands deep in his pockets, Sheriff Dutcher stands alongside of the table, thinking, Poor dead hillbilly. Looks surprised it happened. Dutcher takes note of the man lying down before him. Good pair of floor shimes, hardly been worn. Brown pleated trousers, but no belt. Mm. Dutcher removes one hand from a pocket and fingers the shirt collar away from Mackley's neck. Astley brand, size 16. Top, second, and third buttons missing. Plucked off, it looks like. And no cufflinks, either. Surprise, surprise. Chief, tell me again. What was it your boy said? The craziest gun? Stupidest. He said Mackley must have owned the world's stupidest gun. Meaning? <laughs> that it had to have fired backward. <laughs> I know you told me his name, but I... Kent. Clark Kent. His left hand curls into itself, and he keeps squeezing it like a slow pulse, but every time Clark thinks he might actually open his fingers and look, he feels another bolt of panic and changes his mind. How you doing, son? Clark's fist draws back to his waist, pressing there. Something wrong with your hand? No, sir. Bill Dutcher, Clark. I'm sheriff of Osage County. Grabbing a small chair, he twirls it casually and sits down, his thick folded forearms across the back. 
Say, you wouldn't be related to the kins live over to Osawatomi, would you? Own that big stove company? I don't think so. My wife's cousin does their bookkeeping. Or she did. Maybe don't anymore, things being how they are. Sounds like you had yourself quite an evening. So how's about you tell me what happened? Dutcher takes out a small notebook and pen and puts down a couple of notes. And seeing that, realizing Dutcher is left-handed, same as he is, Clark relaxes a little. He feels an odd kinship with lefties, just as he feels one with blue-eyed people or people with black hair, with fingernails shaped like his, square and blunt. Finding people who are like him, even in the smallest ways, is always a comfort. It's stupid, he knows, but still it's some comfort. Clark, I surely don't mean to push you, son, but you think you might tell me about... Excuse me for just one second, Sheriff. Holding a cup of coffee carefully so he doesn't spill any, <sighs> Chief Parker settles himself behind his desk. Clark, you sure you don't want me to send somebody for your dad? It's no trouble. I don't want to worry him with my mom and all, but thanks. Up to you. Earlier, the chief had offered to call Clark's father, or let the boy do it himself, of course. Except the cans don't have telephone service, or electricity either. Truth be told, they're lucky to have a roof still over their heads, things being how they are. Well, if you change your mind, and oh, Clinton drove your girlfriend home. She's fine. I just took her to the pictures. She's not my girl. But what about Alger Lee? He all right, Chief Parker? I'm sure he's fine. We told him to stick around, but he left. I expect he ran on home. Alger Lee? Colored boy I told you about was there. We can go fetch him now for you if you like. Dutcher seems to consider the offer, but doesn't respond to it. What movie did you go see, Clark? We were supposed to see The Werewolf of London. Now, somebody told me about that one. Uh, it's with the guy who plays uh, Charlie Chan, right? Warner Oland. I bet it's good. Chief, could I bother you for some of that coffee? Sweet if you got sugar, no milk. One end of Parker's mouth quirks up. Then he purses his lips slightly and smooths them out again. And Clark figures all that pantomime is to let the sheriff know he's amused by the request, takes no offense, and sees it for the rank-pulling take-a-hike that it is. Clark, how about you? Coffee? No, thank you. Be right back, then. Take your time. This young fella's gonna tell me what all went on, and you heard it before. So, Clark, what time did the picture start? Eight o'clock. Lots of other folks there tonight? Full house? About regular for a Saturday. And what's about regular? Thirty people? Fifty? Hundred? I couldn't say. I guess half the seats downstairs were filled. I don't know how many that'd be. Uh-huh. Dutcher looks thoughtfully at Clark's face. You get whacked by something? Clark's right hand goes promptly to his forehead, tapping his fingertips around, playing dumb. You got a red mark there, right there. Like something might have hit you. No, sir. But two hours ago, little less, Clark saw it himself, with the sheriff is squinting at now. A small welt, barely an inch above his nose. He saw it when he leaned against a cigarette machine, hugged it, laboring to get control of himself. Saw it reflected in the panel mirror, the same moment he saw the body of Jiggs Mackley lying spread-eagled behind him on the Jewel Theater's fake Persian lobby carpet. Son? You gonna be sick? If they'd done it in the right order, this wouldn't have never happened. Done what in the right order? Before the picture, it's always you got your coming attractions, then you got your cartoon, and then you got your newsreel. Clark smacks his knee savagely with that doubled fist. But oh no, tonight somebody had to go and do it different. What'd they do? They showed the newsreel right after the coming attractions. <laughs> Walter is original. You know, he's a very odd boy. I was afraid you'd misunderstand him. <laughs> Janie, would you like a chocolate bar or a drink? Whatever you like. We thank you, Clark, but I'm still full from dinner. This was only Clark's second date. At his first with Janie Laster from his typewriting class, he'd expected to run into some kids from their high school, was hoping he would, since Janie not only was a pretty blonde with the kind of figure people called cute, but was known to be awfully picky about boys, which could only help Clark standing with his peers. Although why he cared about that at this late stage of the game, he wasn't sure. At school, Clark is not actively disliked. He isn't popular, he's just there. There, but not there. You say hello, he says hello back. You don't, he doesn't. Overall, he's good enough looking, but not what you would call handsome either. His ears are too small for his head, and his crowded teeth crooked on the bottom. He's a quiet boy, a struggling B student, does all of his homework, and while it seems by appearances that he'd be strong, well-coordinated, quick, he has good shoulders and graceful legs, he's never gone out for athletics, and he was invited to by coaches any number of times. He reads a lot, but mostly the junkiest, dopiest pulps, the kind with tentacled green Martians on the covers. 
He likes movies, all sorts of movies, and often goes by himself. He even still goes to the kiddie show on Saturday mornings because he especially likes chapter plays with cowboys and masked men, death rays and robots. And he writes carefully, accurately, but with no special flair for the school newspaper. In the opinion of his peers at Smallville High School, Clark is all right, but nothing special. And Janie Laster was at the Jewel with him on a Saturday night. She went out on a date with Clark Kent, but nobody that he knew, at least nobody his own age, was there to notice. Mm. Oh, I'm a good woman for a bad man. I think I should have gotten a cola, Clark. Do you mind? Of course not. Clark was already on his feet. <gasps> oh, you know something? Forget it. I'm not really thirsty. Clark sat down, wondering whether he should put his arm around her now or wait. Mrs. McPhillip? Was I informed about Frankie? But when the cartoon should have come on, instead it was news of the world. He put his left arm around Janie's shoulder, and that seemed fine with her. That's when I first saw him. In the theater? That what you're saying? No, in the newsreel. <laughs> The Reichstag, Berlin, Germany. Chancellor Adolf Hitler told the German people that they will no longer be beholden to the League of Nations. He swears that Germany will set its own course and will build as many tanks, planes, and submarines as it takes to defend the fatherland. Crowds of thousands continue to flock to see the speeches of the Nazi leader as war once again looms over Europe. London, England. A nation mourns as war hero T.E. Lawrence is laid to rest after the tragic motorcycle accident which brought an end to the life of one of England's greatest and most controversial soldier. Mourners lined the streets of the capital for a final goodbye to the great Lawrence of Arabia. Midwest United States. American farms are buried deep in black sand dunes in the states of Texas, Oklahoma, and western Kansas. People on street corners sell dust masks for a dime to the families who by the dozens flee for greener pastures in places such as California. In trucks, cars, and even on foot, displaced migrants seek a better life away from this dust bowl. In the same part of the nation, tragedy strikes. The police are on the hunt for this man, Jiggs Mackley. This criminal is allegedly responsible for dozens of robberies and murders in this part of the nation. Mackley's spree of terror includes the robbery of a Missouri gas station where the attendant was brutally murdered. Jiggs Mackley and his gang are the most ruthless killers to terrorize this nation since Dillinger. They murdered a hard-working father of two and for what? Ten dollars and fifty-two cents. But when did you see him? When did you see Jiggs? Right after the highway patrolman finished talking. His picture came on. But if they showed the cartoon when they should have... So you got a good look? Well... Yeah. Oh, Clark, I hate being such a pest, but would you mind getting me a cola now, before the picture starts? And some popcorn? So, I went out to the concession stand. There was an elderly couple, the Kemps, in line before me. I recognized them from the Methodist church that me and my mom used to go to before... Uh, they were trying to decide if they wanted caramels or licorice. Alger was waiting for the Kemps to place their order. Alger? Alger Lee. He works the concession counter at the Jewel. Alger is a year or two younger than Clark, but half a head taller. A good 30 pounds slighter, though. He wore a white uniform jacket like a waiter's, but with a red word jewel stitched over the pocket. A ruffled shirt, much whiter than the jacket, and a black bow tie pressed snug to his throat. When he noticed Clark, Alger nodded in that scant, almost formal way that he had. Those are still a penny, yes ma'am. The usher had gone inside the auditorium, and the ticket taker was out on the sidewalk having a smoke. It was just the four of them in the lobby. And the gumdrops we sell by weight, yes ma'am. When Clark was much younger, Alger's father, Darren, worked on the Kent farm twice a year. Once in high summer when they cut and put up the hay, and then again in late summer when they brought in the corn. Clark well remembered Darren Lee, both because he'd been an impressively huge man, six, eight, or nine, and as wide as a bear, a build his son hadn't inherited, and because he was the first colored person Clark had ever seen. He died, drowned five years ago, in a freak accident during a spring flood. And those, yes, are three for a penny, yes ma'am. Clark checked his watch again. Yes, sir. Alger scooped up a dozen malted milk balls and deposited them into the white sack. Then he scooped up and deposited half a dozen caramels, and finally half a dozen gumdrops. That all for you, ma'am? Sir? Then that'll be twelve cents, please. Mrs. Kemp, looking concerned, held out a dime. I only have... No problem at all, ma'am. Alger Lee removed one caramel and one gumdrop to bring the sum down to a dime. Thank you, folks. Enjoy the picture. Next. 
What can I get you, sir? It made Clark uneasy when Alger, as usual, looked him straight in the eye and called him sir. Just a cola and some popcorn. Small or large? Large, I guess. Watching Alger pump out the syrup and draw carbonated water from the fountain tap, Clark could hear a cartoon playing inside the auditorium. Alger placed the fountain soda on the counter and turned to the popcorn machine. Clark was sliding a single from his money fold. How's your mother? Is she feeling any better? Uh, no, I'm afraid she's not. But thank you for asking, Alger. With a short nod, Alger finished scooping popcorn into a red-striped paper box. He sprinkled it liberally with salt and added a wedge of butter. As he set the popcorn down on the countertop, Alger's eyes lifted slightly. Someone had just stepped up behind Clark. Our friend Mr. Jiggs? Yes, sir. He started in calling Alger names. You expect to find him in Kansas City, but you got him here too? Why well, somebody in these sad times got the gall to go and let one of them work a job could be done by a white boy is just something that burns me. Dutcher passes a hand over his eyes, gets up, and stretches. <clears throat> That's what he said, huh? With no provocation? He just started talking. How did Alvin react? Alger. And he didn't. He just kept looking back at me and said if there was nothing else, that'd be 40 cents, please. You're ignoring me, Sonny? I didn't think you were talking to anybody in particular. Alger was still facing Clark. <clears throat> a large, bony hand clamped down on Clark's right shoulder. <clears throat> Brusquely, he was shunted aside as the man stepped forward. He was drunk, Clark realized. That was no big surprise. What was, and it was a big nasty surprise that registered itself as a fluttering sensation in Clark's belly, was the man's face. Clark knew it. He had just seen it in a newsreel. This was Jiggs Mackley. Only the mustache was new. <sighs> Master of disguise, huh? Not really. So Alger mouthed off and Mackley pushed you away to mix it up, that's it? Alger didn't mouth off. He just said he didn't think the guy was talking to anybody in particular. Funny boy, huh? Alger never blinked. Your total's 40 cents, sir. You think you're a funny boy, is that what you think? You come on out from behind there, you hear me? And you, sonny boy, you go on back there and you take his damn place. Because <laughs> I don't want to be waited on. By no wooly head thinks he's a funny boy. <laughs> hey, hey, what are you looking at? Nothing. That's when Jiggs Mackley grinned. Like he was flattered being recognized? No, sir. I don't think... He wasn't too happy that I knew who he was. He say that? He grabbed me by the front of the shirt and like he wasn't about to let go. You tell him to? No. Curse him out? No. Something made him mad enough to want to shoot you, Clark. I guess I pushed him. You guess? I pushed him, but not hard. I just... Clark nearly opens his left hand to demonstrate. At the last moment, though, he lets it fall. I just pushed him a little so he'd leave, and he... Uh, hit the wall. And broke one of those big old glass picture frames with a movie poster inside, is what I heard. Yes, sir. But he must have lost his balance, because I never pushed him hard. It, it was only a little shove. Hey, hey. You didn't do anything wrong, son. Calm down. But do me a favor. Pretend where you're sitting right now is where you were standing then, okay? Where's the movie poster? I guess, where those deputies are. The two deputies by the muster desk stand a good 20 feet away across the station house. That was some little shove, Clark. He must have tripped on the carpet. Okay. I I'm just telling you what happened. And I'm just telling you okay. He tripped and went flying and hit that frame hard enough to bust the glass. Then what happened? I'm gonna kill you! Mackley's lips separated. They kept separating, but it took forever. He was bellowing with rage, and his right hand reached behind him. And that took half an hour, a split second, no time at all. And then, he had a pistol, nickel-plated and long-barreled, and he straight-armed it, pointing, aiming, and... It was a cannon. It was a plane crash. It was a planet blowing up. But somehow, he missed. Clark looks down, looks up, looks down, and nods. But then he fired again. Clark? Yes. <gasps> Did he say anything to you first? No. He just looked at me. Like he was madder at you because he missed? Yes. But that was a lie. Mackley looked across the lobby at Clark like he was scared. Not mad at him. Scared of him. You told Chief Parker that Mackley must have had the world's stupidest... Gun. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. That was stupid. I just... 
I thought maybe the gun, you know, blew up in his hand. That's what you thought? Well, I heard it go off again, and the next thing I knew, he was lying on the floor. So I thought, maybe the gun blew up. But you could see it hadn't. In his mind's eye now, Clark watches himself clutch the right side of the heavy cigarette machine, be reflected in its mirror, discover that angry red welt between his eyes, see Mackley's body sprawled on the carpet, and notice the pistol smoking but intact, lying a few feet away. I saw the gun and it was... It looked all right to me, so it must have... The bullet must have ricocheted. Like they do off them boulders in the cowboy pictures. I guess that's what must have happened. You got any ideas, though, what it might have ricocheted off? No. Well, that's our job to find out, not yours. They both sit there silently. The front door opens, and three men dressed in suits and hats file in, all of them looking freshly shaved at half past eleven at night. Oh, Lord. My federal betters have arrived. <laughs> I think it's time we cut you loose, Clark. Clark, you're a brave boy. You did good over there. I didn't do anything but see a man get himself killed. The sheriff looks down at him and nods, then puts out his hand. Clark shakes it. Dutcher's attention cuts suddenly to Clark's other hand, still bouncing lightly on his thigh, still in a fist. And Clark is certain he's going to say open it. But no. Cuff link or shirt button? What? Nothing. Let me get you that ride home. I have my truck, sir. All right, then. Hope you get around to seeing that Wolfman movie one of these days. After he leaves the police station, Clark avoids going past the Jewel Theater by cutting down an alley behind the newspaper office and a mercantile store and clambering over a fence that lands him on a wheel-rutted sandy lane that curves away toward the tow mill. He follows that for a while, kicking sulkily at pop bottles, then veers off diagonally through an overgrown lot where the livery barn used to sit till it burned. It's half past 11 and a light rain patters down, but at least the wind has quit so he can breathe without tasting dirt, topsoil that's been carried east hundreds of miles from those same farms probably that he saw earlier tonight in the newsreel, which he wouldn't have if they'd only showed the stupid cartoon when they were supposed to. And that's not all he wouldn't have seen. But since it's a sad fool's pastime, as his dad is forever pointing out, to compile a list of why-nots and if-onlys, Clark quits doing it, but right away finds himself doing the next worst thing so far as his mood is concerned, toting up lies he told Sheriff Dutcher, starting with his pretense of having no idea, none, how he had gotten that small welt on his forehead, ending with a fiction that he drove himself to town and could drive himself home again. He didn't take the family truck, he walked, well, ran, it's only seven miles, ten minutes, Okay, eight. Seven or eight. It's not like he ever clocked himself. He jumps another fence and begins to jog, running through vacant stony lots, putting on speed. A little more. Nearing the perimeter of the Kent farm, he slows from a blur to a sprint to a dog trot. His heartbeat is unhurried, his breathing as measured as a yogi's. His legs and calves feel springy. This year, and really for the first time, Clark has begun taking pleasure in his muscles and the way that his body performs in his changing relationship to the solid world and the so-called rules of gravity and physics. He's getting stronger by the week and faster, clearly faster. He's never had a scab, and he's pretty sure he never will. Bouncing his left fist against the side of his leg, he walks the rest of the way home. With his shoes off, but dressed otherwise, Clark Kent's father is stretched out above the counterpane on his side of the bed, heavily asleep. Under the covers beside him, Mrs. Kent looks up from her poem book, the Sarah Teasdale collection Clark gave her last Mother's Day. In the doorway, Clark pantomimes that he's going to bed. Good night, Mom. I love you. But she squints in feigned rebuke and beckons him over. He draws up a chair. Did you have a good time? I guess. You didn't like the picture? It was okay, I guess. I don't know. Clark! I'm fine, Mom. Just tired. He slides the book from her hands, lays the green silk ribbon diagonally across her page. And you should be asleep yourself. In the weak glow from the gasoline Aladdin lamp, her illness is not so evident as it is in the light of day. Even so, there's no mistaking her condition. How near she is to the end. She weighs scarcely 80 pounds. Six months ago, she weighed twice that. Clark puts the book on the table, in among brown glass medicine bottles and a framed family photograph, the smiling Kent's posed stiffly outside in front of the gabled house. It was early summer, and Clark was seven, and down at the right-hand edge of the picture, you can glimpse just a bit of the county road that passed by the property. 
His dad used to tease Clark when he was small, saying they'd found him in that very road, a baby that must have fallen off a wagon. Naturally, we didn't want you, so we took you to the orphan asylum. But you were such a noisy fuss budget, they made us take you back. Oh, Jonathan, that's enough. I'm only kidding, Martha. The boy knows that. Don't you, Clark? Of course he did, and he loved it. Loved it whenever his father caught the silly bug, and you'd see one end of his mouth quirk up in a waggish grin. Yes, and Clark loved being the baby that must have fallen off a wagon, too. Where'd that wagon go? Now Clark glances away from the photograph and finds his mother looking at his closed fist. What's the matter, son? You're not hurt, are you? Mom, when was the last time I got hurt? After kissing her, he quickly leaves the bedroom and goes back downstairs. With money earned raising his own brood of chickens, Clark bought a used Remington typewriter last year, intending to compose what his favorite magazine refers to as scientific fiction stories. In school, English has always been his favorite subject, his themes invariably earning grades of B plus or sometimes even A, and whenever he reads anything, from a handbill to a prayer book to the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Clark pays scrupulous attention to grammar and syntax, punctuation, spelling, and vocabulary. He doesn't know if he means to be a professional writer when he gets older. He's afraid his imagination isn't as rich or lively as, say, Murray Leinster's or Jack Williamson's, but he does know that he wants to keep writing for his own satisfaction, that he enjoys it. It takes him away from himself, out of his body, his puzzling, uncomfortable, intimidating body. It's a pleasure to live in his head, to escape there, no matter how briefly. Since getting the Remington, he's completed two short stories, or yarns as the pros call them, of roughly 20 pages apiece, and has been working on a third. His first story was about a brain surgeon who discovers that people's used thoughts get stored in their hair, so in collusion with a big city barber, whose customers include movie stars, bankers, theater lights, and politicians, he embarks on a doomed blackmail career. Clark titled it, I Hair You. His second story was about a robot named Cassidy who falls in love with a Model A Ford. He called that one a chassis for Cassidy. Both stories were rejected by every science fiction magazine Clark mailed them to, and none of the rejections were of a personal nature or came with even the slightest encouragement. Nonetheless, Clark perseveres. His most recent effort, which he began in early April, was inspired by a recurring dream he's had every few weeks since he was 13. The story, and the dream, is set in the distant future, when the Earth has grown old and is being racked by earthquakes and tidal waves. The scientist hero believes the planet eventually will blow itself to smithereens, but since he can't convince anyone to believe him or to act upon his warning, he sets about constructing all by himself and in secret a small rocket ship that will take him and his wife and baby to safety on Mars. Giant orange flames soared from great fissures and... 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 And skyscrapers crashed down, shattering into dust, and the sky turned black. <sighs> Stupid story. Stupid dream. Clark goes out on the front porch, where he leans against the newel post and looks past the lilac hedge to the picket fence he and his mother painted last summer then to the county road that just recently, and to his father's dismay, was macadamized. Surprised to find you still up, Clark. I ain't sleepy. I'm not sleepy. You neither? <laughs> <laughs> Your mother thinks something's bothering you. She wake you up to say so? Look, son, you shouldn't feel guilty about going out and having a little bit of fun. Your mother doesn't want you to stop doing things just because she's... That's what she thinks is the matter? Well... Yes. It's not? Clark looks into his father's face, one cheek a tracery of red creases where it was pressed against the pillowcase. Then he glances away, back to the road. Son, what's the matter? Clark lifts his left arm, holds his tight fist in the air between himself and his father, then slowly opens his fingers. This. It glints on his palm. I don't understand. It's a bullet, Dad. Somebody fired from a gun. I can see it's a bullet. I caught it, Dad. I put out my hand, and I caught it. Mr. Kent creeps back into the bedroom, but then his heart seems to freeze in his chest. Martha's breathing is so quiet. He's not a believer in the way that his wife is, but still he finds it hard not to pray for a miracle, even when he knows it's... what? 
Hopeless? Hopeless. Nevertheless, he can ask, can't he? And so he does, again. <laughs> Sitting down on his side of the bed, Mr. Kent stretches out in his clothes again. A dull ache spreads through the small of his back. A bunion throbs on his left foot. A tiredness shudders through him. He should sell the farm. Clark won't be staying. Jonathan knows that, even if his son doesn't yet. Sell it for whatever he can get and move into town. And do what? Does he have to do something? Open a grocery store then. Which is what he intended to do before he met and married Martha Clark. Their land, this land here, was her family's. Just a parcel of what had once belonged to her father. He shifts around, trying to get comfortable, hoping to ease the chronic ache in his back. Then leans over, careful not to wake Martha, and blows out the Aladdin lamp. In the darkness, he thinks again how foolish he was for not wiring the house for electricity when crop and pork and beef prices were high, and he could have afforded that sort of thing. Not that electric light meant much to him, it meant nothing, but Martha would have enjoyed it. Her being such a great reader, it would have saved her eyesight. It was from reading all those books by gasoline lamp that finally gave her pretty green eyes a permanent squint. Green eyes. His mother had green eyes too. And thinking of his mother, whom he loved and who died in her 39th year of diphtheria, he can't help but remember his father, whom he did not love. Though he tried to show the proper and natural respect, even when it was difficult, even when Jonathan was treated more like a slave than a son. Silas Kent, an angry, prickly, unlucky man, and finally a demented one, who deliberately slashed himself across his abdomen with a butcher knife while standing in front of a mirror. During the years when Martha, who so yearned to conceive, failed over and over again, Mr. Kent would feel only relief. Guilty, unseemly relief. He didn't know how to be a good father. He knew what it meant, was supposed to mean, but not how to be one. And feared he would become, over time, not just a disappointment to any children of his own, but also the object of their confused outrage and hostile pity. No. Better he was childless. Then, Clark arrived. <laughs> Mr. Kent pushes himself up in bed and wedges a pillow behind his back. Oh, Johnny, it's a miracle, isn't it? It was meant to be, wasn't it? Oh, look at this poor, poor, beautiful baby boy. Oh, Johnny, they can't have him back. You won't let them take him back, will you, Johnny? No, no, Martha, they can't have him. If they come, I won't let them take him back. Our son, Johnny... At last, God is good. God is great. God has blessed us. But has he? Clark changed their lives, filled them with new feelings, chances, and chores. Glad ones, mostly. There was no denying Martha was a good mother, born to it, as she'd always known. And Clark? No man and woman could have gotten a better son. Even if sometimes, especially as a young boy, he seemed remote, unhappy, preferring solitude to the company of schoolmates, to the company of his parents. Catch him when he didn't know you were looking, his eyes fixed upon his hands or his knees, a point on his bedroom wall or a knot in the table, and his expression was inscrutably morose. He'd see you and smile, and those were the times when Mr. Kent's heart came nearest to breaking, because those smiles were so awkward and so pretended. When Clark was four and five and six years old, he rarely spoke, just mumbling out a few words and shaking his head, yes, no, and holding his eyes down, chewing steadily on the side of his thumb or snapping his teeth around his thumbnail. Mr. Kent secretly feared that his son might be slow or dull, not right. He was afraid people in town might be saying just that, quietly among themselves, pitying Clark the way they pitied children with stutters or club feet or faces cratered from the smallpox. Mr. Kent sat awake all hours worrying that Clark was afflicted in his own way, then feeling black waves of shame for caring what other people might think or say about his son, despising himself for holding such vanity. Eventually, Clark outgrew what Martha always called just a shyness, and in time managed to hold his own with others outside the family, to look people in the eye and speak for himself, always speaking politely, finding the right smiles and small talk for most occasions. But the boy never seemed fully comfortable in the world. But why was that any surprise? The unnatural things he could do, and the natural things that never happened to him, but should have. 
Every town or region has its strongman, and for a long time Mr. Kent could and did tell himself that Clark was just one of those rare and lucky specimens. Extraordinary, but not impossible, that effortless strength of his, what he could lift, shove aside, knock over. Once, when Clark was about seven, Mr. Kent saw the boy drive a nail into a fence post with just his fist. The other parts of it, though, those parts were harder to deal with. Never a scrape, never a bruise or a cut, never blood. Our son, Johnny, at last. God is good. God is great. God has blessed us. Yes and no. Yes and no. Maybe and no. He hasn't been a good father. He's tried, but he just hasn't been a good father to Clark. He doesn't know how to be. Still doesn't. Not to the son he was given. He never knows what to say. It's a bullet, Dad. As somebody fired from a gun. I caught it, Dad. I put out my hand, and I caught it. Jonathan Kent just never knows what to say. Did you talk to him? Martha's hand, dry and thin and nearly without substance, finds his. I'm sorry. Did I wake you? Not really. I was just resting my eyes. You spoke with Clark? Yes. And? Johnny, did you find out what's bothering him? Yes. You're not going to make me drag this out of you, are you? In my condition? <laughs> he loves this woman so very much. Johnny! Yes. Clark told me what's bothering him, and... I want him to be happy. I know that, too. And he is. I wish I believed that. I'm so afraid Clark thinks that he's always thought that he's... No. Alone. How could he possibly think that? He's fine. What did he tell you? It's just... Oh, it's just as you said. The boy feels bad for going out when he could have stayed home and taken care of you. He's a good boy. Yes, Martha. He's a very good boy, our son. Washed in moon glow, Clark Kent straddles his barn's peaked roof, staring out into the middle distance, seeing insects, bats, and owls in the blackness, and wondering uneasily... What are you supposed to do with all of these crazy talents he just keeps finding out that he has? After a while, he gets up, jiggling that mashed wad of lead in his left hand, and flings it suddenly, hard as he can. It climbs, keeps climbing, and doesn't arc. Although she graduated college the previous June and was theoretically grown, Lois Lane, who skipped the 4th, 6th, 8th, and 11th grades, still was only 17 last August when she trained down to New York City for Monticello. She was moving there to take graduate journalism classes at Columbia University, and her father, concerned about her safety and virtue, had installed her in an old-fangled women's residency hotel, the Dolly Madison on East 27th Street. Quite a distance from Morningside Heights, but Lord knows he didn't want his daughter living in Harlem. I didn't want you living in that city to begin with. But if you insist on living there, then I insist that you stay at the Madison. I never thought a daughter of mine would be crazy enough to become a lady journalist. But if it weren't for a journalist, Daddy, where would you be? Time and again, Lois would remind him, gently, with a girlish smile, she knew how to handle the old man, that it was a journalist in Cuba directly responsible for making her father's reputation, which led... To practically everything good in our uncommonly good lives, Daddy dear. From his hero's welcome home, to his Congressional Medal of Honor, to his rise in the Marines and all of those plum postings, to his current position as first vice president of the Hatlow Machine Company, everything had sprung from a newspaper reporter's 200-word cable about a wounded young sergeant heroically waving a makeshift flag under ferocious gunfire at Cusco. To all of that, Captain Lane, he would forever be the captain, though he'd retired from the Corps in 1919, to all of that he would respond by saying, yes, true enough, but Lois ought not to use Mr. Stephen Crane as a career model. Oh, Dad, I don't want to be a war correspondent, just a regular old reporter. Regular old reporters are nothing more than peeping toms on a salary. Oh, Dad. The Dolly Madison looked like a miniature southern plantation and was run like a genteel sorority house with strict rules, including white gloves at dinner, a nine o'clock curfew, no smoking, no alcohol, and absolutely no gentleman callers beyond the receiving parlor. Lois survived at the Hotel Dolly Madison scarcely three months. 
Around the time she turned 18 in late November, she checked out of there and into an automatic elevator building on East 29th Street, rooming with Betty Simon, an OR nurse at Roosevelt Hospital that the boys had nicknamed Skinny because she was anything but. When he found out about the move, the fait accompli, Lois's father stopped taking her telephone calls for about a week. Oh, Dad, don't be such a worry ward. Real people don't live in hotels. Your voice sounds husky. Have you been smoking? <laughs> Of course not. And I hope to God you haven't started drinking. Nope. Lois leaned over to peer into her cocktail shaker. She grinned to find it empty. Lois, is that a jazz record I hear? It's coming from the building across the way, Dad. There, I've closed the window. Now, you have to promise me you won't let any men into your apartment. Never. What Lois meant was, I'd never promise you that. Then she pointed sternly at Willie Berg, sprawled on the divan in his undershirt and boxer shorts, pointing at him so he wouldn't dare bellow something like, Baby, we're out of gin. I expect you to be a good girl, Lois, and behave yourself. I'm counting on that. I won't let you down, Daddy. And in her heart of hearts, she hadn't. Maybe she drank a little, sometimes a little more than she ought to, but she could handle it. She never got stewed. Well, once or twice. But the morning after, she always remembered everything she'd done and said. And she bought records and danced to them, but how was that letting anyone down? Even a retired captain in the U.S. Marine Corps. And she never allowed Willie Berg to sleep in her bed. At least, not overnight. She was still a good girl. Her conscience was clear. But she was a modern girl, too. And she liked being modern, being aware, being curious, unafraid of the new or the exotic. Willie was Jewish. And one of these days, those same qualities would get her what she fully meant to have. Her own byline, her own column, in one of the big dailies. Even Willie Berg, who was such a cynic, even he said complimentary things about her news stories, which, okay, were only class assignments, not the real McCoy, but still. Good is good, correct? Good is good. You call this good? What's with incalculable? The fire damage is incalculable? Willie tosses her class assignment down on the kitchen table. Honey, the fire damage is 10,000 bucks or it's 10 million, but it ain't never incalculable. All right, point taken. But what do you think of the story overall? Dull, sister. Dull, dull, dull. I hate you. You know that? Gotta eat dessert. There's still some bread pudding, I think. From the other night? Don't you have anything fresh? Now Lois reaches over and into his shirt pocket, helping herself to his package of chiclet scum. You could ask. Mm. But speaking of asking... I gotta ask you a big favor. Oh, no. I'll pay you back tomorrow, I swear. How much? 30. Rain on that? Where am I supposed to come up with 30 bucks when I can't meet the rent thanks to your flat-leaving old girlfriend? Skinny Simon is not my old girlfriend. She's just a friend, number one. Number two, it was your decision not to find another roommate. And number three, you shouldn't blame the poor thing for falling in love. I never blamed you. The boy is delirious. Guaranteed you'll have the cash back tomorrow. Swear to God, by noon. Could be sooner. Could be sooner. Could be never. Same as every other time I loaned you money like a real dope. No, Willie, and I mean it. Come on, Lois. I gotta get my baby out of jail. What? I hocked my camera. Willie, that's how you make a living. You can't just hock it every time you want to play poker. How'd you know it was poker? You're impossible. And a lousy card player. Not true. You're broke. True. Honey, I really hate to banter and run, but it's ten past eight. If I don't get to the pawn shop by nine, it'll be closed. So, can I have that money? I'll try to stop back here later, okay? I don't have 30 bucks. Lois, I need my camera. There's gonna be a factory fire in Kanasi. Going to be? You know how it is with little birdies and such. Then go mooch off of one of your little birdies. I know you can loan it to me. And if I don't get it back, what do I do Saturday morning when the rent man comes? You'll have it, I promise. I can sell ten pictures of this stupid fire. It's a toy factory, hon. With a teddy bear on the roof. Look, I'll pay you back 35 bucks just for your trouble. Leave, okay? Just go. Oh, come on. Don't get mad. You mad? Leave, I said. You really not going to let me have it? I can't. Why? Because you don't trust me? Right. I don't trust you. Abruptly, Willie bends over and sweeps an arm across the surface of the table. The pages of Lois's typewritten manuscript scatter, flutter around, skate in all directions. With her back pressed to the sink, Lois stands transfixed, pale, frightened, excited. Half a minute later, Willie emerges through the iron and glass apartment house doors. 
Willie doesn't stop walking, and he doesn't turn around, and he doesn't look up. It's Wednesday evening, the 12th of June, 1935. Willie Berg grew up in cramped, dark, squalid apartments, always ones with dust-filmed windows on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Essex Street, Pike, Pelham, Division. He was the fifth of nine children. His parents actually produced 12 offspring, but influenza, whooping cough, scarlet fever. Willie's mother, the epitome of the buxom, wide-faced, irritable peasant who spoke the kind of Jewish broken English that vaudeville comics loved to build skits around, was born in the United States, in Baltimore. It was Willie's father who emigrated from a ghetto in Central Europe, fleeing Russian-dominated Warsaw sometime in the mid-90s. During Willie's childhood, Papa worked what seemed dozens of jobs, sometimes as a pressman or cutter in the garment district, sometimes as a meat dresser at the East River Stockyards. For a couple of years, he worked as a laundryman in a commercial bathhouse. Without complaint, but without any pride either. It was what you did. You worked. Hard. When he turned 14 and it was legally permitted, Willie quit school to work. His parents approved. He would, he agreed, fork over three quarters of whatever he earned. He found a $2 a day job pearl diving at a village restaurant, but his hands got so chapped he quit after a month and found another job, general assistant at a passport photo studio. That was the first time Willie Berg ever had been around camera equipment, and it was love at first sight. Willie soon traded in his push broom and dustpan for an 8x10 view camera and tripod, spending his days touching off loads of flash powder, developing glass plates, making proofs by running outside and exposing paper to the sun. And in a short time, he did it far more skillfully than his boss. He moved on to a commercial house where he took pictures of merchandise for mail order catalogs. Pianos, brass beds, chandeliers, caskets. Occasionally, he would rent one of his employer's 5x7 cameras for the weekend, lug it up to Central Park, and earn some money photographing children at Rowboat Lake, Belvedere Castle, Bethesda Fountain, the zoo. He had cards printed that read, Willie the Great, Photography Like Life. He gave them to parents, who were instantly charmed by his cockiness and subsequently pleased by the quality of his work. Late one Saturday afternoon, on his way back to the subway, Willie saw a man who'd just been shot dead lying half on the sidewalk, half on the curb, and a big Pontiac whizzing away. He set up his tripod and waited for a cop. When at last one came along, Willie took a picture of him, stooped beside the body. He sold it that evening to the Star, and next day it ran on the front page, first three editions. That earned him ten bucks and a photo credit. He was flush, he was happy, and later that same week, he turned fifteen. It was autumn, 1929. Crash It took a few months for the photography studio to fail, but eventually it did. And then Willie couldn't find more work. Who could? His father still had his job, rolling a pushboy through the garment district, but he'd had to take a severe pay cut. His older sister Ida could sew like the Dickens, so she did all right, working a singer machine. She gladly forked over 80 cents of every dollar she earned, but the rest she deposited into a piggy bank heavy as a cinder block that her fiancé Murph Silverman had won for her at Luna Park. The damn piggy bank. Using the edge of a butter knife to pry open the tin plug on the pig's underbelly, Willie started helping himself to a few dimes at nickels, a quarter, or a dollar bill now and then, then every day. Using the money to rent a German ICA and buy darkroom time to develop his plates. Happening upon that freshly dead gangster on Central Park West had steered him to his specialty, showed him his true calling. He and the city's picture newspapers, the tabloids, were meant for each other. Nights he trolled the boroughs of New York, photographing auto wrecks and blazing tenements, gangland shootings and spaghetti joints, lady burglars being led from central booking, always between a robust matron and a grinning detective. He loitered around police headquarters, local precincts. He'd sell a picture and replace the money he'd borrowed from Ida, but then he'd borrow it back the next day, and maybe a little extra. He rented a 4x5 speed graphic, faster, lighter, and no more plates. No more of that explosive flash powder either. But then, of course, he had to buy flash bulbs and sheet film. Wouldn't it be great if he didn't have to rent his camera? If he could buy one? By then, he'd saved up some money of his own. Just not quite enough. The damn piggy bank. So with more of Ida's coins and cash, he purchased a second-hand speed that the first owner, a Romanian who worked at the Empire City racetrack, had ingeniously adapted to use roll film. As soon as he'd sold some pictures that he took with it, he put the money right back into his sister's bank. 
Well, he couldn't put it all back, not yet, but he would. Eventually. Long before she needed it. Or so he thought. Willie finally got his comeuppance. And Willie never denied he deserved it. Hiya, Ma. In the kitchen, Willie's mother stood planted with her arms folded like the golem of Prague. By the window, looking out as if contemplating a jump, his father pressed the heel of a hand against his forehead. Uh, something wrong? <sighs> his older brothers, even Freddy on his crutches, milled around drinking coffee. The little ones were holding hands with great solemnity. And Ida, poor plain Ida, looked stricken. She sat at the table with her piggy bank in front of her, a measly pile of coins beside it. <laughs> Lucky for Willie, he'd left his camera, as he always did, in a rented locker. <laughs> Otherwise, he might have had his head dented in with that too, not just the piggy bank. Brother Harry did the honors. And then, except for his father, everybody kicked him while he was lying on the floor, curled like a shrimp. It takes some doing, but at last Willie convinces a cracksman friend named Patsy Cuddy to loan him a good set of picks. But on his walk to the pawn shop on 7th Avenue in the high 30s, Willie has second thoughts about the whole thing. Does he really want to do this? If he gets caught, he'll land in jail. With criminals. Is it worth it just to get his camera out of hock? Well, off the shelf, off the premises, a couple of days sooner than he would otherwise? Yeah, but I really want to shoot that fire. By this time, he's walked past the hock shop, and the coast, damn it, is clear. He pretends to study a window display of flatware, phonographs, trumpets, guitars, baseball mitts, pieced jewelry, toasters. His heart is racing, kicking. Either do it or go. He turns to go, but then he does it. And to his own enormous surprise, he does it quickly, efficiently. Second pick he chooses, bingo. Now Willie is inside the pawn shop, the door shut, and his head is throbbing arrhythmically. Get your stupid camera and blow, he thinks, carefully moving through the gloom toward the waist-high counter that runs half the length of a sidewall. Behind it are deep metal shelves jammed with good and bad cameras and camera equipment, but Willie knows exactly where his speed is. Yesterday he watched where Chodash the pawnbroker randomly stuck it, so just grab. As Willie rounds the far end of the counter, his left foot collides with a solid object, and the sole of his right shoe comes down in a puddle of something gummy and slides. A moment later, he lands hard on his prat. What the hell? He scrambles to get up, but keeps slipping. The seat of his trousers is wet, and so is one of his shirt sleeves, the cuff a sodden blotter. Both palms feel slathered with warm paste. What is that smell? Ugh. Then all at once, he knows. And Willie knows what he slipped in as well. It's Mr. Chodesh. Drop dead. Lois? Professor Gurney, oh my god, I thought you were someone else. Boyfriend? Ex-boyfriend, and I'm so sorry. Believe me, sir, I don't go telling everybody that calls to please drop dead. Sir? School's out, Lois. Call me John. There are still exams. You don't think we actually read those things, do you? Professor Gurney, was there a reason? As a matter of fact, there was. I have some very good news I thought I'd pass on. Lois, my star pupil, you are no longer speaking to an associate professor of journalism at Columbia University. You are speaking to the National Tours Editor for the Federal Writers Project. Oh my gosh. That's incredible! You must be thrilled! Can't say I'm crazy about living in D.C., but yes. To the gills! Play your cards right, my girl, and I'll get you a job writing for the American Guide series. Or better yet, I'll find one for your ex-boyfriend in North Dakota. I'm calling to invite you to a celebration. Tonight. Say yes. That's so thoughtful of you, but... Stork Club. Hemingway might drop by. And Irving Berlin. Stop. Lenny Lyons, Claire Booth Luce, Walter Winchell. <laughs> oh, now I know you're fibbing. You hate Walter Winchell. It's a party, Lois. Grudges are buried. Feuds forgotten. Morals forbidden. I wish you wouldn't say things like that. Like what? Oh, that. Lois, you're in New York City, not back home in darkest Poughkeepsie. I don't come from Poughkeepsie. And I thank you, Professor, but I won't be able to attend your party. It was kind of you to ask. Positive you won't come out? I'm sorry. Goodbye. Not as sorry as I, my dear. By the flame of a paper match, Willie confirms it. What he fell over was a body. What he slipped in was blood. Mr. Hodash and Mr. Hodash's blood. 
The pawnbroker's throat has been sliced open from ear to ear. <sighs> Despite being scared clammy, Lily carefully stands and grabs a gooseneck lamp from the counter. He squats down again and aims the light to create a dramatic clash of shadows. Then he finds his beloved speed graphic, thank god it still has film, and gets to work. He pops out the gooey flashbulb and fits in another. Now for the unpleasant business, calling the cops, going through all of that. But the telephone wire has been torn from the wall. Willie wants just to leave, scram out, but he can't, because he can't sell any pictures without bringing in the bulls. They'll murder him if he doesn't. Is there another phone? In the back? Worth a go see. And that's how he comes to find, in an aisle between floor-to-ceiling shelving, an open trap door. Half a dozen wooden steps lead to a cellar with lights burning. He creeps down. Willie has seen his share of handbook and wire joints, has even tagged along on a few gambling raids thanks to his pull with a vice cop named Dick Sandglass. Willie used to play free sewer stickball with Dick's kid Spider, and they all look roughly the same, whether in a candy store, a dry cleaners, a social club, or a hot shop. You have your cashier's cage, your trestle table, your totalizers, your blackboard, your pencils, your sharpeners, your parlay slips, and your telephones. There are a dozen here in the cellar, their cords all sliced. This particular setup is slightly larger than most, to accommodate an inventory of pinball machines, punch boards, and nickel slots overlaid with bed sheets and jammed together at the far end of the cellar, near a garage-style rolling steel door that seems like it could withstand an assault by a whippet tank. Apparently the place is both a working house and a warehouse. It's also a death house. Five seated men, with their faces turned left cheek down on the table in front of them like school children napping, have been shot at very close range. Definitely, Willie Berg owns the front page, the third page, and the centerfold tomorrow of whatever tabloid he wants, but right now he'd gladly settle for the fire at the toy factory, page six, and fifty bucks. We didn't expect you to yourself, sir, but uh, I'm glad you came. The voice comes from an alley behind the building. Then Willie hears a class block snapping open. As the steel door rumbles up, <laughs> Willie ducks under a covered pinball machine, reaching back to tuck gently down on the bedsheet to give himself a tad more cover, praying he doesn't pull the whole thing off. Tell. It's pretty bad, sir. And I seen some stuff in my day. The boss said tell. He didn't ask you what you seen in your day. So far, all that Willie can make out are trousered legs, Blue serge, blue denim, but somebody, presumably Sir, is wearing a tuxedo. Oh, Christ. That came from the tuxedoed man. I told you it was pretty bad. That was blue denim speaking. And you got here when? Mm, nine, a little bit after. Where's Leon? Upstairs, sir. They uh, cut his throat. Go see if they took records, Polly. Sticky checked when he got here the first time, boss. They're all gone. So blue serge is Polly, blue denim is Sticky. But what about the boss? Who's Sir? Well, he's certain he's heard the man's voice before. There's something about it. Gingerly, Willie lifts the hem of the sheet, hoping to see a little better. No dice. I want all these men removed. Yes, sir. And disposed of. And I don't mean the river, Jersey, or the Adirondacks. Sure, boss. No problem. Uh, but uh, what about Leon? Leave him. They'll call it a robbery. Uh, but they didn't take any money, sir. Then empty the register, Polly. And where do you want all this stuff? Take it up to Inwood. But Polly, before you go sailing in there, check first. Make sure nobody's waiting for you. I'll take along five to six guys. Excellent. Very excellent indeed. And boom, Willie suddenly knows who it is standing not ten feet away and giving orders to remove five shot dead bodies and a ton of illegal gambling equipment. The trick, of course, will be to take a picture and live long enough to develop it. Your father wants to know if you're all right. I'm fine, Mother. Now tell him to go away. In case you forgot, Lois, he lives here. Doesn't he need to brush his teeth or something? Uh, hold on. Sam, dear, go do something useful for five minutes. Turtle, he's putting out the trash. What's going on? Mom, how come men are such goofs? For the love of Mike, this is a long-distance phone call. How come? Are you in trouble? No! Then I don't know what to tell you. How do I know about men? Name me one that's not a sneaky, selfish, sponging liar. And daddy doesn't count. Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur? You asked! No, I mean- Bill Rogers. Bing Crosby. Fred Astaire. FD. 
FDR. Why are you whispering? Because your father just came back, and you know how he feels about him. Oh, Lois, honey, there are millions of nice men. Was there anything else, dear? Because your father would like to close up down here and go to bed. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> Did you love him? Who? The sneaky, selfish, sponging liar that broke your heart tonight. My heart is not broken, Mother. Where would you get that idea? <sighs> then good night, Lois. <laughs> night, Mom. Lois. Uh huh. Dick Powell. Dick Powell seems like a genuinely nice man, from what I've read. <laughs> okay. And what about your mayor, the little fat man? You like him, don't you? And what about that other one, the mayor's friend? You sent us that wonderful story about him that you wrote for your class. Oh, you mean... The way you described him, he sounded like the cat's whiskers. I guess, but I'm not really talking about... So we've established that there are many fine and good men in this world, and now we can both go to sleep with grateful hearts. Did you really like that story, Mother? Of course. I did that one back in October. I'm writing much better now. Well, it was wonderful. And you're wonderful. And men, most of them, are perfectly wonderful, too. And now, my darling turtle, sweet dreams. After Lois puts the telephone receiver back on its hook, she walks the floor trying to gauge whether her mood has been lifted or whether she's still wallowing in the all-men-stink blues. What she wants is for Willie Berg to call her now and say that he's sorry, horribly, wretchedly, incalculably sorry, and beg forgiveness. Yes, but what she also wants, and quite suddenly, is to go dig out that news story she did for her local political reporting class. She wrote it during her first semester, just before a special election to the Board of Aldermen was called in the wake of the previous officeholder's inexplicable suicide. It wasn't the best thing she ever wrote, but as she recalls it now, it was pretty decent work. She still has it, of course. She keeps everything, has always kept everything, including short stories, poems, themes, and diaries going back as far as the first grade, and clippings and tear sheets from all of her school newspapers, country day through college. Aha! Uh -huh. She finds the typescript in a folder on a shelf in the bedroom closet. She received an A for the assignment, naturally. Lois recalls the terror she felt covering the story that morning. She arrived at the Commodore Hotel with Willie Berg, who blithely waved his press card, gripped her by an elbow, and shunted her into one of the ballrooms. He left her then to find a good spot for picture-taking. The place was crowded, but somehow Lois managed to nab a seat in front. When the candidate appeared finally for his press conference, she was electrified to see that LaGuardia himself had come along to lend support. The mayor at her first press conference. Could it get much better than that? Yes. Yes, it could, because practically the same moment she summoned the nerve to raise a hand, the candidate, tall and athletic-looking, she would later write, with a full head of wavy red hair, pointed to her from behind his podium. Praying her face didn't look half as drained as it felt, she spoke in a firm, clear voice, the way Professor Gurney had taught her. How would you rate your chances for election, sir? My chances? Excellent. Very excellent indeed. Lois smiles now, remembering. And of course, she also remembers then-candidate Lex Luthor's single impudent wink and the beguiling way he looked at her, as if she were the only other person in the room. Over the last few months, Lex Luthor has had his picture taken more times, far more times than in all of his previous life. But while surely that's a good thing, since it means his political career is flourishing, still Lex feels cold dread whenever someone points a camera at him. For the split second he's blinded by the flash, he has to quash an imperative instinct to cut and run. No matter who he is now, and he's worked hard to create himself, to build formidable identities both public and secret, at base he remains his father's son. And his father killed a man then lived the rest of his miserable existence as a fugitive in constant fear of being recognized, seized, and punished. Once when the family, calling itself the Littles that year, was living in Ashland, Virginia, and Lex was 11, a photographer snapped a picture of him parading on stilts at the town's July 4th picnic. Next morning, it appeared on the front page of the daily newspaper, and there for all to see was Lex's father, cringing in the background, one hand flung up to conceal his face. God, that look of sheer terror. Lex never forgot it, or forgave it either. 
Hey! Now, decades later, after Willy Bird leapt out of nowhere and clicked a jeopardizing picture of him, of Alderman Lex Luthor standing in a bookie joint with two known criminals and five murdered men, Lex wonders if his face looked as stricken as his father's had on that Independence Day. With every fiber of his being, he hopes not. Find that man and make sure that film is never developed. We'll find him. Yes, Polly, we will. I, I don't know how he got in. But we certainly know how he got out, don't we? Well, I thought Stick closed the door. Hey, you came in last. You should have closed it. Shut up, the both of you. And take a left here, Polly, at 38th. But how'd you figure he'd go east, boss? He's some kind of news hawk, right? So the closest paper would be the Times or the HT, and they're a couple of blocks up He's on the... He's a tabloid rat, Polly. He'll head for the Mirror or the Daily News, east. But why do you think he took 38th? Because 37th is closest, and he'd expect us to think he took it. Well, how do you know he's on foot? I don't. I'm hoping. And for your sake, Polly, you better hope I'm right. I thought I closed it, boss. It must have stuck. Just drive and stick when we spot him. I'm out in a flash, sir. You bet. And I'll get you that camera. No problem. I expect you to get more than just the camera. Yes, sir. Goes without saying. That stinking little hebe is history. Stick, please. I don't want to hear that kind of name calling. Polly, speed up a little. I think I see him. If that picture were ever developed, which it won't be, Lex might look surprised, possibly shocked, but not terrified, not craven, not caught, not him, never. He's not his father. Stick, now, go, go! Be Willy. Hello? Lois? Oh, it's you, Skinny. Flat lever. Low and listen. You really left me in a lurch, you know it? Moving in with your hotshot boyfriend. Thank you so very much. Lois! Willie's been shot. They just brought him in. What are you talking about, in? In where? W what are you saying? I'm saying, Lois, that somebody shot Willie and they just brought him into Roosevelt. I'll meet you down in emergency. Skinny? That's not funny. Skinny! Seated in the rear of a gray Lincoln town car, parked with a motor running on West 37th Street. Lex Luthor idly jiggles a roll of 12 exposure Kodak film in his left palm while observing a large bellied cop at the 7th Avenue corner smoking a cigarette. <coughs> Lex hates smoking, detests the habit. First thing, soon as he's the mayor, it becomes a felony. Smoking becomes a class A felony. You get caught with those things, expect to do some hard time. Or maybe he'll have to wait till he's governor, or president, or king. But you smokers, all oh, you nicotine fiends, your day is coming. Gum chewers, too. Hooking three fingers around the edge of the film container, he pulls, first bending, then cracking the metal. He tears out the sprocketed acetate, then he lights it with a match and tosses it through the open curbside window, watches it burn in the gutter. A panel truck with its headlights off noses slowly from the alley just ahead, but stops before it rolls into 37th Street. That would be all the punch boards, the slot and pinball machines. The driver sets the brake. Polly gets out of the cab's passenger door and walks over to the big Lincoln and smiles down at the still-burning tangle of film. All set, boss. Dan's brother's in the back with the stuff, and that's Frank Robble at the wheel. All right, here's what you do. Tell Frank to go up to Inwood without you and remind him what I said about checking before just walking in there. Yeah, I'll do that, boss. Mr. Luciano might not be entirely finished with his little games tonight. Is that who we're dealing with? It's who I'm dealing with, Polly. You're dealing with me. Sure, boss. What about the second part of the effort? Boss? The bodies? Oh, just finishing up. Who's driving? Stan Elder. Make sure he knows he's driving upstate. Or Jersey, you said. Or Jersey. And tell him to call the police from a payphone just before he leaves the city. Well, why, why would he do that? Because he's a good citizen. Because he saw something suspicious going on here and he wants the cops should take a look. Make sure he knows the address. No such person as Lex Luthor was in the public record anywhere prior to September 1923. Before that, he was serially Alexander Bankton, Clay Alexander Plenty, Douglas Alexander Little, Alexander Todd Biggs, then Lex Robbins, then, following the death of his father, Luther Dunn, Dunn being his mother's maiden name, and finally, Lex, no middle name, Luther. 
When he registered at City College's School of Civic Administration and Business, it was the first time he'd ever used the name or dashed off the signature. His high school transcripts were impeccably bogus, and with the exceptions of his height and weight and his address at the time, he'd taken a small apartment on 15th Street near Union Square. Every piece of documentation and each filled in line of every standardized form was a carefully considered, always plausible lie. He even claimed to be 20, when in fact he was 18. His father may have been a gross disappointment, foolish and finally unmanned, but by example he had taught Lex both the rudiments and the nuances of creating, maintaining, and if necessary, sloughing off full-blown counterfeit identities. He, or rather the last 15 years of his poisoned fugitive life, also had taught Lex that violence without ruthlessness only made you vulnerable and weak, left you defenseless against self-contempt. How could the dark-eyed gambler whose photographs Lex once discovered buried in a steamer trunk have turned into the chain-smoking, gum-chewing grocery clerk, factory hand, short order cook who sneered at him, resented him, and probably would have beaten him three times to the month if his mother had not always intervened? Yet the man Lex Luthor has become, is still becoming, that man, he has often mused, is undeniably the offspring of Wesley Bankton, who once cut a dashing, aggressive figure taking options on thousands of acres in the Middle West, establishing towns, Wesley, Iowa, Bankton, Missouri, Wesdale, Nebraska, and serving as mayor of each one. At least till it failed, or he grew bored, or in the case of Wesdale, he fled under cover of the night. A thousand times during his childhood, Lex heard about Gorslein Easy, a wild-eyed holy roller who owned less than 50 acres planted in corn, a nobody, a shabby drawling down and outer with a raw-boned, homely wife. Gorslein Easy. Gorslein. What kind of name was that? And what kind of fool was he to imagine he could win an election against Wesley Bankton? Not only that, what kind of imbecile was this corn farmer to think he could publicly accuse Wes Bankton of looting the town's treasury and get away with it? On the 9th of September, 1908, Wesley Bankton found this stupid nobody at work in his smokehouse and shot him dead. That was all well and good. Lex Luthor would have done the same thing. But then... Then his father hastened away in darkness with his imperious wife and their three-year-old red-headed boy and was ruined forever. It was not doing murder that changed him, unmanned him. It was the crushing fear that followed. Fear of capture, trial, humiliation, imprisonment, execution. Fear was what a man could least afford. That was the only useful lesson that Lex ever learned from his father. The father he knew as Dick Plenty, Jerome Little, John Biggs. A father whose memory continues to fill Lex Luthor with disgust. Betty Simon, the girl all the boys call skinny because she is anything but, meets Lois Lane just inside the entrance to the emergency room. Taking her by a wrist, she leads her to a row of chairs. Nearby, a deli man in a grimy apron hunches over, cradling a hand wrapped with a bloody towel. Despite his misery, he is unable to conquer the temptation to give a side glance at skinny. Now that's a nurse, he thinks. Sit, Lois. But what are they saying? He's still in surgery. So why aren't you there? Because I'm not. Sit. Do you want some coffee? No, I don't want any coffee. Where did this happen? I'm not sure. Somewhere on the east side. Had you seen him tonight? We had a big, stupid fight. Listen, why don't I go check? See what I can find out? The deli man lifts his eyes again to watch Skinny Simon leave. But when Lois glowers at him, abashed, he looks back down at his bundled-up hand. Mm. Lois begins to stride up and down the waiting room. But then she spots a cop outside speaking with a group of men who are obviously reporters. Lois comes through the heavy glass door to the ambulance bay. Not too far from one of them university clubs, but nobody's seen anything is what I'm told. And uh, I don't know which club. We heard his camera got smashed, that so? Well, I can set you fellas straight about that. I wouldn't say it was smashed. More like it just fell and broke when the poor lad got in the back. Lois feels a cold pain move in her chest, crawling up from her sternum to the lower part of her throat. But you birds might like this. Seems our trigger man helped himself to the film. Any idea what was on it, Danny? Nope. You? Where was he coming from? Beats me. What's this about a set of burglars' picks? Where'd you hear that? So what about it? Will he have them or not? No comment. Danny, Danny, what do you know about this stiff they just found in a pawn shop with his throat cut? That's only a couple of blocks from where little Willie got shot. Any connection? No comment. Yes, ma'am. You. The cop nods at Lois, who by now has dug out her own pencil and nickel pad from her purse and pushed rudely through the pack of news hounds. So what are the doctors saying about his chances? This Joe gonna make it? 
On Tuesday, the 18th of June, Willie Berg finally opens his eyes again, only to be told that a bill of indictment was handed down yesterday in the city and county of New York, charging him with first-degree murder and the death of Leon Seymour Chodesh. Murder during the commission of an armed robbery. There is the little matter of a claim ticket from the victim's place of business, discovered in Willie's billfold, plus that kit of flagrantly illegal jimmies and picks stuffed in his jacket, his fingerprints on the cash register, the counter, the telephone. And if he wasn't stitched up and so full of drains, the two homicide detectives that arrest Willie in his hospital bed would show him exactly what they think of his cockamamie story about a bookmaker's parlor, a bunch of dead bodies. Only five? Why not ten, Willie? Or twenty? And the secret criminal career of Alderman Lex Luthor, the newest, youngest, and most popular member of the board. So who shot you, Willie? You have a little falling out with your accomplice? You didn't want to split the take? What take? Who shot you, kid? I told you! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go to hell. You're the one who's gonna have a hot date with the electric chair. That same day, Willie's picture runs on the front page of all of the two, three, and five cent papers. Both the news and the mirror refer to him as a mad dog killer. But that doesn't bother him half as much as what the planet calls him, a would-be photographer. Now that hurts. Funeral services for Martha Clark Kent are scheduled for 10 a.m. this morning at the Tomahawk Methodist Church, corner of 4th and Union Streets, Smallville, Kansas. Dr. Thomas B. Callas will officiate. Clark, however, isn't sure his father plans to attend the service at the Methodist Church. For Mr. Kent, it was the last straw when that supercilious prig Tom Callis told the Chippewa handyman Dan Toy that while he could maintain, at a salary too low to be called even a pittance, the church building and cemetery grounds all week long, he and his family could not worship with the congregation on Sunday. They were not welcome. Mr. Kent never again set foot in the Tomahawk Methodist Church. Naturally, he wished Martha had joined him in his boycott, but he recognized that he'd put her in a difficult position. After all, it was her grandfather, R. H. Clark, who'd founded the church back in 1879 when the original town site was plotted out. So Martha continued to attend services, though sporadically, until her illness. Clark usually went with her. And now, on the morning of her funeral, Clark suspects that he might be going into town alone. But just before 9 o'clock, his father appears in the kitchen, wearing his black sears and roebuck suit and shoes. <sighs> they embrace without a word. They set off together in the slant-sided Ford pickup truck. Mr. Kent is the driving, of course. Will you be saying any peace this morning? No. No, I didn't think I would. Will you? No. I liked what you wrote about your mother in the paper, son. That was good. Thank you. But it was 87, not 88, when she came back from Dakota Territory with her little sister and a paw. Mom told me 88. Trust me, Clark. It was 1887. How come you didn't let me have a look at it before you sent that in? I guess I forgot. I'm sorry, Dad. They're in town now, coming up Union Street, half a block from the church. The cemetery with its small obelisks and listing headstones behind a black iron fence. Clark? Yes, sir? I was wondering why you put it in there that you're our adopted son. Because I am. It never mattered. I know that. She loved you like you were her own flesh and blood. I know. And you know I do, too. Don't you? Yes, sir. It was a fine piece of writing, son. I sure couldn't have done it. She cherished her family and baked the world's most delicious rhubarb pie. And her apple pie, too. The way she coated the crust with sugar. That you couldn't beat. Mr. Kent doesn't think he can stand too much more. Martha was all that everyone said, but she was also his wife of 31 years, his best friend, his soulmate, his complement. And she's five feet away from him now, confined forever in the plain wooden coffin she requested. And his heart is broken. Rhubarb pies? That woman made the sun come up. And he wants this ordeal to end, to go home, to be home, back in the house where her spirit is still present will always be present. He wants to go home with his son and grieve. To Mr. Kent's right, Clark sits hunched forward with his head bowed and his eyes closed. His knees are spread apart, and he's gripped the edge of the pew seat. Branching veins have risen on the backs of his hands. I can tell you. When Jonathan Kent turns his head, his glance instinctively dropping, 
He sees, in the foot-wide gap between his son's curled hands, a split opening, breaching in the varnished oakwood edging of their pew. He touches Clark's left elbow. Clark's eyelids snap open. He flinches, jerks backward, and... <laughs> Aghast, Clark looks at the piece of broken wood in his hands, then blushes furiously, as though discovering himself naked in public. Calmly, Mr. Kent takes the wood chunk, leans down, and sets it on the floor under the pew. Behind them, Mr. Kent is well aware the 50 or so congregants, town friends, and neighboring farmers are still looking, still craning, still wondering what in God's name just happened. It's time, he decides. Martha, stay close. I need you. Clark looks around unhappily, back toward the church where two women, Mrs. Cackle and Mrs. Kemp, have come outside from what parishioners call the confraternity room, and where, an hour now since the interment, a solemn repast is still in progress. Mrs. Cackle lifts an arm and beckons. Y'all should come in now. They want us to come in. I know it, but I don't think they'll raise a fuss if we don't, do you? Jonathan Kent slips into a trance of concentration, staring at the mound of rich brown earth in front of him. Then he shifts his eyes to Clark. Take a walk with me. I want to show you something. What? You'll find out. They leave the cemetery by a gate, and where a small fieldstone building is filled with the implements of grave digging. Dan Toy, a large man of 60 with long, swept-back gray hair and ropey, powerful arms, stands in the doorway as they pass by. They walk down Union Street to Maine, turn east there, and continue on. It is a warm summer morning, overcast and humid. On both sides of the exceptionally wide street, automobiles are parked diagonally against the high curbs. Mr. Bleacher is out sweeping the sidewalk in front of his dry goods store. Where the Swedes Bakery used to be, the plate windows are soaked over on the inside, swirling around a square yellow sign that reads, For Rent. Idly, Mr. Kent wonders whatever became of the Swede, whose name he can't recall now. He was Norwegian, really, but everyone just called him the Swede. Is he still in town? Maybe not. There are several more vacant storefronts. The radio repair, a lunchroom, even the shoe and boot repair. All of them gone. Up ahead, Joe Diver, manager of the Jewel Theater, stands on a ladder affixing big letters to the bulb-ringed marquee. So far it reads, Bride of Fran. Both Clark and Mr. Kent give wide berth to that ladder. Uh, Mr. Kent, Clark, my condolences on your loss. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Diver. Half a block on, Mr. Kent gestures to a pressed metal sign jutting out over the sidewalk, Smallville Herald Progress. I had an interesting talk with Newell Timmons the other week. He came out to the house to see your mom. Mr. Timmons did? Where was I? Taking your examinations, I guess. He was saying how he thinks you're a pretty good writer. Told me I was fair. <laughs> he said he talked to you about doing some reporting for his paper. Yeah, he did. I'm proud of you, Clark. I think your mom would have got a big kick from your display of Enterprise. He only wants me for maybe a day a week. I can still work on the farm. I'm pleased. Are you? Well, we'll manage. Be only a day or two a week, maybe three. But I'll still work on the farm. We'll manage. By now they've arrived at the Daftly Grand Town Hall, a marble and copper faux chateau built 30 years ago when Smallville had aspirations to being declared the county seat. With its vaulted ceiling, cavernous gloom, the place puts Clark in mind of some ancient European library where never in a million years would he feel welcome. Mr. Kent starts up the central staircase. Clark hesitates a moment, then goes up too. In between the offices of the assayer and the town clerk, and set flush against the left-hand wall, are several long glass-topped display cases containing photographs of the first few clabbered buildings on Main Street, some arrowheads, and the yellowed front pages of old newspapers describing historic floods and locust infestations, as well as celebrated crimes. There is a Kansas State flag the size of Clark's thumbnail made from dyed kernels of rice by Mrs. Letty Seagar, wife of Dr. L. Kipling Seagar, and a jagged but vaguely thin or rudder-shaped fragment of burnished green metal about the length of a man's foot, but just an inch or so thick. There. Mr. Kent points at the chunk of green metal. Clark notices the hand-lettered card placed nearby, identifies this particular exhibit. A mystery alloy which dropped from the sky on June 5, 1917, landing on the property owned by Millard Ike Cahall. Later, metallurgic scrutiny failed to discern its compositional properties. That's what you wanted to show me? That's it. 
What am I supposed to see? All that's left of your wagon, son. My wagon? The one you fell off before your mother and me found you in the road. The Kents didn't find him in the road, of course. But in truth, it wasn't too far from the road, a few hundred yards. Uh, right about there, Clark, or maybe... Pushing through corn stalks, Mr. Kent squints for a moment. No, right about there. Clark tromps by, turning in circles, peering down, searching for... For what exactly? But the thing itself? That hit down quite a ways, uh, over there. When Mr. Kent stretches out his right arm, Clark eagerly sights along where his finger points. Who saw it first? Your ma. I heard it, but she saw it coming in from up above. From which direction? <laughs> That's my boy. What? The reporter. From which direction? Jonathan turns all the way around. From behind the house to the front. So most likely from the southeast. And that's an excellent question, Clark, because your mom and I both wanted to get it straight. Or when we talked to the army, or whoever came. The army? The war was on, Clark. We thought it was a bomb from a Zeppelin or some kind of airship. What else would we think? A bomb? Well, that's what it looked like, Clark. When we ran out here and saw it, the pair of us figured we were seeing the biggest, fattest bomb in the Kaiser's arsenal. Then we just jackrabbited back this way, thinking we'd been lucky so far, but any second it was bound to blow up. And that's how we happened to find you. Naked as a jaybird. I nearly ran right over you. Clark opens his mouth, but just keeps looking there. Then over there, then back to the house, then over its roof to the southwest. Let's go inside. Hot as it is, I could use a cup of coffee. So that piece of metal you showed me is all that's left? I never found anything more. After it blew up, it was gone. Except for the chunk that fell on Ike Cahall's barn. I guess not on the barn, but pretty darn close. Who's Ike Cahall? Oh, he's long dead. He used to own what's Curran Hurley's now. The cannery? That's ten miles from here. Or more. Clark spoons sugar into his coffee and stirs. So, so that's how come my birthday's June 5th? That's how come. Though your mom said you looked at least eight months old, and the doctor in Tabor Lodge said you looked to be about a year. Of course, he also said you had the strength of a five-year-old. And the coordination, too. You grabbed hold of his eyeglasses and crumpled them. <laughs> Saying that, Mr. Kent is reminded of his own glasses, which he removes and cleans with a napkin. By Tabor Lodge, you mean... The orphanage there, yes. I really broke his glasses? Well, that was the least of it. You were a holy terror. They'd put you in a crib and find you next morning two floors below in some classroom, eating chalk. Really? <laughs> chalk? Oh, and your mother heard this one from the nurses. The superintendent never told us about it, but supposedly you climbed some drapes and had yourself a grand old time hanging from the rod like cheetah the chimpanzee. And when nobody climbed up to get you, you let go. And? Clark. Right, and nothing. They started calling you the super baby. Pass the milk, please, and thank you. But, Dad... Why didn't we tell anybody? No. Well, yes, but... Where did we think you came from? Well, after we decided you weren't part of a German bomb, since we figured no matter how savage we'd heard those Huns were, they weren't bad enough to bomb us with babies. Or dumb enough. So we figured it was some kind of an airship, although Martha, your mom, called it your cradle. My cradle? Well, the truth... We thought somebody shot you off from someplace in Europe or South America or like Kitty Hawk, and we expected to read about it next day in the paper. But why would anybody put a baby inside an airship? Well, that's what we wanted to know. Holding his cup with both hands, Clark stares dreamily at the coffee. <sighs> Clark, it took us maybe 30 seconds to decide that you were ours, that you'd been given to us. That's the first thing. We'd never been blessed with children. I was almost 52, and your mother was, uh, well, a little younger. And some things, it gets too late to happen. But here was this gift. Here was you. So that's the first thing you should know. We adopted you before we took you to any orphanage. As soon as we found you, that was it. You were our son. And why did you take me to the orphanage? Well, pretty hard to explain you at our ages, son. So we left you at the doorstep, like in one of those cartoons you see. 
And so what? We always intended to come back, and we did. You don't know who my people are, or where I come from. I'm all alone. Of course you're not alone. How could you ever think such a thing? Easy. You try coming from another planet. Clark, for goodness sake, you read too many of those magazines. It was a rocket, Dad. It was an airship. Okay, where from? Well, uh, Dad. You're not from outer space. You'd have four tentacles and a nose like, I don't know what, uh, a horn. <sighs> I need to go out for a while. Running to the furthest field that marked the edge of the Kent's farm, Clark stands in high blue stem grass with a light breeze carrying a scent of hay across the meadow and looks south, beyond the big pasture, the calf pasture, the broom corn, the barn, back to his house, bathed in the milky light of a near full moon. He puts back his head, breathes in, and looks up at the stars. I watched Stick fire three shots into that sneaky little weasel, into his back. How could he have survived? And now, and now, according to the papers, he's expected to make a full recovery. Boss, it's going to be fine. The cops like the kid for Leon's murder. They ain't even looking anywhere else. The one concern is what happens when he comes off the dope and starts to talk. Things might change in a hurry. I told you yesterday, Pauly, it's your job to make certain he never comes off the dope. Why do I have to repeat myself? Well, I keep trying, boss. But there's always someone with him. If it's not his skinny girlfriend, it's, it's some blonde nurse with a jean hollow chassis times ten. And now there's an armed bull posted outside his door around the clock. Lex has considerable sway with the New York City Police Department. And in ordinary circumstances, it would be simple enough to scrounge up some narcoleptic potsy and stick him in the hospital midnight to eight. The only time safe to do this thing. But it turns out that a plainclothes dick working out of Headquarters Detective Division down on Center Street, someone named Dick Sandglass, reputedly clean and apparently not a brown nose, either sits guard himself at Willie Berg's door overnight, or else selects others for the job. Lex's hands have begun shaking again. For long periods of time, he has to keep them held in his pockets, and he's started to notice that clumps of his hair come out whenever he brushes or combs it. <sighs> Calm down. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. But why should he have to worry about this idiot Willie Berg when he has so many other things on his plate? Such as the careful awarding of contracts, easily worth $25 million, for the construction of playgrounds, promenades, and ball fields between the Hudson River and Riverside and Fort Washington parks. Such as the brokering of deals for the expansions of subway trunk lines in Brooklyn and the digging of a new 6th Avenue subway in Manhattan. That construction alone will run in the neighborhood of $60 million. If Lex plays his cards right, cements certain friendships, and eliminates certain gadflies, he can see clear to pocketing two or even three percent of the final budget. So many things to do. Not the least of which is the destruction of Lucky Luciano's alliances and various enterprises by means both legal and illegal. Everything's going to be all right, he tells himself again. But why has he suddenly started losing his hair? And why the hell is Dick Sandglass taking such a personal interest in Willie Berg? I appreciate you coming here like this, Mr. Sandglass. No problem. I don't know how I can really help you, kid, but uh, you were always a good pal to my son, and that's worth something. He never had it easy having a cop for an old man. And not just a cop, a real Dick Tracy, who never takes so much as a freeze sinker and a cup of coffee. He's a good guy, though. And when Spider and Willie were young, Dick Sandglass would take them both out to Yankee Stadium two or three times every season. And on one memorable occasion in 1926 to the World Series. It's how Willie got to see Grover Alexander strike out Tony Lazari in the seventh game with bases loaded. As a kid, Willie used to wish that Dick Sandglass was his pop, despite all of Spider's complaints about the old man. A real good guy, Spider's dad. It used to be said the reason his wife left him was because she'd got fed up by his honesty. A bull's wife was expected to own some jewels that weren't paste, a seasonable wardrobe, her own Ford motor car, and a summer cottage in the Catskills. So, what's Spider doing these days? Three to five in Danamora. Atrocious assault. And you couldn't, uh... I wouldn't. Oh. Sandglass sends Willie a look that wipes the hopefulness right off his face. But he reaches a hand out and pats Willie's knee through the bed covers. Spider's holding his own, like I know you will. I really am sorry you got yourself in such a jam. You and me both, Mr. Sandglass. And like I said, thanks for coming. 
Uh, thanks for being here. Those other cops today, jeez, I, I thought they were going to tear out my stitches and stick their hands in there. They won't rough you up, Willie, I promise. But they won't lay off either, not till you start telling the truth. I swear to God, Mr. Sandglass, I am. Why would I make up something like that? Eh, maybe it was the first dumb thing that popped into your head. You remember when, uh, when you and Spider got caught roaming around that Catholic school on Thompson Street? You remember what you said? I was 13. You said four nuns grabbed you and locked you both inside till you promised to convert. I was 13! When somebody comes by tomorrow to ask you more questions, tell the truth. I've been, I swear on my sweet mother. It was Lex Luthor. Please. Sandglass turns to leave. There's somebody named Pauly and somebody called Stick. The three of them. I seen them there, believe me. Stick? Stickowski? Herman Stokowski? I don't know any Herman Stokowski. I'm just telling you, Lex Luthor was there. I seen him there, him and a guy called Stick and a guy named Paulie. Ah, you've always been full of it, Willie. But I'll see they treat you right. I'm telling the truth. I'll be outside. What, I'd kill somebody for my lousy camera? Willie, from what I hear, you'd kill anybody for your lousy camera. Good night. Happy Independence Day, Mother. Lex let himself in with his key and finds her alone on the terrace in her unnecessary invalid's chair. I just had a feeling you'd come by today. Do I get a kiss? Lex bends down and lightly brushes his lips against her flaccid cheek, then straightens back up with pressed powder and face paint clinging to them like gridded glue. Despite the broiling glare of the midday sun, her apartment's terrace faces west with views of the Palisades, the Hudson, and the high conical roof of Grant's tomb. Lex's mother has on a black woolen dress from Arnold Constables. Around her shoulders, she's draped a fringed maroon shawl. Her legs are covered with a plaid blanket. She's tucked it snugly around her hips. On a small glass-topped table within easy reach stands a small squat glass filled, Lex knows, with Kentucky bourbon. Beside the glass is a candy dish containing prescription tablets, barbiturates entirely. Around the clock she keeps that dish near to hand, but every time Lex pays her a visit, there are more pills in it. He can't estimate how many there are at the moment, but 50 at least. Sit down, Alexander. Are your hands shaking? No, Mother. They certainly look it. And for heaven's sake, will you please stop humming? I am not humming, Mother. You were just humming. Then I beg your pardon. Sit, child. He does, directly across from her. She seems smaller than she did even last week. More wrinkled, more crabbed and forlorn, more deeply deranged. And I think you're beginning to lose your hair. You should see a doctor. Or else shave it all off. You have a nicely shaped skull, which you can be sure you inherited from my side of the family. My dear father had a skull shaped like the world. Excellent, a very excellent skull. He was not, however, bald. None of the men in the Dunn family, to my knowledge, ever were bald. You should do something, Lex. Oh, it looks spotty. <sighs> How are you coming along with your engineering studies? I haven't begun them yet, Mother. I haven't had time. Then see that you make time. You know how I feel. Politics are all well and good, but look where they got your father. My career is quite different from his. Let us hope. But the future belongs to the engineers, son. So you say. So I know. Oh, do what you like. I won't be around long enough to see what becomes of you anyway. Mother. <clears throat> Brows furrowed, he stands up. Just below his diaphragm, his stomach begins to ripple in little fluttering spasms. Bracing both palms on the terrace rail, he looks out over the dark blue Hudson. I wish you wouldn't talk like that. You're not even 65 years old. <laughs> Am too. I'm 70. Uh, uh, 71. Mother, and for all these years you've been telling Liar, liar, pants on fire! She leans over the small table, her nose hovering above the glass of bourbon, shifting six inches to hover and twitch above the dish of pills. <sighs> what shall it be today? Oh, what shall it be? Must we go through this every time I come? The bourbon or the barbiturates? Bourbon or barbiturates? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I should be going. 
But you only just got here. Have to show my face at a parade or two. Do you enjoy all that? No. Then why? I have plans, Mother. And what might those be, Alexander? I don't think I need to tell you everything I'm doing. No, you don't need to. But I'd hoped you might want to. All right, Mother. I've decided to take over all of the criminal rackets in New York City. That's all five boroughs. And with the money from that, well, I'm not quite sure yet. Oh, Alexander, really? I don't find this at all amusing. Now sit down! He smiles and remains standing. I'd always thought we had a special bond, you and I. Seeing what we went through together. Fifteen years of hell. But no matter what, I always had you. And I liked to believe that you had me. I did. I still do. But you don't love me. You've never loved me. Mother, that's not fair. <laughs> fair. Papichirit or bourbon? She plucks out a dark green pill from the candy dish. For God's sake! Bourbon! I was thinking just earlier today, don't ask me why, but do you recall that pot metal spaceship, that toy I got you once at Woolworths in Madison, Wisconsin? Columbus, Ohio. And it wasn't a Woolworth, it was a Kresge's. You remember it. <laughs> Red and yellow with tiny little portholes. Of course. Do you also remember how I was so despondent one day, feeling so worn out from everything, all the running, and your father was already sick, hardly ever working? Do you remember? You were always feeling worn out, Mother. Oh, Alexander. You haven't grown up to be the kindest man, have you? You were saying? That I found you on the rug this one day, playing with that little spaceship, and I got down there with you. You remember that? No. No. Well, I said, honey, wouldn't it be nice if we could both just climb into that spaceship and blast off? Go to another planet, just you and me? Oh, I was sick of everything. His hands, Lex realizes, are trembling again. I said, let's just you and me get in your spaceship and blast off. And you said, I'm sorry, Mother, but there is only room for one. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mother, but there is only room for one. <laughs> oh, you really don't remember. I really don't remember. Always the solemn little boy. Practical. <laughs> and practical, yes. Well, run along, my solemn and practical little boy. You'll be late for all your picnics and parades. And Alexander, happy Independence Day to you, too. <laughs> City prosecutor gets bumped up to crack down on organized crime. Byline, New York, New York, July 15, 1935. Assistant District Attorney Thomas E. Dewey has enthusiastically accepted the appointment by Governor Herbert H. Lehman to the newly created post of Special Deputy Assistant Attorney General. The announcement was made this morning on the steps of the old county courthouse on Chambers Street. Mr. Dewey is now charged with conducting a thorough investigation of citywide vice and racketeering before an extraordinary grand jury. Dewey, known as much for his dashing good looks as his prosecutorial zeal, is expected to bring New York's notorious crime syndicates to their knees. Sources close to the governor say the appointment was made after consultation with Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, District Attorney William C. Dodge, and freshman New York City Alderman Lex Luthor. Alderman Luthor, who made the defeat of organized crime a cornerstone of his campaign last year, said, Given the resources available to the Attorney General's office, Tom Dewey should be able to make New York the safest city in America within the next two years. He has my full support. Although not mentioned by name, the clear target of the investigation is mob boss Charles Lucky Luciano, the undisputed czar of organized crime. On Thursday, the 1st of August, 
Willie Berg is informed that his doctors have deemed him sufficiently recovered to be moved from his bed in Roosevelt Hospital to the hospital ward in one of the new fireproof brick buildings constituting the model penitentiary on Rikers Island. The transfer will take place sometime within the next 24 to 48 hours, once the paperwork is completed. I'll still try to keep my eye out for you, kid, but it won't be quite so easy from here. Removing a 3x5 decal-edged photograph from his billfold, Dick Sandglass inches forward in the chair, closer to Willie. Recognize this guy? No. <sighs> Sandglass sits back, looking disappointed and beginning to put away the snapshot. Who is he? I thought you might have told me. Is that Stick? Is that Herman Stakowski? Let me see it again. Willie? I didn't get a good look at the guy's face. I seen his legs. But on the other hand, you saw Lex Luthor's face clear enough. I did. And if they hadn't stolen my film, the other two guys would have been in the picture. You would have seen. According to hospital admitting records, at 3.30 p.m., a male Caucasian, weight 240, height 6 feet 3 inches, date of birth 5-12-95, occupation left blank, is assigned a private room two doors down from Willie's. His chart gives his name as Sidney NMI Marsden and claims he is suffering from diverticulosis. He is not. He's in perfect health, although he does remember to groan occasionally, as he's been instructed, and to complain, but not too much, about his discomfort. In between his groaning and his complaining, he entertains himself by reading stories in a year-and-a-half-old issue of Argosy. It's a tribute to his professionalism that he resists ogling and mashing Betty Simon, one of the nurses on duty. My own, the lungs on that broad. His name is not Sidney Marsden. At a quarter to seven, Lois Lane arrives at the hospital. Because her pocketbook holds a little zippered manicure kit containing a metal nail file and cuticle scissors, she has to leave it with a posted guard. This evening, a young blonde-haired policeman in tunic named Ben Yeager. He apologizes when he divests Lois of her bag. She thinks he's cute. Eighteen months ago, Officer Yeager, still a rookie on traffic detail, arrested Spider Sandglass outside of McSorley's old alehouse, 15 East 7th Street, for assaulting an acquaintance Spider claimed owed him a small amount of money. Clearly, Spider's father doesn't hold that against Officer Yeager. On the contrary. When Lois comes into Willie's room, she discovers him standing at the window, looking down nine stories to the street. You shouldn't be out of bed. They're sending me to Rikers tomorrow. Get under the covers, please. I can't go to jail. I'll go nuts. What about Detective Sandglass? Can't he? <laughs> he thinks I'm still lying. Everybody does. <laughs> Willie hammers the crown of his head against the window frame. You don't think I'm lying, do you, Lois? Willie, I don't think you cut anyone's throat. Of course not. But? I think maybe you saw somebody who just looked like the alderman. I should just stick my tongue in a light socket. Be done with it. Save everybody a lot of trouble. Willie, you need to calm down. Now listen, I did some calling around today and I think I may have found you a lawyer. His name I can't afford a lawyer. I can help. Oh, sure, now you can. Now you can loan me some money. Thanks a whole heap. Don't start. If you'd loan me 30 bucks when I asked you for it... So this is my fault? I'm scared, Lois. I know. I know. She's eager to hug him, but also reluctant. She doesn't want him to cry out in physical pain. But suddenly, Willie hugs her. It's going to be okay. It's all going to be just fine. But with the situation the way it looks, Lois has no idea how. At 10 minutes to 11, a tall and buxom middle-aged nurse that Skinny Simon has never seen before briskly passes her by, absorbed, it seems, in making chart notations on the run. Mm. For a moment, Skinny considers chasing after the woman to remind her it's against hospital regulations for nurses to wear perfume on the job. She is going off duty, however, and besides, she's not the shift supervisor. So instead, she goes to check on Willie, not knowing what she could say to him. Do you wish someone well when they're heading off to jail? But she needn't have worried. When she peeks in, he's pretending to sleep. An RN can always tell. Good night, Officer Jaeger. Skinny clocks out, rides an elevator down to the lobby, and leaves the building. Meanwhile, the atrociously perfumed nurse is removing a vacuum thermos filled with strong coffee from a leather bag she stowed in one of the linen closets when she arrived at the hospital. She glances at her wristwatch, which has no second hand. She's anxious to get started, but it's still too early. Another 45 minutes to an hour at least. Replacing the thermos in the bag and the bag at the back of a lower shelf, she closes the closet, looks up the hall at the policeman sitting in his tipped back chair, she hates pretty boys, and then makes herself scarce. 
The narrow square bar pinned to her uniform reads, Tibble. If anyone happens to ask her, she'll tell them her first name is Rosemary and that it's Mrs. Rosemary Tibble. But she hopes no one asks her. <sighs> At a few minutes past midnight, now the 2nd of August, Ben Yeager feels the first cricks move through his shoulders and lower back when a nurse appears and offers him coffee. Uh, uh, you're an angel. Yeager peers above the square yardage of her bosom to her name bar. Uh, Miss Tibble? Mrs. Thank you, Mrs. Tibble. As she unscrews the deep cap from her thermos, he has to turn his head away slightly and squint his eyes. Perfume has that effect on Officer Jaeger, causes his eyes to sting and water. Soon, if Nurse Tibble sticks around, he'll be sneezing his head off. But she doesn't. She fills the cap with hot coffee and watches him take an appreciative gulp. Why don't you just hold on to the thermos? You need it more than I do. She gives him a motherly pat on his wrist and pads away on her rubber-soled shoes. Past the room where a new patient called Sidney Marsden is getting dressed in the dark. She doesn't notice that his door is closed. It's locked, too. Marsden finishes tying his shoelaces, then goes back to the closet and removes his overnight bag. The bag contains a full set of men's clothes, underwear, trousers, shirt and shoes, everything purchased only yesterday. The size is estimated from newspaper photographs. He rummages past the clothing, feels around, and finds a small bundle, the newspaper wrapping spotted with gun oil. He takes it out and sets it down on a chair. By the radium glow of the bedside clock, he sees that it's half past twelve. He was told not before one, though he's been twiddling his thumbs for going on ten hours already. But if he rushes and does this thing too soon, he'll get outside and there won't be a car waiting. <sighs> So he sits down on the side of the bed. By ten of one, Rosemary Tibble is beginning to feel anxious. Even though she has been ducking into different rooms and utility closets up and down the ninth floor, hiding briefly, emerging, then hiding again, she has, she knows, been noticed by some of the other nurses working the shift. She caught three of them looking queerly at her. Even worse, a freckle-faced Irish nurse has gone over and started flirting with the baby-faced copper, who hasn't, so far as Rosemary can see, taken even a sip of coffee in the last 20 minutes. This better happen soon. She strokes the slit pocket in her uniform skirt and feels the short, loaded syringe there. At the same moment, downtown on West 23rd Street, not far from the Hotel Chelsea, an explosion rips through a 19th century brownstone residence that was converted five years ago into a working man's brothel. From the steps of the nearby YMCA, Herman Stokowski, called Stick, watches the fire with a satisfied grin on his face. At three minutes past on the ninth floor of Roosevelt Hospital, Officer Ben Yeager slumps to one side and immediately begins dreaming. At five minutes past the hour, Rosemary Tibble, having consulted a piece of notebook paper scribbled with instructions, flips several toggles on a little wall dingus that looks much like a fuse box. Immediately up and down the ninth floor, paired blue and red bulbs start flashing an emergency sequence. Now what? What kind of emergency? Everybody, look, check your patients. Let's go check. Go. She watches all of the other nurses respond. They drop everything and rush in a pack towards swinging doors at the opposite end of the hall. At six minutes past one, Mrs. Tibble enters Willie Berg's room. Stopping suddenly, she leans over Willie, who is fast asleep, but whose legs are kicking under the covers. Carefully, she pushes back the left sleeve of his pajama top and pulls out the plunger from her syringe. She feels something cold touch her neck. Put it down, sweetheart. Maybe she would have and maybe she wouldn't have, but Sidney Marsden is impatient beyond any further endurance. She crumples, he catches her, and eases her down to the floor. If he didn't think Mrs. Tibble was a real nurse, thus a good egg and deserving of continued life, he surely would have struck her with blows guaranteed to kill. Wake up. Get dressed. Marsden tosses Willie the overnight bag. Who the hell are you? You want to get out of here? Yeah, but who? Then get dressed. By 1.30, Willie and Marsden are crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Lex Luthor's trusted right hand, Paulie Scaffa, sat at his boss's kitchen table with his feet up, reading the afternoon edition of the Daily Planet. Front page above the fold was a story about one of Luthor's closest allies getting caught with his hands in the till. Gas and electric boss cooks books. 
Byline. New York, New York. August 16th, 1935. Amalgamated Gas and Electric President Howard H. Sloan is being sought for embezzlement of nearly half a million dollars. Mr. Sloan is accused of paying Fred S. Gropper, Vice President of AG&E, an annual salary of $60,000 and then charging the system's many holding companies an aggregate of $150,000 per annum for their respective shares of Mr. Gropper's services and then pocketing the $90,000 a year difference. Mr. Sloan's... Whereabouts are currently unknown. Upon hearing of these revelations, Alderman Alexander Luthor, a personal friend of Sloan's who benefited from the financier's advice and monetary contributions during his recent election campaign, expressed shock and dismay, but gently reminded members of the Fourth Estate that, in America at least, a man is presumed innocent until proven guilty. During his press conference at City Hall, Alderman Luthor was asked by reporters to comment upon his startling new appearance. Running a hand over his recently shaved and polished skull, he laughed and said, It kind of resembles the world, doesn't it? Lex walked into the kitchen in one of his less than friendly moods. I'm late for a meeting with Fatty Arbuckle. He was referring to Mayor LaGuardia, a public friend he privately loathes. You know something, boss? You kind of look like Daddy Warbugs now, especially since you both wear tuxedos. Mind telling me why you're sitting there reading the comics? Is that what I pay you for? J just give me something to do, boss. I'll do it. Find Willie Berg. Boss, we've looked. He, he just vanished. We'll talk more about this tonight. And bring Stick with you when you come back. Sure, sure, boss. A and in the meantime, I I'll keep looking for the kid. You do that. There is no paper published in Smallville, Kansas on August 16th. The Herald Progress, eight broadsheet pages in a tombstone format, comes out just once a week. There will be a new edition next Tuesday. In the meantime, most town and farm residents still keep this past Tuesday's edition on hand. They'll wait until the next one is delivered before putting it in the outhouse or using it for peelings. That's because Newell Timmons, at considerable expense, includes on the next-to-last page of his newspaper a complete seven-day program listing for all of the radio stations you can pick up in southeastern Osage County. In Smallville, Newell Timmons is considered a crackerjack businessman and a genuine public servant, although Jonathan Kent thinks he was a real boob to support Herbert Hoover in the last election. Otherwise, he's a decent enough fellow for a Republican, and he certainly has been good to Clark. Even gives the boy his own byline if something he's written, the story about the seven Amish families, for example, that just pulled up stakes and moved to Pennsylvania, runs in excess of two columns. In the still current number of the Herald Progress, Clark's name appears below, Ewing L. Herbert celebrates 95th birthday, history of basketball to be topic at Sville Study Club, and farm growth since 31 is epic of toil. In addition to reporting those long stories, he contributed several unsigned squibs about a sawmill boiler explosion, the proposed teacher's contract for school district number 43, and the robbery at a farmer's cooperative in Paula, over near the Missouri line, being attributed to members of the Jiggs-Mackley gang. The final sentence reminds readers that Jiggs-Mackley died right here in Smallville, killed last May by a freakishly ricocheting bullet fired from his own gun. Hmm. Clark's father scowls over that last item, prior to taking up scissors and cutting it out of the paper. Most of his son's other stories from the current edition, clipped out and neatly trimmed, are spread over the kitchen table, where there is also a jar of mucilage and a scrapbook. Mr. Kent keeps every story Clark writes, even those not amounting to more than public notices. Well, he can't help it. He's proud. And Clark, who claims to be embarrassed by the sheer thoroughness of his dad's new hobby, is deeply touched by his diligence. I'll be back sometime this afternoon. Uh, whenever will be fine. I think I got all my chores done. I'm sure you did. But I can help you with the sump later if you like. Alger and I will take care of it. You can't do everything, son. Well, maybe you can. But there's no need to. Alger's a good kid. I'm not saying he's not. No, I didn't think you are. But don't be jealous of him either, okay? For almost a month... Ever since Mr. Kent learned that Alger Lee's mother left suddenly for Detroit because her husband had been injured during a strike at the Ford plant, the boy has been helping around the farm three days a week, sometimes four, five occasionally. Dad, come on. Jealous? I just don't... I mean, can we afford to pay somebody? Uh, let me worry about that. So, what's the scoop today? Ah, big doings. Nellie Coleman is donating her collection of colored postcards to the Smallville Library. Uh, sounds like a slow news day. They all are.
Today, universally beloved comedian, radio broadcaster, syndicated columnist, and movie personality, the Cherokee cowboy with a ready wink, Will Rogers, died in a plane crash near Point Barrow, Alaska, along with his friend Wiley Post. After Charles Lindbergh, Post was the country's most famous aviation pioneer. The two friends were on a flight to Russia. No one will soon forget the man who never met a man he didn't like. In sports news, Italy's Primo Camara, who recently lost the world's heavyweight boxing match to American Negro Joe Louis, has had his passport canceled by Achille Storacci, Secretary General of Italy's fascist party. Storacci is quoted as saying, Camara's showing is a dishonor to fascist sport. And in New York City, for the fifth time in two weeks, fire engulfs a house known to be a den of ill repute. All five houses were allegedly operated by associates of indicted racketeer Charles Lucky Luciano. Fire marshals say each fire is a clear case of arson. Three lives have been lost in the fires so far. And the manhunt continues for the so-called photo fugitive William Jacob Berg. Berg, 20, escaped from a guarded room at Roosevelt Hospital just over two weeks ago and is wanted for the murder of a New York pawnbroker, Mr. Ch Lois changes the radio station. She puts a hand to her forehead and slides it across the moisture there. Her blouse clings to her back, and there are embarrassing half-moons of perspiration below her breasts. She desperately wants to take a cold shower, but there is no shower, no tub, in the suffocating little room they've rented in Washington, D.C., where buildings and monuments shimmer like mirages in the swampy heat. And, turning up the heat even higher, Willie and Lois are disagreeing about hair dye. I'll look ridiculous with blonde hair. You want me to look like Buster Crab? Believe me, Cookie, nothing's gonna make you look like Buster Crab. So not blonde. What then? Red? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Willie Berg, the Irishman. <laughs> Leprechaun Willie. <laughs> Maybe we should just shave your head. Wrong thing to say. New York dailies are scattered around the room. On the table, the floor, the narrow studio couch where they slept last night. In the mirror, the post, and the planet, there are pictures of the newly bald and lustrous pated Lex Luthor. I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. Willie twists open the cold water tap on the tiny sink basin. He splashes some on his face, then slicks back his hair. Lifting his eyes, he peers into the shaving mirror. Maybe I should just get some hair cream, go for that Valentino look. Nobody will recognize me then. You really want to do it red? I don't care, I don't care, I don't care! He throws himself down on the couch. I'm dead anyway. Cut it out. You're luckier than you know. Oh yeah? How you figure that? Right now, you should be sitting in a cell on Rikers Island. Or did you forget? Or lying on the bottom of the river with two buckets of cement on your feet. They weren't ever gonna dump me, they liked me! The driver of the Dodge sedan that took Willie Burke through Manhattan and across the Brooklyn Bridge was named, or called, Dakota. Like the States. He actually reached back to shake Willie's hand while they were stopped for a light. And I'm Carol. This was from the man who'd snatched Willie from Roosevelt Hospital. It sounded like a girl's name. Unless it was spelled C-A-R-R-O-L-L -L and was his last name, Willie didn't feel he should ask. Dakota, you think we should stop and put a blindfold on this bird? Should we? I don't know. Uh, if you want, I'll close my eyes. What do you think, Carol? All right, Kate. Close your eyes. Willie closed them, kept them closed, and they rolled through the streets of Red Hook. The car finally stopped. <laughs> Dakota helped Willie from the back. Then he and Carol walked him to a door. But somebody else opened from inside. They brought him to a room and said he could open his eyes. The third man, the man who'd let them all in, was small and fat, with sparse, sand-colored hair combed in strings across the top of his head. There was a card table and several chairs. That was all. You're gonna wait here. Willie nodded at Dakota. The three men went out and locked the door. Willie sat down, bewildered, elated, terrified. He had no idea what time it was. Did it really matter? He was running a low fever. Meyer Lansky walked in with Joe Adonis and Benny Siegel. Meyer removed his Hamburg, placed it on the table, <clears throat> and sat down at the card table. The other two stood. Meyer Lansky was short and coarse-featured, but unlike his companions, whose eyes stayed frosty even when they smiled, even when they laughed, he could express amusement with his whole face, lips, eyes, nostrils, and Willie felt that it was genuine, that here was a guy who could enjoy himself and didn't believe you had to be sour to be a good mobster. 
Can I get you something to drink? No, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lansky. Ah, so, introductions are not in order. You know my associates? Not personally. We've heard some things you've been saying, supposedly saying, and thought we should hear them confirmed or denied directly by you. That's why you're here. Yes, sir. Do you know which things I'm talking about? Well, he was in a panic now. Was Meyer Lansky hooked up with Lex Luthor? Was that it? Had Lansky heard about the story Willie told the cops? Oh, God. He didn't want to be shot again. I didn't kill Leon Chodash, if that's what you mean. I know you didn't kill Leon Chodash, Mr. Berg. He did. Joe Adonis, a thick, sloppy-fleshed man in an exorbitant gray silk suit that glimmered when he moved, raised a hand, doing it in a comic manner, like a schoolchild who knew the answer to a question. We're only interested in who you saw in the basement of Mr. Chodash's establishment. I saw three men. Okay, if you think you're being coy, we'll be glad to show you that that's not the thing to be. I'm not coy. I'm scared. No need. Lex Luthor. Yes. Yes? He was there. You saw him? I took his picture. That's why they came after me. And this picture is gone? I wouldn't be in this mess if it wasn't. None of us would, Mr. Berg. It's incredible. Just incredible. What is? That they didn't even know who their rival was. Yeah, until I showed up. Yeah, it is. When are you meeting this guy? Five. Trust him? Lewis slips into a clean blouse. Buttoning it up, she turns around to Willie. I can handle John Gurney. You ever put the moves on you? He was my college professor. Mmm. <sighs> Willie watches her sit down and roll on and secure her nylon hosiery. How do I look? Too good. Thank you. I still have time. For what? He walks up behind her and puts his arms around her middle, his cheek to hers, and clinches hard. I'm glad you're all recovered, but don't you dare. <clears throat> Lois pushes Willie away gently. <sighs> She takes a seat on the sofa and pats a place beside her. As soon as he joins her, she touches his face. Willie? Yeah? Willie nuzzles her hand, enjoying the touch. Do you think Meyer Lansky and those others will try to kill the Alderman? Why not? But who knows? You must have heard them talk. Not really. Maya came back only once. The very next day with Mr. Luciano and... Uh, Mr. Luciano? Politest guy you ever heard. Makes Amy Vanderbilt sound like Tugboat Annie. <laughs> He came with Meyer Lansky and... I told him the same story. And let me tell you, Mr. Luciano forgot his good manners for a minute there. But you didn't hear them say what they might do? Sweetie, they weren't about to make their plans in front of me. They shipped me off to a clinic to heal up and then they dropped me in downtown Jersey City. You know the rest. I wandered around collecting pop bottles for the deposits. When I had five, I cashed them in and used the dime to call you. Better get moving. It's 20 past four. Wish me luck. You think this guy will go for it? I have no idea. <sighs> Willie then unfurls the turban in front of the little mirror. Touching his still damp hair, he cocks his head to the left and then to the right. Arg! Willie the Red. <laughs> Nellie Coleman, proudly 87, is one of Smallville's most cherished eccentrics. She brews tea from gnarly roots and a dried seagrass, guaranteed to stimulate everything from appetite and regularity to mental telepathy, and believes in supernatural visitations. She is forever finding interesting relics in her garden and side yards, usually chunks of rusted metal, Indian implements, Civil War bullets, the heel from a cavalryman's boot. But once she claimed to have unearthed, bones that proved some dinosaurs were as small as dogs. The street Clark is walking along now, shortly past one o'clock in the afternoon, is the only one in Smallville named after a tree, Maple. Nellie Coleman's house is number 88, on a corner lot. Clark finds Miss Coleman standing on her front lawn, looking down on two dead birds, each bird wearing the telltale red wound of a BB gun. With her fluffy white hair, tiny crabbed face, almond-shaped spectacles, and old-fashioned swishing black dress, she reminds Clark of pictures of Carrie Nation invading a saloon. You devil! Miss Coleman, I... But she isn't hollering at Clark or even looking at him. Charging off across her green-trimmed lawn, she comes to a halt directly below a thick-trunked leafy oak. You little devil! Do they teach you on the radio to murder God's gracious little creatures? Well, do they? From high in the foliage, a voice calls down. Don't you yell at me, you old witch! Branches shake, then a blonde boy's head appears followed by the barrel and stock of a BB rifle. 
Donald Poor, get down from my tree this very minute, you radio heathen. I'll call your father. Donald Poor's father, F.H. Poor, owns the Smallville Bank and is the wealthiest man in town and lives in the house opposite to Miss Coleman's. I don't care. Miss Coleman tears across the lawn, climbs the stairs, and lets the door slam behind her. Donnie, do what Miss Coleman told you. Don't have to. Yes, you do. <clears throat> Donnie shinnies lower, crouches on a branch about eight feet above the ground, his daisy rifle in a small fist. He is nine years old, dressed in new dungarees with the cuffs rolled twice, and a polo shirt sprayed with red, yellow, and green comets and planets. Most of the planets have rings around them, like Saturn. Go on. Don't stand close. All right. Clark ambles back across the lawn and up onto the porch. Little Donnie Poor tosses down his rifle, then drops to the grass. <laughs> Snubbing his nose at Clark, he tears off without taking the birds with him. Clark shakes his head, wondering if Miss Coleman will be in any mood now to grant him his pointless interview. Wondering if he has outgrown Smallville. Lex Luthor's mother was buried two weeks ago in Moravian Cemetery on Staten Island. There had been no wake or funeral or burial service, but Lex paid for the plot in the interment, anonymously. This afternoon, he is climbing the cemetery's neatly terraced acres and laboriously winding his way past and between headstones. Covering nearly 80 acres, the place is a packed, crowded city of death. Bewildering, really. He never dreamed he would be the sort of man to visit his mother's grave. Life is full of surprises. And here's another one now, the gravesite he's been looking for. <laughs> After tossing the wrapper of lilies on the still fresh grave, Lex eases down on a small ornamental iron bench. You know, I was recalling the last thing you ever said to me. You wished me a happy Independence Day. I wonder if after I left you realized it was just too good an exit line to waste. Was that it? I mean, for heaven's sake, mother, what a thing to do. I suppose you'd been crazy for a long time, so there's no blame, of course. Certainly not for me. I'm very disappointed in you. Not that I believe you can hear me tell you so. We don't believe in that stuff, do we? I won't be coming back, mother. His hands are shaking badly. He looks at them in horror. No, I didn't love you. Is that such a crime? Love. If you wanted that, you should have given birth to Irving Berlin, not me. I gave you something far better than love. Even as he says it, Lex isn't sure what he means, or what the something far better might have been. Himself? His personality? His drive? His retaliatory nature? But as it turns out, he won't have to finish his speech. He doesn't have the chance, because from the corner of an eye, he spots three men wearing hats and inappropriate black raincoats walking quickly toward him, wending around headstones and monuments. One of the men reaches inside his coat, and that's enough for Lex. He ducks and runs. Machine gun bullets behind him glance off granite, punch into limestone. Lex pivots, swinging his head around, assessing the possibilities. He dives behind a fenced monument to Richmond County sailors killed during the Spanish-American War. They made the ultimate sacrifice. He scrambles away on all fours. Both Stick and Polly had urged Lex to carry a weapon, but how could he do that? He's an elected official. An elected official who... is not afraid, he realizes. Three gunmen are chasing him through a deserted cemetery. He's unarmed, hobbled by ungiving shoes better suited to ceremony, and yet is unafraid. <sighs> Crouched behind the pediment of an archangel with outspread wings, he looks at his hands. Not a tremble. Lex raises his head an inch or two, searching for his pursuers. He sees one of them, just as the man spots Lex. Dakota! Over here! Over here! Lex takes off again. At the groundsman shed, he kicks open the door and grabs a pickaxe from the workbench. He runs back outside, pulls the door shut, then ducks around behind the shed. Where are you, Carol? Follow my voice! That last was from the gunman who saw Lex crouched behind the alabaster angel and is now less than 20 feet away. If the second man or the second and the third man arrive before Lex can get to this first one, well, whatever happens will happen. Relaxing his stomach muscles, Lex feels a long, buoyant thrill of pride. When Carol stops in front of the shed, Lex grabs the axe handle with two hands, one fist around the base, the other below the head. Gun in his right hand, Carol is reaching for the door latch with his left. 
Lex drives the chisel edge into the back of Carol's skull. Lex snatches up the dead man's gun. It's a revolver. Carol! 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 Where are you, Carol? And follows the sound of Dakota's voice, walking steadily and straight-backed, swinging both arms like a commuter moving purposely across Grand Central Terminal, but with plenty of time to catch his train. When Dakota straggles off a grassy hill, Lex shoots him in the temple. If he comes upon the third man, fine. But now he is going back to his car. The happiest man in the big white world. A minute later, Lex is nearly to the cemetery gates when he notices a hat bobbing up and down about 20 yards off to his left. The man is fat and lost and perspiring. Lex shrugs and walks over there. The little fat man dies on a graveside bearing the epitaph of Colonel Nicholas Howitt, dated 1743. On the long drive back to Manhattan, Lex turns on the car radio and listens to Make Believe Ballroom. John, I know I'm asking a big favor, John. I'd say so, yes. Gurney takes another sip at his cocktail. He's on his second Ryan ginger ale. Lois so far hasn't touched her first. A very large big favor. Dressed in a pale tan summer weight suit, he arrived half an hour ago, 20 minutes late, carrying a Panama hat by the crown. This friend of yours isn't in any real trouble, is he? With the police or anything like that? No! No, of course not. It's just, it's like I told you, he's got himself into some, well, I guess you'd call it family difficulties. Back home in Poughkeepsie? Monticello. And you've known this boy since when? Oh, practically all my life. We were in school together. I can vouch for him, Professor Gurney. John. And he's a really good photographer, John. It's not like I'm asking you to give a job to someone who's not qualified. <laughs> of course not. Lois, are you lying to me? I swear, no. <laughs> you came all the way down to Washington just to ask me to find some work for this old schoolmate of yours? You could have phoned. Well, I thought it would be nice to see you again. Well, it's nice to see you too. So can you do this? I really don't know. I remembered that night you were joking with me, remember? And you said you could send my boyfriend to North Dakota. So I thought... Uh-huh. Whatever happened to your boyfriend, by the way? Wasn't he a photographer, too? No, he wasn't. I wonder where you got that idea. Why do I feel that nothing is quite kosher about all of this? Can you tell me? Can you help out my friend? You want me to find a job for this old chum of yours who's got himself into a fix at home and needs to get away. That's it in a nutshell? He's a good photographer. Okay. All right. Cards on the table. For a dear friend... A dear friend, mind you, not a former student. For a dear friend like you... Yes. I might be able to find something. Yes. Thank you. Oh, don't thank me yet. Oh. Oh? And what does that mean? I'm not sure. You haven't touched your drink. And I don't intend to, regardless of what happens. I probably should run. I'm sorry. Does your wife have dinner waiting? Hmm. You're quite a different person from the smart little girly I used to know. He removes a long billfold from inside his jacket and lays a ten on the tablecloth beside his glass. I really do have to run. It was good seeing you. She nods, feeling on the verge of tears, on the verge of apologizing, of begging, obliging. <laughs> As he stands up, Gurney hands her a small white embossed card. Tell your friend to call this gentleman here, but give me time to write a short memo first. Are you serious? John, I don't know what to say. He touches her fondly on the cheek and moves off. Then he stops and looks back. Lois... I'll need your friend's name. What? Her entire body, from the crown of her head down to her insteps, turns cold. His name? What's your friend's name? William. William what? Boring. William Boring. Miss Coleman? Miss Coleman? 
Finally, Clark goes inside. He thinks he might find Miss Coleman still on the telephone, so he tiptoes into the high Victorian front parlor. Miss Coleman? It's Clark Kent. The room makes Clark feel claustrophobic. It contains two brocaded divans, a half dozen overstuffed chairs, intricately carved side tables, a threadbare Persian rug, an embroidered fire screen, and a green and white tiled fireplace mantle with porcelain figurines ranged along the top. An electrified chandelier descends from a medallion in the ceiling. And by the window, there is a moth-eaten stuffed owl on its own pedestal. Through that window, closed and hung with sheer curtains that need laundering, you can see the poor mansion. Clark finds her at last in the kitchen, filling a glass from a brown bottle whose label is bordered with mysterious pictographs. At first, she looks over at him, then sets down the bottle and drains her glass. Standing in the doorway, Clark can smell its alcohol content. Do you know the Sherpas, Mr. Kent? No, ma'am. They live up in the Himalayas, and they live practically forever and have terrific strength in their most perfect lungs. This is what they drink. I'd offer you a sip, but you're too young. Miss Coleman? Is that insolent monster still in my tree? No, ma'am. He's gone. Did you call his father? His father? Why would I call his father? We don't speak. He's an awful man. And I'll tell you something else. He wears toilet water. Miss Coleman leads Clark back down along the hall, hung with oval family portraits, everyone unsmiling, and into the front parlor. <sighs> She sits facing the window, and Clark takes the chair opposite her. He opens his carry-all for his notepad and a pencil. Shall we begin? Miss Coleman is produced from somewhere, the table beside her, a small flat packet of hand-tinted postcards, the Grand Tetons on top. She unties the packet. As I told Mr. Timmons, I've arranged for a display of my collection at the public library, but I thought... I thought... No, this one... Clark watches Miss Coleman's shoulders droop, her eyelids close, and stay closed. Ma'am? Miss Coleman? Clark rises slowly from his chair, with eyes fixed on the old woman whose head is plopped onto his shoulder. As he reaches to take the postal cards from her hands before they can spill all over her lap... Oh, oh, my God! She springs up like she's been shot off the chair by a broken coil. Miss Coleman, I'm sorry. I I'm really sorry. Her eyes are as big as eggs, but she's looking past Clark out through her front window. She grabs him by his arm and points. Across the street, little Donnie Poor, still with his rifle in hand, is walking foot in front of foot along the roof line of his house, a good 60 feet above the ground. Clark has no sooner registered that sight than the boy slips. His rifle flies off in a wide arc, and Donnie goes sliding down the inclined roof, bumping over the blue scaly shingles, his sneakers dislodging pieces and flinging them into space like skeet. He rolls off the edge, grabs at a gutter, but that tears free, and then he's falling. Later at dinner, Clark retold his father the events of the afternoon. Uh, I figure something like that must have taken, what, five seconds all told? I don't know, Dad. But you caught him. I caught him. Yes, I did. By the time he got there, I was there. Lord have mercy. Yeah, well, even he couldn't have done it much faster, if I do say so myself. Whoa there, cowboy. Only kidding, Dad. Uh-huh. And Miss Coleman saw all this? Sure did. What? What's wrong, Dad? Nothing. So, uh... I guess that means everybody is going to know about you now. Clark's expression, which had darkened for just a moment at his father's distress, turned suddenly waggish. <laughs> Don't worry, Dad. She thinks I sneaked a drink of her patent medicine. You're kidding me. And did she ever bawl me out about it? <laughs> <laughs> but you should have seen that catch, Dad. Mr. Kent gets up slowly from the table and taps a hand on Clark's shoulder as he goes past. Knowing he'll stay up long past his usual bedtime tonight, remembering Clark's adventure and the starry gleam in his son's eyes as he recounted it, and worrying. Just worrying. In late August 1935, the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt allocated $6,288,000 to the Writers Project, a branch of the Federal Arts Project, itself a branch of the monolithic Works Progress Administration. Part of the money was paid out in salaries for hundreds of career writers on the public dole. These men, some women too, but mostly men, 
were given a few days training and then dispatched around the 48 states, collecting raw data for a planned series of motoring guidebooks. Not that anyone in official Washington believed such things were needed. Honestly, how many people were itching or able to take scenic automobile trips during a depression? The project primarily was a way for some idle citizens to earn $10 or $12 a month, particularly a special category of citizens you had to figure wouldn't be much help building dams and bridges. Each carload of field workers included at least one academic who knew something about demographics, survey taking, and interviewing techniques. The rest could be fiction writers, ad copywriters, jingle writers, gag writers, playwrights, poets, or radio scripters. And there was usually a professional photographer, although sometimes one of the writers would be tapped for the role and issued a box brownie. Among the five field workers covering the territory of eastern Kansas late that summer was a photographer who knew what he was doing, even though he usually groused about doing it. A redhead named Willie Boring. The team assembled in Kansas City, Missouri on Wednesday, the 11th of September, Willie having trained out there from Union Station in D.C. On his way to Missouri, all of the papers he read were filled with stories about the assassination of Senator Huey Long in Baton Rouge. Although Willie had no love for Huey Long, who had always struck him as a little dictator with a gumbo drawl, he felt sorry for the poor slob. His sympathy connected, he realized, to the fact that he'd been shot himself recently, and that only luck had saved him from sharing the Kingfisher's fate. In the same papers, it was also reported, but with far less coverage, that Lucky Luciano, charged in August with 62 felony counts of compulsory prostitution, the best the Dewey Commission could come up with, had had his bail revoked by New York's Governor Lehman and been confined on Rikers Island. In a funny sort of way, Willie felt even sorrier for him than he did for Huey Long. Luciano had those good manners and hated Lex Luthor. In Kansas City, Willie mailed Lois a nostalgically tinted picture postcard, horse-drawn streetcar, men in derbies, pink clouds at dusk, and then didn't write her again. Now, Big City Willie was taking pictures of mile markers and fence rails, water towers, and main streets, all exactly the same. Eastern Kansas, subsistence farms, poor little towns, nearly every place the site of some atrocity committed before, during, or after the Civil War. And wherever his team went, they heard the same stories from amateur historians, the same dopey legends, local lore, and tall tales. Jesse James, Big Nose Kate, Kerry Nation, Miller Crow, the ghosts of massacred free staters groaning on the wind, the super baby in the orphanage. But whenever Willie finds himself buzzing with discontent, he can still hear in his head what Lois would say. It's not better than Rikers Island? So it's better than Rikers Island. Okay, all right, but still. Today, Saturday, October 12th, in the town of Tabor Lodge, population 1,249, Willie passes half the morning taking pictures of buffalo troughs and a war memorial, after which he'll hike back to the house in town, where the team has rented a couple of rooms. He shares the attic with Dave Nero and Studs Dillon. Their names make them sound like pulp magazine writers, but in fact, they are partnered up playwrights working in the light comedy mode. Nero is quick with the one-liners, Dylan is the plot man. Their plays, which have gone unproduced over the last several years, are set on the Philadelphia mainline or in some Manhattan penthouse. Worlds of money and pedigree Willie cannot imagine they know about firsthand. They resemble a couple of stew bums, dressing identically in dingy white dress shirts and cheap gray trousers. Dylan has a dead leg, wears a stirrup around his left elevator shoe that connects to a brace strapped to his calf. Maybe he had polio. Willie wonders about it, but never asks. Early on, he decided it was best not to get too chummy with his traveling companions. He doesn't have his new autobiography worked out enough that it could stand close scrutiny. When he comes in this morning a little after 10, the superheated attic air is oppressive. Instantly, Willie feels cranky. Nero is pacing and dictating while Dylan sits at the typewriter. I've taken all the bruises from that beast that I intend to. And then she says, metaphorically speaking, of course, darling. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, you're mad. It's a guaranteed laugh, studs. Willie lays his camera and paraphernalia on his cot, then changes into a clean shirt. I seen the car down in front. Be all right if I took her out for a couple hours? You'll need a fill up, Willie. Oh, and get a receipt. Yeah, all right. See you guys later. Outside it is hot as blazes, but driving with the windows rolled down, he can at least catch a breeze. The draggled fields of stripped corn stalks press against both sides of the concrete highway. 
The occasional crossroads are marked with arrow-shaped signs. Seven miles to Paris, ten miles to Tillerton, fourteen miles to Smallville. Smallville. Right away, Willie imagines an animated cartoon village, everybody tiny, an elf with a high, chirpy voice. Willie would be like Gulliver. Oh, I'm losing my mind. Just beyond a bridge that spans a slow river comes Paris. It doesn't seem like it's even a town anymore. The few clambered houses look abandoned, but when Willie sees a filling station on his left, he steers off the road. He stops alongside the two perfection gasoline pumps before noticing that both the office and garage bay windows are swirled over with glass wax. Out of business. His gas needle jiggles above empty. Maybe he should turn around and go back. But according to the last sign, it's only a few miles to Tillerton. With any luck, he can find a station open there. Well, he's about to release the handbrake when he changes his mind, opens the door, and gets out. Here's as good a place as any to relieve himself. He walks on around to the back of the small white building and to take care of his business. As he finishes up, he glimpses a carport up a slight incline. It's slat-sided, decrepit, and jungled over with crispy vines. But there are gaps enough to glimpse an automobile parked inside. But a Soto Woody, he discovers when he takes a closer look. The body filmed with powdery dirt, a headlamp shattered, and not much tread on the front tires. Once upon a time, though, it was a nice machine. Willie's heart jumps when he comes back around to the front of the station and discovers a wide-shouldered older man standing in front of the government Ford, one foot braced on the fender. The man is dressed in overalls, heavily spotted with grease. One cheek is badly waffled with acne scars. His high bush of curly brown hair is shaped like a footballer's helmet. The office door stands partly open now, and Willie has the feeling somebody's in there. I was hoping to get a fill-up. The curly-haired man stands there scowling and points at the smeared windows. Look open to you? Guess not. Willie is about to move again, but the man abruptly kicks the fort's license plate with the heel of his shoe. So, you a government man, are you? Me? Then Willie catches the reason for the question. Impressed into the plate, right above the mix of letters and numbers, it reads, U.S. Government. Nah, I'm just taking some pictures for the WPA. The man lifts his foot from the fender and sets it back down on the ground. Pictures of what? Whatever they tell me. But if you want, I'll take a picture of you, standing over there in front of your station, if you want. I don't want. Well, then I won't. Definitely, somebody else is watching from inside the office. Willie registers a slight but distinct movement there. A shadow flicker. And it gives him the creeps. Time to roll out. Would you happen to know if there's a filling station in Tillerton? Tillerton? Isn't that the next town up the road? Elaborately off-handed, the man gives a shrug, which only makes Willie a little more nervous. <coughs> the man doesn't move. Willie fully intends to back out of there in another two seconds, but finally the man steps off to one side and lets the car pass. Turns out in Tillerton there's no filling station either, so Willie keeps pushing on to Smallville. On the outskirts of Smallville, a Hooverville sprawls randomly in a scrub field. Most of the camps are constructed of blistered interior doors, but some are made well of planed boards or good logs and look fairly permanent. On an impulse, Willie steers onto the grassy berm, stops the car, and sets the handbrake. Grabbing his camera through the open window, he walks back to the place that's called Smallerville, population 147, according to a staked hand-painted sign, or Smellville, according to another, cruder sign, whitewashed on a tree and underscored with a blaze. Near the roadside, Willie sees a young fellow about his age wearing a cheap suit and writing in a nickel pad while he talks to a little colored girl at a lemonade stand, an upended wooden soda crate. She has pigtails and wears a shapeless blue dress. A dinner plate across the top of her pitcher keeps out the bugs. There is a single Dixie cup. Got a thirst, mister? I guess. He nods to both the girl and the young guy in the suit. While she carefully pours Willie a cup, he puts down his camera and pats his trouser pockets for coins. Then he gives her a nickel. I don't got change. That's all right. You can have three drinks. Oh, one's plenty. Uh, could I take your picture, honey? She beams, flattered to be asked. Uh, no, no, just be yourself. You don't have to pose. What's your name, sweetheart? Rose. That's pretty. Is there a filling station close by? I'm sure hoping the answer is yes. About a mile ahead. Willie nods his thanks to the young man, then strolls off into Smallerville. So that makes how many customers you've had today, Rose? Asking permission first, but taking the scantest shrug as a yes, 
Willie photographs several old black men in Big Smith coveralls talking on rope-bottom chairs, a woman offering her baby water in a Coca-Cola bottle that has a rubber nipple squeezed over the lip, and two young brothers who stare anxiously at his camera like it's a schoolmaster with a hard question and a mean disposition. At the sound behind him, Willie turns his head. It's that young guy in the cheap suit again. Hello? Hello yourself. Would you mind my asking your name? I might? Why? I just... I thought I could put it in the story I'm writing, if you don't mind. Story you're writing? I'm sorry, I'm Clark Kent, Smallville Herald Progress. He flips his pad to a clean page. <laughs> you really got your own newspaper in a dinky place like this? The guy's face turns red, but he smiles, snapping his notebook shut like he's probably seen it done in the movies. Thanks anyway. Hey! Hey, I didn't mean anything! It was only a joke! So, uh, you write for the paper? Clark glances at him, but keeps going. So, what are you writing? You writing about that little girl? I'm writing about kids selling lemonade during this heat wave. She's just one of them. Oh, hey, interesting. No, it's not, but that's what I'm doing. They let you run stories about colored people in your paper? Must be a pretty advanced little town you got here. Clark's mouth moves fractionally, lips pushing out. For a moment, it seems as though he might say something, but he doesn't. He starts walking again, heading for the highway. Wait, 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 hey, wait! I took a picture of that little girl. Think your paper might be interested? Could run with your story. We don't run pictures. None? Sometimes we run drawings, but nobody around here can draw too good, so it's mostly just stick men. You serious? <laughs> Clark hikes along the edge of the highway now. <laughs> oh, jeez. I thought for a minute you were serious. Stick men, that's pretty good. <laughs> Hey, you want a lift? I'm going into Smallville. No, that's all right. Now, come on, I'll give you a ride. What's your name again? Clark. That's your last name? First. First name Clark, last name Kent. And I'm Willie. Bory. Really? Yeah, yeah, get in the car. They get about a hundred feet. <laughs> want me to take a look under the hood? Don't bother. I'm out of gas. The filling station's not a mile up the road. I don't have a gas can. What do you need that for? You steer, I'll push. Yeah, sure. Walking around behind the car, Clark braces himself on his toes and stretches out his arms, palms against the trunk. Ready? Get off of it. You said a mile? You ready? The Ford starts to roll. Enough! Let's just... And picks up speed. <gasps> Whoa! Willie has to grip the wheel. The speedometer needle arcing steadily to the right. 15, 20, 25. As Clark gets ever smaller in the rearview mirror, Willie hunches further over the wheel, clutching tighter, taps on the brakes, then tromps on them when he sees a red crown station coming up fast on the right. The Ford rolls to a gradual stop beside one of the two round-topped pumps. Overhead, a canopy stretches to the front door of the little glazed brick office. Wow. <laughs> What just... Uh, <laughs> Willie's hands drop to his lap. That, he thinks, didn't happen. Whatever just happened, didn't. Fill her up! A white-haired old man in a gray shirt and trousers lifts the hose from a pump. At the same time, he gives the side crank one half turn. And, uh, check your oil! Uh, yeah. Please. <clears throat> Willie sits there frowning while the attendant raises and braces the hood and reads the dipstick. Hey, you're okay for a while on oil. He goes to check on the progress of the fill-up. Yeah, hiya, Clark. How's the boy? In disbelief, Willie watches as Clark Kent makes his way easily off the road, being deliberately nonchalant, show-offy, and heads for the car. I'm fine, Mr. Thayer. Yourself? Oh, I guess I'm doing all right. Oh, say, Clark, that was a nice story you wrote about Geraldine Netwin's birthday party. Why, thank you. Eh, uh, only thing, son. It was her tenth birthday, not her twelfth. Mr. Thayer hitches back the hose and replaces the gasoline cap. Uh, that'll be 92 cents, mister. Clark climbs into the passenger side and pulls the door closed. Can we go now? Please? Uh, and uh, you know that softball game at the Church of Christ? Why, you made a huge mistake. You want to tell me how you did that, Hercules? I pushed you downhill. Big deal. What downhill? What hill? Now that Jiggs Mackley is dead and four of the other boys have headed off to Mexico, Ike, Curly Ike Kelting, is boss of what's left of the old gang, Milt George and Claude Draper. 
both of them, like Curly Ike, natives of Oakfusky County, Oklahoma. Before the Depression, Curly Ike worked as a cowboy and a wildcatter. He was married and raising three small children. He was a 33rd degree Mason. But after things went bust, he was reduced to stealing just to feed his family. And, well, to enjoy a few small luxuries, hunting rifles, ammunition, flabby girlfriends, he would get word that he'd be welcome to help rob this office or burgle that house and take away from each job at least 20 bucks. Then Jiggs Mackley passed through town. They met one day at a ranch where Curly Ike was rustling a few head of beef cattle, and Mackley invited him to join his gang. It seemed a good deal. Unfortunately, at his first bank job in Pawnee, Curly Ike was identified by someone in a teller's line who used to live several houses away from Ike when they were both kids. If only Ike had noticed him. He could have shot the bum and continued on the way he'd been. But no, suddenly Curly Ike was a wanted man, with his very own wanted poster. He left home for the last time in late March of 1932, more than three years ago. He's tired now and near broke, and his right shoulder is a constant agony. He was shot there ten months ago, robbing a bank in West Plains, Missouri. The bullet just ruined the muscles. Soon as he has a decent stake, a few thousand bucks, Curly Ike plans to move to Canada. Toronto, maybe. Rent an apartment, find a big soft woman, and start life over again. He is looking forward to Canada so badly that whenever he thinks of it and about how many things can go wrong so he'll never get there, his belly seizes up like he has a bad appendix. Right now, in Smallville, Curly Ike is suffering that kind of agony. He sits behind the wheel of a silver-green and dark-green eight-passenger Cadillac Fleetwood limousine parked up the street from the white-clabbered Church of Christ. He's wearing a chauffeur's cap, but not the complete livery. That would have been too much of a production. Overalls will do. Twenty minutes ago, Curly Ike, Milton Claude, staged an automobile breakdown near the corner of Maple Street in North Watkins. When the poor family's chauffeur got out to help, Claude knocked off the dummy's cap as he'd been told to and shot him twice in the brain. After they dragged his body into some hedges, Curly Ike drove the limousine to the church. Claude and Milt followed in the gang's last remaining vehicle, a 1931 DeSoto Woody. It is almost two o'clock, and within a few minutes, the little poor snot should be leaving Bible school, conducted in the basement of the church meeting hall. Ike wonders if there's time for a quick smoke. Probably not. Already, some children are heading his way along the sidewalk. <coughs> Curly Ike lurches from the limo and runs around the hood and pulls open the rear curbside door. Then he tears back and gets behind the wheel again. He hopes Claude and Milt are paying attention. Posted near the church's bulletin board, they are both pretending to read the daily worship times and the title of the upcoming Sunday sermon, Manna from Heaven or a Comet. Curly Ike wonders what the hell that's all about. Manna from a Comet? He has an abiding interest in religion, Ike does, especially miracles. He hopes he doesn't need one today. See you at school, Tommy! Here comes the kid, Donald Poor, the banker's son. Curly Ike averts his face, turning it toward the street so Donnie won't notice that he isn't the regular driver. The privacy window is up between the front and the rear with the curtain drawn. Ike can't see what's happening back there, but the car lists suddenly to the right, someone climbing in. Two miles beyond Smallerville, Curly Ike steers the limousine into a belt of trees they selected as their rendezvous. Claude drives up a minute later. From the limousine, Claude and Mel drag Donnie poor, limp and anesthetized. <coughs> they dump him into the DeSoto's trunk. <coughs> Last night, they drilled air holes in it. All set? <coughs> Curly Ike is now behind the wheel of the DeSoto. <coughs> that went okay. Easy for you to talk, Claude. I'm all scratched up. Look at me. If I was that kid's daddy, I wouldn't pay no ransom. Well, lucky for us, you're not his daddy, Milt. Hello? It's me. Oh my God, Willie! Willie pulls shut the bifold door of a telephone booth on the corner of North Main and Schaffenberger Streets. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. What's going on there? My classes are all pretty good, but you wouldn't believe how much work I have. Damn it, Lowe. I mean, what's going on? Well, there's nothing about you anymore in the paper, if that's what you mean. That's what I mean. Don't get snippy. How would you like driving around Kansas? That cop you know came by to see me, twice. 
Dick Sandglass? He said if I was ever to hear from you, I should tell you to call him. I think he wants to help. Oh, sure. And what's going on with our favorite alderman? I don't know, but Lucky Luciano's in jail, and Meyer Lansky and Benny Siegel both took off for California. I'm sunk. Just hold on tight, honey. It'll work out. I promise. Hey, where are you calling from? Lois, I should go. Right? Please? Once in a while? What if the cops are checking your mail? Then send it to general delivery. Okay, uh, I'll try. I miss you. Yeah, me too. (sighs) Stepping from the booth, he looks up and down the street. Which way? (laughs) Does it matter? He starts to walk. After a few minutes, Willie spots that same kid again, Clark something, that he gave a lift. He's coming out of a storefront. Ah, the venerable Herald Progress. Hey, let me ask you a question. Anything interesting I should take a picture of here in town? We got a pretty impressive town hall. Yowza! Town hall, you say? Willie rolls up his eyes. When he rolls them down again, (sighs) Clark is gone. Solid gone. If he were the type to scratch his head, Willie would be scratching it now. Hmm? With a shrug, he starts back to where he parked the car. He's already decided to pass on the impressive town hall when a Smallville police car pulls over to the curb. His impulse is to cut and run, but he doesn't. He's Willie Boring. He works for the WPA. It says so in his wallet. Can I help you, officer? From the holding cell where he stands at the steel bars, Willie can look directly across the muster room at a batch of wanted posters pinned sloppily to a bulletin board. And his, Willie Berg's, is among them. If he squints, he can read his alleged felonies, murder, burglary, interstate flight, and sees the two small mugshots, but not whatever is printed below. Does it say that he's armed and dangerous? Urge extreme caution? God, this is torture. Torture that one or another of Smallville's finest, thankfully there aren't many here right now, might happen to glance at that poster. And torture as well that his vital and criminal statistics are out of reading range. He always read about himself in the New York papers, which stoked both his vanity and his outrage. But he has to be careful no one catches him now, peering at those wanted posters. So it's a relief when the other WPA guys are all marched into the Smallville police station and locked up along with him. Hey, it's the rest of my kidnapping gang. Not funny, boring. It's almost five o'clock. Two federal agents in gray fedoras and dark suits bustle in, followed no more than ten minutes later by a large man in a white cowboy hat and wearing a western-style lawman star. Thanks for coming in, Sheriff Dutcher. We got us a doozy. The sheriff. And a couple of G-men. It's like two kinds of Saturday matinee movies colliding before Willie's eyes. Which is almost funny, except that the more police that fill up the place, the more anxious he becomes. You boys WPA? That what I heard? Yes, Yes, sir. Everyone is eager to display their common federal origins. Uh, don't worry, nobody thinks you've done anything. We're pretty sure who took the kid. Yeah? Who? But the G-Man doesn't reply. Instead, he locks his attention on Willie's face, staring so intently that Willie begins to fidget. Do I know you? I don't think so. New York? Jersey. Hoboken. You look familiar. Nah. Uh, Give it up, kid. It's all over. You got him, G-Man. This is machine gun boring. Public enemy number nine. (laughs) And now it's like all the atoms of Willie's body are fizzing off into space. It's like he's dissolving. (laughs) Uh, That must be it. Why'd they bring these guys in? Heck, if I know. We'll see if we can get rid of them. The Fed walks away and joins his colleague in conversation with the sheriff. The three of them stand only a few feet away from the wanted posters, but with their backs to them. Why'd you say that, Dylan? It was just a crack. Yeah, well, keep your stupid cracks to yourself. What do we know, Chief? Well, Sheriff, the kid's name is Donnie Poor. Bank president's son. Good kid. Bit of a scamp, though. We found the Cadillac limousine and the dead chauffeur miles apart, so we're pretty sure the driver wasn't involved. The boy's father, F.O. Poor, got two telephone calls from the kidnappers. The first call told him that his son was abducted. The other set the ransom at $25,000 in cash. Donnie. Think he's dead? Hope not. The station house is mobbed and noisy, and Clark, wearing his press badge, can't find the chief. But he does spot Willie Boring looking pale and wretched inside a holding cell with several other men. Get us out of here, Clark, can you? What are you doing in there? Your Keystone cops arrested everybody they didn't recognize, and now they forgot about us. Willie's eyes dart left and right, then focus on something. 
When Clark turns to see what, all he sees are a bunch of uniformed cops and two men in dark suits and blue ties and a cork bulletin board covered in wanted posters. I'll see what I can do. But Clark has no intention of doing anything. What can he do? And why should he even try to help that patronizing city slicker? With his notepad in his back pocket and a pencil in his left hand, he really ought to get a pen, but the cheapest you can buy costs a buck and they tend to leak. He wanders around. Excuse me? I wonder if you have a moment? Clark tries to catch the attention of cop after cop. Mr. Vice Mayor? Excuse me, Mr. Goff? <clears throat> then Clark tries to catch the attention of the young town attorney huddled in conversation with the poor family's gray-haired lawyer. But nobody will speak with him, on or off the record. He feels scorned and clumsy, and not sure what he's supposed to do. Yet again, Clark wishes he were smarter, lots smarter, that his polish was as marvelous as his body's capacity to perform. He's no dope, he knows that, but neither is he anything special in the brains department. He wishes he were smarter, had a better vocabulary, didn't mispronounce words and use bad grammar, and he wishes above all else that he knew how to be in the world, that it came as easily as running. It's seven o'clock. It's ten past. Half past. It's twenty of eight. It's five till. Clark? Sheriff Dutcher is standing next to him now, fixing coffee. How have you been, son? Fine, sir. Thank you. I I'm working for the newspaper now, part-time. That's why I'm here. Well, good for you. Good for you. So, is there anything you can tell me, Sheriff? Probably not. You understand. Yes, sir. But if I could, I might tell you there's a good chance we're looking for a 1931 or 32 DeSoto Woody with a busted headlamp. Clark is so astonished that Dutcher is talking to him that it takes the sheriff's prompting gesture, an index finger flicked toward his notebook, to realize that he should probably write it down. 32 or 33? 31 or 32. Right. DeSoto, Woody. Thank you, Sheriff. For what? Excuse me, Clark. At that moment, two federal men step out of the police chief's office. Dutcher watches one collect his hat and duck out by a side door, while the other, slight, pale, and fussy looking, struts this way across the station house. Agent Foley? Clark can tell that Foley would just as soon keep walking, but with the briefest tightening of his mouth, he comes over. Sheriff? Excuse me again, Clark. Dutcher moves away with Foley, and they both lower their voices. But to Clark, they might just as well be a pair of console radios with the volume knobs turned all the way to the right. We'll be taking the kid's father back to his office in a couple of minutes to wait for the call. Just let me know. I'll head on over there with you. That won't be necessary, Sheriff. Oh, no? And why is that, Agent Foley? Because it won't. Foley comes back to where Clark is still loitering, glances at him, glances away. It is six minutes past eight. Here's what happens before it is seven past. Foley, raising his eyes, looks straight ahead at a wanted poster pinned to the cork board. Clark now hears Foley's heart begin hammering like a drum. Clark looks up at the same poster. Murder, burglary, and interstate flight. Son of a bitch! I knew I'd seen that guy's face! What guy? That guy, look! Foley turns and points to Willie in the cell across the room, and then back to the cork board. At what? You blind? Foley taps the wanted poster with an index finger. What the hell? He freezes with his fingertip pressed to the mugshot of a Negro male with a shaved head and a thick mustache. Edward Thomas Burt, 45, 6 feet 2 inches, 230 to 250 pounds. Occupation truck driver, wanted for theft of government property. But I saw it. It was right there. Dutcher cranes an eyebrow. Foley randomly skips his glance from flyer to flyer. I saw it. It is now 7 minutes past 8. Without another word, Agent Foley walks away, past the muster desk, out through the front door. Dutcher shakes his head. After he is unable to suppress a grin, he winks at Clark and strolls off, a man with nothing at the moment he can think of to do. Willie is standing with his arms stretched up and his hands gripping the bars of his cell, face clammy white as new butter. Clark won't look at him. At eight minutes past eight, Clark opens his left fist and stuffs the crumpled wanted poster into his back pocket behind his reporter's notebook. So they let you go, did they? Finally. Where are your friends? Who? Those other men in the cell? Oh, they're just guys I work with. They took the car and went home. I thought I'd stick around. 
Might be some good picture taken later, if anything happens. Clark hasn't bothered looking up from his typewriter since Willie Boring walked into the newspaper office two minutes ago and found him at his desk. What are you doing here? Thought I might go buy a hamburger sandwich. Split it with you? No place you can buy a burger this time of night. Not in a dinky little hick town like this. What's the matter? You mad or something? We're putting out a special edition, so if you don't mind... Across the room, Newell Timmons has stopped reading proofs and is looking this way. Okay, I just thought... So long. Take care. Sayonara. Hey, what's with the cold shoulder? Clark reaches and picks up his notebook, holds it in front of his face, and scowls at his miserable scrawl. A dozen years of doing Palmer exercises, all of those margin-to-margin -margin loops, swirls, zigzags, and ellipses, and he still can't read his own stupid handwriting half an hour after he wrote it. Willie grabs the notebook from his hand and leans down close next to Clark's ear. What happened to that wanted poster? Clark snatches back his notebook, plunks it down beside him. What are you talking about? Police are searching for a 1931 or... 1932 Dodge, Woody, they believe. You wanted to get out of jail. You got out of jail. So now don't you think you should get out of town? You took it, didn't you? Took what? Hey, Clark. How's it coming over there, son? I'll need your copy in 20 minutes. You'll have it, Mr. Timmons. You'd better leave. How'd you take it down? I just did. Why? I don't know. I didn't do any of that stuff, Clark. So how come you're on a wanted poster? Clark, we have a paper to get out. I'm gonna have to ask your friend to leave. Clark's friend is leaving right now! Willie is speaking to Newell Timmons while looking at Clark. But now he looks past him at the copy paper rolled in the big Underwood typewriter, and his eyes widen. You sure it's a Dodge, Woody? Not a DeSoto? What? He grabs up his notepad, squints at his chicken scratch. By the way, he spelled Woody wrong. It is ten minutes later. So you're just going to walk in there and tell them where to find that car? Then what? Just wait for him to come back and tell you what happened? I expect I'll go with him. You expect that, do you? <laughs> Think they'll invite you to go along? Oh, oh, and here's a gun for you, Clark, just in case. They are sitting in the cab of Clark's truck, parked within sight of the police station. It's half past ten, street lamps are on, and a few people are still hanging around outside. I'm wasting time, Willie. There's a little boy has been kidnapped. I know that. Just thought you might want to be a real honest-to-God reporter, that's all. You're pain in the... ass. <sighs> Newsman worth his salt. He'd just phone in what he knows. Then make for damn sure he was at that filling station with a front-row seat when the cops come charging up. If you're not coming in with me, I'll see you later. Clark! You can't say how you found out! Don't worry about it. Clark! What? I may be a pain in the ass, but I never killed anybody. Clark zones in on Willie's unchanging heart rhythm, its steady beat, and discerns that it's true. Willie Boring, Berg, never killed anybody. And is that ever a big relief? Clark likes this smart aleck a lot, although why he does remains something of a mystery. He digs out the crumpled wanted poster from his back pocket and lobs it underhand through the truck window. I'd eat that if I were you. Crossing the street, Clark meets up with Merle, Jenny Laster's older brother, who's a cop, manning the front door. Hey, Merle, I need to see Chief Parker. It's important. Really, really important. Sorry, Clark, but the chief isn't here. He's still over at the Smallville Bank waiting on the telephone call from the kidnappers. Merle, listen up. Sorry, excuse me, Merle. But then Clark spots Sheriff Dutcher on the telephone. He races past the deputy and halfway across the station house. Dutcher's conversation abruptly ends when a spot along the telephone cord smokes suddenly and out pops a little flame. Clark hates doing that thing with his eyes. It just makes them feel so gummy. It is exactly 10 minutes before 11 when Sheriff Dutcher jumps into his county car. Clark, you go back and tell Deputy Laster what you told me about the filling station in Paris. Make sure he knows it's the one just over the Little Sin River Bridge and tell him I'm heading there and to send back up as soon as possible. But can't I come with you? Clark, do as I say, boy. Clark looks across the street and discovers that his father's truck and Willie Berg are gone too. A short barrel revolver is lying on the car seat next to Curly Ike, and he swears to God if he can't find a telephone booth in the next 10 minutes, the next five minutes, he is going to pick it up and shoot himself. Oh, I swear to God. Since 8.30, Curly Ike has been prowling the countryside and one dark hick town after another in the gang's big DeSoto. 
He expected to be gone no longer than an hour. He could trust Milton Claude to watch the kid for that long. Hoped he could, but here it is after 10. What kind of kidnapper can't find a public telephone? In the late afternoon, Curly Ike had driven from Paris to Oceana, 17 miles, and used the phone in a drugstore there to call Donnie Poor's father at the Smallville Bank. The call took scarcely half a minute. We have your son. We'll be in touch. Don't contact the police. Then he called F.H. Poor the second time from a phone booth just inside the main gates of a cement factory in Wisdom. Listen up. Your boy is fine, so far. You want him back, it'll cost you 25 grand in fives, tens, and twenties. Old bills, no cops, no feds, no funny business. We'll be in touch again tonight, nine sharp. Have the money ready and a car gassed up to go. You're driving, Dad, and no riders. That time, Curly Ike was on the wire for nearly a minute, longer than he'd liked. Kidnapping wasn't so bad, after all. He was beginning to see its beauty. Returning to the service station in Paris shortly after five with a few groceries, Curly Ike checked on the boy. Down in a mechanic's grease pit, he was still gagged and trussed up and struggling like some wild animal. Claude and Milt were antsy, edgy, eager to get this all over with, pocket their heavy sugar and move on. So was Curly Ike. Canada, he kept thinking, by Tuesday. They sat around eating cookies and candy and drinking soda pop till it was time for Curly Ike to go back out and make his third and last telephone call. That's when things got all balled up. He was almost to Oceana when he realized he'd forgotten to take along the sheet of paper with the drop-off instructions. And he'd spent half the day yesterday motoring around the county, meticulously jotting down left-hand turns and right-hand turns, making sure that country road numbers were correct, checking the odometer, citing landmarks, nine-tenths of a mile past the Fisk tire sign to come to the Green Bottle Tourist Court. And then what happens? He forgets the damn piece of paper. It was too late to turn around and go back, so Ike decided to dispense with a winding route he'd so cleverly mapped out for F.H. Poor and just tell the banker his final destination, Papa Lake Reservoir. On the phone, he'd just say, drive to the Papa Lake Reservoir and throw the bag over the fence at the gate nearest the pump house, then turn around and get back into your car and go home. Originally, the idea was to predetermine Poor's route so that Ike and Milton Claude could intercept him on the way thereby removing any possibility that cops or the feds might get to the reservoir first and set a trap. But what the hell? Life was full of risks, no matter what you did. Damn it! And if that wasn't bad enough, when I got to the Rexall drugstore in Oceana, it was closed for the night. He hadn't thought about that. He stood at the front door, shaking the knob, peering inside. Twenty paces to the payphone, but it might just as well be on the moon. It was full dark by then, and Curly Ike didn't see anyone on the street. The cafe directly opposite was also closed, so he balled a fist and gave a short chop to the glass. At first, Ike was stunned immobile. Who the hell has a burglar alarm in a pissant town like this? Ike's stomach was clenching and spasming by the time he took off in the DeSoto and headed for Wisdom, 10, 12 miles cross-country. By the time he arrived at the cement factory, it was five minutes past nine, and already the caper was off schedule. He had told Poor he would call at nine sharp. The cement factory was also closed, the fence gate wrapped with a chain secured by a padlock, but at least the telephone booth was outside. And if Curly Ike couldn't climb a ten-foot fence, him, a guy who'd ridden steers for fun and clambered up and down oil rigs, then he should just pack it in. But he failed to remember his bad arm, and by the time he was halfway to the top, he was gritting his teeth, wincing in agony. <clears throat> then came the watchdogs, running from around behind the factory, their legs kicking up puffs of the white cement powder that covered the ground. Hitting and bouncing off the chain link, they worked themselves into a murderous, frothing rage, and Ike hung on. But then one of the animals jumped high enough to snap at the toe of his shoe as it poked through one of the diamond links in the fence. Instinct hurled him away. <laughs> and he landed hard on his coccyx, scraping his palms raw. He thought about shooting the dogs, every single one of them, but finally just limped back to his car. All he needed was a stupid public phone, that's all. Why was this happening to him? Now he had given up and it was nearly 11 o'clock. He was driving back to consult with Milton Claude about their next step. Curly Ike slows down to cross the bridge over the Sint River, but even so, every thumped plank sends vibrations pulsing up through his feet, his legs, his groin. 
He is so preoccupied thinking his thoughts that he's rolling into the filling station, coasting to a stop, before he realizes that the rollaway door is missing from the service bay. No, not missing. Torn off and lying crumpled on the ground beyond the pump island. Holy! And there's a big gaping hole in the tiled wall between the service bay and the office. The office window is shattered, glass strewn everywhere. And a red-haired kid is pointing a box camera at Ike's car and... And... A craggy-faced man with a sheriff's star pinned to his jacket is cradling a limp and bloody-faced Donnie Poor in both of his arms. Ike shifts down, steps on the gas, and the Woody lurches forward. And from somewhere, left side, right side, above, a dark-haired slender boy thrusts himself in between the sheriff and the plunging DeSoto. And in the last moment before the car's teardrop-shaped front end crumples and Curly Ike catapults through the windshield, he sees, and it will be the last thing Curly Ike ever sees, the expression in the boy's wide-open blue eyes. It isn't as Ike would expect a look of terror. It's one of crushed and absolute hopelessness. The blackest of black despairs. Clark puts his fingertips to his temples, pressing hard. He has just left the Saturday kids matinee at the Jewel Theater and is standing in the lobby. His eyes seem to burn. The only thing Clark has thought of for the last seven days is the fixed stare in Donnie Poor's eyes. Following a funeral that Clark was still too heartsick and troubled to attend. Five days ago, for the first time in his life, he vomited. The fixed stare in Donnie Poor's dead eyes. How could that have happened? Three days ago, Clark discovered what a migraine feels like. The blood on his face and his crumpled in skull. How could somebody just pick up a wrench and do that? After zipping his jacket up, the weather broke on Monday and it's been cold ever since, he extracts his cloth cap from a vent pocket, unwads it, and puts it on. He's tugging the brim low on his forehead when Sheriff Dutcher comes out of the auditorium behind him. He steps up alongside of Clark and touches him gently, almost gravely, in the small of his back. Your dad told me where I might find you, but I wasn't expecting you to leave for three more hours. You were going to wait for me? Well, you paid your dime. I didn't think it'd be polite to interrupt your entertainment. Dutcher pushes open a door, then follows Clark out into the open air. And I was enjoying the Charles Lawton picture. I don't mean any disrespect, sir, but I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody. So your dad tells me. Tells me you've been in the bushes all week. And I can't say I blame you, but how about we go someplace and sit down? I'd rather not. Clark, I drove all the way here, and it's not official business. Clark, look at me, son. I got a bad headache. I should go. You know why I came here today. No, sir. I don't think I do. I came here to thank you for my life. I came here to thank you, son, from the very bottom of my heart. I didn't do anything. I think you did, and it was the bravest damn thing I ever saw. If he hadn't cut his wheel when he did... Clark. And thank God there was no gasoline in those pumps, that would have been... That would have been... Bad. Son, that car hit those pumps after it hit you. I don't care what you wrote in the paper, I was there. That guy turned his wheel. Now, why would he do that? M maybe he wasn't... <sighs> what? What and what? All bad? Maybe at the last second he had, I don't know, a, a change of heart. That car hit you. You're welcome. Excuse me? I didn't catch what I you- I said you're welcome. You said thank you, and I said you're welcome. Why don't you let me drive you home? That's okay. I've got my dad's truck. No, you don't. I was at your house, remember? And there was your truck sitting out front. Come on, I'll give you a lift. Dutcher's car, and it's the sheriff's own machine, not the county's, a 1932 cream and blue Pontiac 6 Coupe, is parked across the street from the Jewel. Just throw all that stuff anywhere, Clark. <sighs> Dutcher is pointing to folders and clip binders piled on the passenger's side of the front seat, but Clark just gathers it all up and holds it on his lap. <sighs> Leaving the center of town, they pass by the Herald Progress Building, which causes Clark to frown. So, why'd you quit? The farm keeps me busy enough. They don't speak again till they reach the farm. Dutcher turns the car onto the gravel driveway and stops it halfway between the county road and the Kent house. What did you hear from your friend, the photographer? Willie? Nothing. He took off with those guys he was traveling with. And he's not my friend. I just met him. We caught up with those WPA boys yesterday in the Osha Falls. And your pal wasn't with them. 
He went off to take some pictures in Aliceville Thursday afternoon, they told us, and never came back. Where do you think he went? I wouldn't know. Dutcher reaches over suddenly and tugs a sheet of paper from under one of the clip binders on Clark's lap. After unfolding it, he holds it up. It's another wanted poster bearing Willie Berg's name, photos, felonies, and a caution that he may be armed and should be considered dangerous. That federal man, Foley, sent me this on Wednesday. And you said this wasn't official business. It's not. I have to go. One last thing. I can't imagine how you'd ever need it. But if by some remote chance you ever do need my help with anything, at any time, you call me. You call me, you write me, you send me a smoke signal, and I'll drop what I'm doing. Promise. Yes, sir. Clark climbs out of the car. Then he bends from the waist, looking back in at Dutcher through the open door. Willie didn't kill anybody. Know that for a fact, do you? Yes, sir. I do. Good enough for me, but I'm just one cop. So if you do see your pal again, tell him to grow a mustache or something, would you? That red hair wouldn't fool a Boy Scout. Sheriff Dutcher picks the wanted poster off the seat and passes it to Clark. Souvenir? After watching the sheriff back out his Pontiac and drive away, Clark skims the wanted poster again, murder, burglary, interstate flight, before crumpling it into a chunky ball and lobbing it straight up into the air. He watches it, more like glares at it, till the paper disintegrates in flame. Same as always, Clark's eyes are left feeling syrupy, almost liquid, like the water glass that his mom would make in the summertime to preserve surplus eggs. But the sensation passes in less than a minute, and it's a small price to pay for such a... such a gift. At the thought, for the first time in a week, Clark feels the muscles flex up at both ends of his mouth. It's not much of a smile, but for now it will have to do. He needs to speak to his father. He needs to tell him goodbye. Ten minutes to ten. Jonathan Kent and Alger Lee had been playing a board game at the dining room table. Alger had just landed on the final green property and was counting out the fake money to pay the banker. Alger started to rise from his chair, but Mr. Kent shook his head. Clark? Somebody's at the kitchen door. Although Clark had finally dragged himself out of bed around half past five that afternoon and come downstairs to sit with his father and Alger while they ate supper, he'd gone directly back up to his room once the dishes were done and put away. Clark? You want to go see who's there? While sympathetic, Mr. Kent felt he shouldn't indulge his son's melancholy. Martha, you could bet, would never have allowed him to lay in bed all day staring at the ceiling. Clark! Why don't you let me go see who it is? Keep your seat, Al. Clark! The back door! The first few times Mr. Kent called Alger Al, the boy had looked startled. Nobody had ever called him that. But by now he'd gotten used to it, almost, and come to like it. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Al. Alger carefully positioned two wooden houses on North Carolina Avenue, two more on Pacific. Your row. Uh, excuse me, Al. Clark! Clark shuffled into the dining room. His shirt tail dangled. His hair stuck out in 50 places. He looked sulky and irritated. Somebody's here. Would you mind seeing who? Clark nodded, went to answer, pulled open the door, and discovered Willie Berg. Can I come in? Clark opened the door wider, indicating the kitchen with a toss of his head. He wasn't glad to see Willie, but he wasn't not glad either. Willie had a green duffel that he dragged in behind him. Like Clark, he hadn't shaved in days. The beard coming in was black, and it made his hair look redder. Almost comic. How'd you get here? Hitched? Walked? You know? Willie sat down at the table. What happened to those guys you were with? I don't know. I left. Why? Felt like it. You want something to eat? No, that's okay. <clears throat> Willie noticed them first. Mr. Kent and Alger Lee standing in the doorway. Alger tapping his lips with a light blue property deed. Dad, uh, Alger, this is Willie. The photographer? Good to meet you. Likewise. Sorry to drop by so late, but I just, you know, hit town. <laughs> did uh, Clark offer you something to eat? Uh, yes, he did, sir. He, he surely did. But I'm not hungry. Thank you. Alger leaned toward Mr. Kent, using the property deed to cover his mouth. Mr. Kent, uh, uh, how about some coffee? Sounds good, but uh, a place to sleep sounds even better, if I can impose on you. 
Well, uh, we're a little short of beds in the house. Al here is using the guest room, uh, but if you don't mind sleeping on the couch... I was kind of hoping I could sleep in the barn, so I could say I'd done it. Did it. <sighs> and that's completely up to you, but it's a cool night. I'll be fine. I got a blanket. In fact, he had two, each one stolen from a boarding house. Then, uh, Clark will get you set up. <clears throat> I appreciate this, Mr. Ken. Clark struck a match and lit the kerosene lantern hanging on a nail just inside the barn's great door, then carried it down the feed passage and up the ladder to the hayloft, which sloped hard toward the back wall. Willie clambered up behind him. He flung down his duffel. As Clark was firing a cigarette, Willie dug through his duffel bag. He drew out a small, flat bottle of bootleg whiskey with a hand-lettered pasted-on label that read, August 2nd, 1928. He offered the bottle to Clark. No, thanks. <sighs> Why are you on a wanted poster? Oh. Willie twisted the cap back on the bottle and told the story. Not the whole story, but nearly. He neglected to mention that he'd used burglar's tools to get into the pawn shop. In this version, the front door was unlocked and he had merely walked in. Could you be mistaken about the alderman? Maybe it just looked like him. Why would you ask me that? It's just hard for me to believe that a man like that could be a gangster. What planet are you from, Clark? Politicians are always crooks. It's their job. That's just city talk. You need an education, my friend. A degree in what's what. Is that right? You're so smart. What are you doing with your picture on a wanted poster and that stupid red dye in your hair? I was framed. You and the Count of Monte Cristo. I need to show you something. What? But as soon as Willie had scrambled his hands through his bag and brought out a large mustard yellow envelope, Clark knew exactly what he was going to be shown. He'd probably known it from the moment he opened the door and found Willie on his back porch. Photographs. One second Willie was holding the prints in his hand, the next they were gone and Clark had them. Going rapidly through all of them, a series of nine prints, Clark would glance at one, slide it to the bottom, glance at the next, slide it to the bottom, the next, the next, the next. When he came to the last one, though, he let them all drop from his hands. A few scattered free on the plank floor, the rest overlapped near his feet. You're kind of... you're pretty grainy, but still you can see... Clark, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I haven't showed anybody else. Why not? I didn't think... it didn't seem... I wish I knew. Stooping, Clark picked up one of the prints. The image was grainy, as Willie had said, and poorly lit, but not so poorly that you couldn't see it was an image of Clark hoisting above his head a service bay door, the rollaway kind. Hey, I, I still got the negative. Clark looked at another print on the floor, the one that showed him twisting an iron jack around both wrists of a man lying face down on the ground. A pencil notation on the back read, CK and Claude Draper. Willie stooped and picked up one of the prints. He held it in front of Clark's face. <laughs> Those damn bricks almost hit me when you came busting through that wall. Willie dropped the print and snatched up another. In pencil on the back it read, CK and Milton George. When you hung that moron on the tree, did you fly up there or, or jump? I'm not sure. You're not sure? Jumped, I think, but maybe not. I haven't had much practice. Then we should do something about that. We should? What do old Claude and Milt have to say about everything? Nothing. At all? They still don't know what hit them. No kidding. But you worked them over pretty good. They deserved it. Clark was staring down at a print that had slid to the front edge of the hayloft. Willie walked over there and looked to see which one it was. Oh, the kid was how old? Nine. Clark kept staring until a pinprick-sized hole, faintly smoking and brown-edged, appeared in the photographic paper. Yellow points of flame struggled up, followed by a heavier scribble of smoke. The hole widened out, chewing at the picture, until there was nothing left of the photograph but wafers of delicate ash. Clark's eyeballs felt gummy. Then they didn't. Why don't you come with me? Why don't you? Clark had thought Willie was going to ask, how did you do that? Come on, Clark. Haven't you ever thought about hitting the road, seeing what's going on? You made me tired, you know that? What else are friends for? <laughs> At least think about it, would you? We could have some fun and you could, you know, practice. Good night, Willie. Night, pal. Here he comes, Mr. Kent. Alger and Mr. Kent were in the kitchen, Alger standing at the back door with his arms wrapped around himself, Mr. Kent seated at the table cleaning his eyeglasses. They'd put away the board game half an hour ago, neither of them much interested in playing after Willie's arrival. 
Why don't you go on up to bed? You want to talk to him alone? Well, something like that. Okay, then I'll be saying goodnight to you. Good night, Al. Sleep well. Well? He's leaving tomorrow, Pa. And? Nothing. He's just leaving tomorrow. After his son went to bed, Mr. Kent remained in the kitchen, eventually getting up and opening the cutlery drawer, gently touching some of the forks and spoons with the coarse pads of his fingertips. He opened the stove door and took out the saucepan and the iron skillet, looking at those and then putting them back, opening the cupboard door and reaching down for a particular coffee cup with a chipped handle and turning it. He blew out the dust, replaced it on its shelf, then picked up from the windowsill a five-and-dime store ceramic shepherdess and lamb. Something's happened, Martha. Something's different. Something's changing. Something's changed. Opening the sink tap, he rinsed grit and house dust from Martha's little figurine and dried it with a flour sack he'd been using as a dishcloth. At last, he trudged upstairs and got ready for bed, the worst part of his day. He read a few pages in Spoon River Anthology. The last poem he read, and he didn't actually finish it, before he closed the valve on his Aladdin lamp, was the one titled Ernest Hyde, the one that begins, My mind was a mirror. It saw what it saw. It knew what it knew. That all happened last night. Today, 20 past 1 in the afternoon, the hayloft. Neither Willie Berg nor Alger Lee meant to go flapping their jaws about Clark, about what he could do, what he might be. It just happened. They're both feeling vaguely guilty about it, too. But still, it's been an interesting conversation. I suppose you know what he is. A freak of nature, my friend. Merely a freak of nature. Oh, yeah, that explains everything. You're full of hops, you know it. Didn't you ever read the Bible? Never heard about Goliath? What about Samson? You ever hear Paul Bunyan? Paul Bunyan's not in the Bible. I know that. I was just giving you some examples. Every so often, like maybe every hundred years or every million people, there's somebody that's born a freak of nature. You can't explain it, but that's all there is to it. Paul Bunyan was a giant. Clark is three inches shorter than I am. Doesn't matter. Excuse me. Willie shakes out one of his blankets, picks off some clinging bits of straw with his hand, then folds it quickly and squats down to stuff it into his duffel bag. I never heard about bullets bouncing off Samson's head. Alger taps his index fingertip against his forehead, then flings it off, way off, to pantomime a ricochet. Seen it myself. In your hat. I seen it. You ever see him fly? Fly? <laughs> no. He can't do that. Yeah? What do you mean? Yeah? Nothing. <laughs> Willie jams in his blankets and cinches the duffel. Then he takes a tab of paper, it's been folded again and again till it's the size of a matchbox, and hands it to Alger. Don't forget to give this to him. I won't forget. But why do you gotta leave before he comes home? I think you should wait. The thing is, so does Willie. So then, why is he rushing to leave? He wishes he knew. Baloney. He knows. All it would take would be a few more hours with this Boy Scout, this Cub Scout, and he could have himself a new best friend. His first best friend. Not that Willie wants one, necessarily. Acquaintances have always been more than enough. Friends, he feels pretty certain, are nothing but a nuisance. But this kid, this freak of nature, this Clark, well, he could be Willie's get-out-of-jail-free card. It was the scheme he was hatching all week long. The hope he's been flush with and the reason he walked to the highway in Aliceville, stuck out his thumb, and hitched an erratic series of short rides back here to Smallville. But overnight, he changed his mind. It sounds stupid, it seems gloppy, but he really likes the kid. Well, let me get out of here if I'm going. When Alger pushes open the great door, Clark has to jump back from the apron onto the service court so it doesn't strike him in the chest. In his left hand, he is holding a Gladstone bag that his mother used as a young woman moving to Kansas from the Dakota Territory with her widowed father. If you're ready, let's go. Open-mouthed, Alger watches them walk off together. Then he half turns back toward the house, and there's Mr. Kent at the kitchen door. They look at each other with frail smiles. Alger's frail and baffled. Mr. Kent's frail and full of sorrow. Al, join me for some lunch? With a nod, Alger starts back across the yard. He's almost at the porch when he remembers Willie's letter. He stops, pulls it from his dungarees, unfolds it, and reads. Dear Clark, 
I burned those other prints this morning, along with the negatives. If you don't believe me, see for yourself. I burned them in the barrel over by that, I don't know what you call it, where you keep the chickens. You're an amazing guy. Be careful, or people will eat you for breakfast, if you know what I mean. Good luck. I'm glad I met you. He signed it Willie Boring, but then struck that out and wrote, Willie Berg. Today is the 20th of October, 1935. From Smallville, Clark and Willie tramp cross-country till they reach a railroad division point where freight stop to change engines and crews. There they jump into the first open and empty boxcar they find and catch out before long on a hotshot that takes them upstate, then across the Missouri River Bridge into the Argentine Yards. Between them, they have $75, but they want to be frugal. Even so, the two nights they stay over in Kansas City, jazz, barbecue, the stockyards, the war memorial, they splurge and stay at the YMCA. On the morning following the second night, Clark wakes to find his wallet stolen. Suddenly, their joint resources are less than 30 bucks. In the afternoon, they catch out on a freight headed west, sitting in the side door Pullman watching the scenery till the cinders and the steam blowback get to them both, yes both, and they claim a corner of the boxcar. There are eight or nine other riders, a motley collection of old bindle stiffs. Clark is certain he made a mistake leaving home. What did he think he was doing? Going off in search of his fortune? His fate? What? We're just going, Clark. It's an adventure. You're not a farmer. How would you know? During the Footloose first days and weeks, it is a great adventure. But there are moments of anxiety, too. Even terror. In a town called Safford, they hook up with a singing cowboy named Plato Beatty and travel with him farther into East Texas. The reason he's called Plato, he tells his writers, is because he has a plate in his head. A piece of metal the size of a cake plate, holding things together. He fought in the Argonne Forest, which is how he got his skull blown off. But despite his injury, Plato seems a happy enough soul. From time to time, he lets Clark or Willie drive his old dusty Nash while he strums his guitar and sings. Clark likes the sad prairie songs, the hobo songs, the songs about wayfaring strangers and poor boys a long way from home. But Willie thinks he'll go nuts if he has to listen to much more of that hillbilly guff. They begin to walk for a while after they part from Plato Beatty. Soon they see off to their left, a ball of oily black smoke penetrated by a column of flame foam high into the air. And Clark, who has been scuffling along next to Willie, suddenly isn't there. In the days that follow, he obviously enjoys, even relishes thinking about what he did at that oil field, put on a burst of speed to roll a boomer who'd caught fire, and then grabbed up a well cap, tossed it over the wellhead, and sprawled across it till the flames all quit. Apropos of nothing, Clark starts dropping reminders into his conversation with Willie. How much do you figure that cap weighed? More than a ton? It's hard for me to gauge things like that. Or... Guess I'm fireproof, huh? My hair, too. Or... We should have stuck around. Might have got some kind of reward. Clark is definitely different, and Willie isn't sure that he likes the change. Dear Father, as bad luck would have it, we found ourselves yesterday in a miserable place called Panterville, where a murder trial was about to start. A colored man was supposed to have killed a white man, his boss, over the boss's wife, or something like that, I'm not sure. I've seen race troubles since I've been gone, and back in Smallville too. Remember what they did to Bill Hammer's face that time? But it is most awful in Texas. Colored people keep their eyes down here, and a great number of them stutter. Anyhow, when we showed up in Panterville, a Negro was going on trial, and it seemed like the whole town was gathered outside the district courthouse trying to get in. There were five Texas Rangers on the front steps. One of them was a captain, and he had a shotgun. The others had sidearms. We heard the captain say that he and his men were there at the order of the governor, and their instructions were to see that the trial took place in a legal manner. So everybody should go home. But nobody would. They just pushed closer. I wanted to get moving, but Willie wanted to stay so he could take pictures. Which he did till some big farmer threatened to break his head. Then a shotgun went off twice inside the courthouse. And a minute later, they carried out two men whose chests were bloody from pellet wounds. The crowd turned rowdy, and people started to throw rocks. And then a fat old preacher threw an open can of gasoline through a broken window, and suddenly the whole building was on fire. Everybody got out of there except the prisoner. 
for safekeeping, he'd been locked inside the district attorney's vault. And now because of the fire, nobody could get to it. I ran inside and kept blowing hard to keep the flames away. I wasn't afraid of being burned. I just didn't want my clothes all ruined. But they got ruined anyway by sparkles. I'm ashamed that I worried about such a thing at a time like that, but I did. I had heard someone say the vault was on the third floor. It was, and I found it, and I pulled off the door. But the prisoner was dead. I don't know if the smoke got to him or what, but he was dead. His skin was red hot in my arms. I carried him down the stairs and back outside. Then a couple hundred people rushed at me and grabbed the poor colored man from my arms. They just snatched him away. You should have seen their faces. No, I wouldn't have wanted you to. They were like a pack of dogs. They were like that, exactly. And they tied that dead man, whose name I never got, by a rope to the bumper of a car and dragged him around the public square. Then they cut him off the bumper and pulled him to a tree and hanged him. They tortured and hanged a dead man, Dad. It was the worst thing I have ever seen. And do you remember how when I was a boy, and whenever I stared at something too long, it would start to smolder and even catch fire? Remember when I set those magazines of moms on fire? I did that again yesterday, but on purpose. Every single automobile and truck that I could find, I looked at real hard till the gas tank blew up. Those people in Panerville, they all just ran like hell is what they did. Excuse my language. But they ran like hell in all directions. Willie must have seen something in my face because he dragged me away from there and back to the freight yards. And it was a good thing he did too, because otherwise I would have burned down that whole town, Dad. I wanted to. I'm not sorry I did what I did, no matter how much money those cars and trucks cost. I was glad, and I still am, as I write this letter to you. I guess I have a temper and should be a monk or a hermit. I have a bad temper, Dad. I do. And that could be a real disaster someday. People could hate me. They probably will. And if they can find nails that won't break, they might just crucify me. Your loving son, Clark. P.S. We have both had enough of this being on the bum and have decided to go to California to live and work. I will write again just as soon as we are settled. P.P.S. It was wrong, wasn't it? Please, don't be too disappointed in me. Despite Lex Luthor's savvy and sensitive draft report on the Harlem race riot, and despite his many contributions to both the unification of the transit system and the perpetration of a new city charter, despite the federal loans and work projects Lex facilitated due to his agile handling of Harold Ickes, the notoriously ill-tempered Secretary of the Interior, and despite the fact that Lex's universal popularity has bolstered Fiorello LaGuardia's own flagging public approval, despite all of that, by the summer of 1937, the portly mayor of New York City has cooled significantly toward the affable young alderman. He has snubbed Lex at City Hall, at Yankee Stadium, and the Polo Grounds, seen to it that Lex was not included in group pictures of dignitaries taken during groundbreaking ceremonies for the World's Fair, the opening of the Lincoln Tunnel, and the dedication of the Triborough Bridge. He has left him out of strategy meetings, dropped him from steering committees, arranged for him to be seated with cranks and boorish old coots at political banquets, and no longer invites him to late-night games of Russian Bank at his family's apartment in East Harlem. Does the mayor feel that Lex Luthor is becoming too popular? Or does he suspect that the alderman observed on two occasions having drinks with Jeremiah Titus Mahoney, the Democratic candidate in the upcoming mayoral election, is hedging his bets, plotting disloyalty, possibly treachery? Meanwhile, the handful of people in New York with some, but not full, not even close to full, knowledge of Lex Luthor's illegitimate enterprises are wondering if the mayor, self-styled racket buster and smasher of slot machines, has tumbled somehow onto the humming alderman's secret career. LaGuardia is no dope. He's a pain in the tuchus, but no dope. Lex, however, has no need to speculate. He knows exactly what's going on. Certainly. Lex switches off his shortwave radio. One of Lex's minor, but still lucrative, innovations in crime has been the establishment of a metropolitan wiretapping service, available to anyone willing and able to pay the price, and he has just received his weekly update from a supervisor at the bootleg telephone exchange in Woodside, Queens. Along with a declaration of receipts, the woman, Operative X-12, reported that yesterday afternoon at 3.11 p.m., Mayor LaGuardia was heard telling Robert Moses over the telephone that Lex would no longer be consulted regarding building contracts for the upcoming World's Fair. Lex presses a button, sending the receiving and transmitting station revolving back to its concealed niche behind the living room wall. LaGuardia is a prude. That's his problem, Caesar. 
He thinks I'm ostentatious for living in a place like this, and him still knocking around in that crummy little flat on the Upper East Side. He's so morally superior, I'd like to strangle him. Caesar Caluso merely shrugs one shoulder. And it's driving him crazy that I am a trendsetter. Have you noticed how many men are wearing tuxedos in the daytime ever since I started to do it? Have you? No, I have not. Well, just look around, and you'll see. As Lex paces and Caluso reclines on a claret-colored sofa in the library of Lex's new apartment in the Waldorf Towers, one of the phlegmatic Italian's latest robots, the prototype LR1, handily mixes a pitcher of martinis. 38 inches tall, aluminum, and with ball bearings in lieu of feet, it scoops pimentoed olives from a bottle with a long-handled spoon and deposits one into each of two martini glasses. Amazing! I've seen grown men with less dexterity. Yes, and he can pick up a dime as well. That's wonderful. But can he pick up a showgirl? <laughs> the Italian doesn't even smile. He is a slightly built, round-headed man in his early 30s with thinning black hair and the effete kind of mustache continental royalty effect, the sort that reminds Lex Luthor of two sardines on a collision course. As always, Caesar is dressed in a tatty black suit, a white shirt, and a black string tie. The shirt buttons are yellow and brittle, and the frayed cuffs spill from his coat sleeves, ending just shy of his big knuckles. The robot delivers to Lex a martini in a frosted glass. Thank you. Can you hear me? It is a machine, Mr. Luthor. It does not need your gratitude, nor can it respond to politeness. It cannot decode the sounds you make. <laughs> the sounds I make. Delicious. I took the recipe from a bartender's guide I found in your kitchen. How resourceful of you. <sighs> Fatty LaGuardia wants me to throw a public tantrum, but it's not going to happen. Caluso moves one shoulder again. I know when to turn the other cheek, and when to strike. The robot glides over to the side of the chromium bar cabinet and turns itself off. But he'll get his. Eventually. I'll see to it. Why do you keep talking to me about the mayor? Do I care? I don't. I am an engineer. You're my engineer, Signor Caluso. Lex glares, but can't bring himself to grow angry at the little genius. My engineer. My robot. My grand and perfect plan. The scruffy little man was a fascination from the moment Lex first noticed him seated in a tiered lecture room at New York University a year ago this coming November. Lex supposed it was because the little man was dressed like a ragamuffin, smelled of garlic, and seemed far more the knife-sharpening, organ-grinding, cart-pushing kind of Italian than he did the Enrico Fermi, Franco Rossetti sort. Lex was sitting two rows above, and once his attention began to drift, as it always did during these sorts of things, he found himself staring down at Caesar with gathering absorption. He was astounded by the way Caesar's right hand never stopped moving as he jotted down every droning word the panelists uttered in an elegant stenography. But that wasn't what caused Lex's real fascination. That came about when he realized that while Caesar Caluso was taking notes with his right hand, he was simultaneously sketching and labeling diagrams in a separate notebook with his left. Robots. Caesar Caluso was filling page after page of a red-covered notebook with sketches, diagrams, even preliminary blueprints for the kind of square-headed, block-bodied, tubular-legged robots that proliferated on the covers of science fiction magazines and clanked across the floors of subterranean laboratories in Saturday morning chapter plays. Lex decided then and there to learn more about this strange-looking little Italian. And so he charged Polly and Stick with finding out whatever they could. The first thing they discovered was that Caesar Caluso was neither a public official nor a city engineer, but instead was the most active, albeit unregistered, university student in the five boroughs of New York City. In any week from early in the morning till late in the evening, he sat in on classes. Undergraduate, graduate, doctorate, postdoctorate, and always classes in the pure or applied sciences. At NYU, as well as Hunter, Fordham, Columbia, Brooklyn College, City College, Queens College, even the College of Physicians and Surgeons, taking copious notes with his right hand while sketching, revising, finessing, and providing schematics for a veritable fleet of man-shaped robots with his left. This guy's a real cold shutter, boss. Why are you so interested in him? Mind your own business, Polly. You want we should kill him? Kill him? Of course not! I love this guy! Lex didn't really, but he was mesmerized by him.
and tantalized by certain possibilities that were becoming ever clearer in his mind. Same as Lex, Caesar Calusa was self-invented. He just hadn't pulled it off with anything near to Lex's high degree of polish. Born in Florence, he'd tell people, family impoverished by the Great War, he'd say, attended the Free University of Rome, he'd boast, where he received his first degrees in theoretical physics, civil engineering, radiochemistry. Immigrated to the United States in 28, he'd say, and took several more advanced degrees. Caesar Caluso's biography was a complete fabrication. It had taken Lex scarcely a week to dope out the real stuff. He was born in Florence, all right, Florence, Pennsylvania. And yes, his parents were both Italians, a bricklayer and a seamstress. But the family name wasn't Caluso, it was Delapa. Caesar's birth name was Jacopo. He'd been in jail twice, each time for petty theft. And it was during his time in jail, apparently, while hiding from bullies in a surprisingly well-stocked library, that he first developed an interest in physics and chemistry, radio technology, and engineering in practically all of its branches. And where had his interest in robots come from? From Metropolis, of course. The German picture by Fritz Lang. Caesar Caluso had fallen in love with the movie's female robot, the one who led the revolt of the masses. Less than two weeks after the conference at NYU, they met on a rainy weekday afternoon. Lex deliberately arrived early and sat at the bar with his briefcase on the floor, leaning against his right leg. As he waited for Caluso to appear, he sipped a whiskey and watched in the back bar mirror as that fat English movie director entertained a table full of reporters. He was waving an ice cream cone, his wife and small daughter sitting there with him at the table, with tight smiles on their faces. American ice cream is far superior to anything we have at home in Great Britain. I would not trade it for a steak and kidney pie or a broiled silversmith with carrots and dumplings or even Kentish chicken pudding. <laughs> <laughs> the director was doing publicity for his new picture. The review that Lex had read in the Times made it sound good, but he just hadn't gotten around to seeing it. He hadn't gotten around to a lot of things. All he seemed to have time for lately was city and criminal business, and at night he was too exhausted to do anything but go to bed and lie awake for hours, wondering why he had chosen to do what he'd done with his life. Why did he still work harder than anyone else in city government, the mayor included? Why take such pains with his wardrobe, with his persona? Why keep gobbling up, consolidating, reinvigorating the traditional New York rackets? Why keep launching new ones? Just because he could? It was an awful lot of work, and he no longer needed the money. Perhaps he did, though. Perhaps he needed far more of it than he already had. Not for any personal use, he had no real love of luxury, but to underwrite something vast and historical, something complicated and irrevocable, some grand scheme. The undertaking of, the commitment to. But a grand scheme to achieve what? There was the rub. Lex had no real idea what his goal should be. He was no longer interested in becoming mayor or governor, or the greatest racketeer since Vanderbilt and Rockefeller. The early appeal was gone, had vanished. Nothing seemed compelling enough. Was he having a moral crisis, or just fed up to the gills? But his long night of the soul ended the morning he first laid eyes upon Caesar Caluso. And now here came the little scruffy Italian, seemingly unimpressed by the Waldorf bar and the tuxedoed alderman who stood up immediately to shake his hand. Senor Caluso, Alderman Lex Luthor. Please call me Lex. What can I get you to drink? Nothing. Well, perhaps a glass of seltzer. You mentioned on the telephone about making my dreams come true. I'm curious, sir, how you might presume that I even have dreams, or what they might entail. He really talked like that. Smiling, Lex reached down and picked up his briefcase. It weighed 10 pounds and was filled with file folders and accordion folders stuffed with city ordinances and resolutions, revised budgetary figures, and correspondence that dealt with current labor negotiations, employee certifications, and audits. Lex undid the clasp, flicked through the standing folders, then slid one out. Caluso's eyes widened when he realized it contained photostatic copies of roughly 100 of his robot schematics. I don't understand. No, I expect you don't. Lex removed another file from his briefcase and passed that one to Caluso as well. Then he took a sip from his drink. Beside him, Caluso was staring with horror at the first of a dozen photographs inside the folder. Without looking at any of the others, he snapped the folder closed. Just so you won't be kept in suspense, I'm very open-minded. Personally, I don't care what a man does on his own time. 
what two men do. Of course, most people in the world are not quite so open-minded. Policemen, judges, for example, and prison guards. You are blackmailing me? Mm, engaging your services. To do what? Build me a few robots. Isn't that what you've always dreamed of doing? I wouldn't object to another one of those martinis. Caesar Caluso glumly snatches up the remote control device. It resembles a model train transformer and presses a few buttons. At the same moment, Lex Luthor's general factotum appears in the library. Mrs. O'Shea, a 50-ish Irish woman with a bubble of snowy white hair. She conveys a white telephone whose dial and disconnect buttons are made of 24 karat gold. Its cord snakes across the parquet floor, through the open doorway, and out into the hall. Mr. Luther, it's that Polish woman again. After putting the phone down on the table, she makes a tiny sneer at the LR1, whose right arm lifts to hover over the martini pitcher. Mrs. O'Shea leaves the room. Luther. Mm-hmm. Yes. Hmm? Seal? Ca calm down. Calm down. It, please, Seal. I want you to calm down. That's better. All right? Now, I, I'll see what I can do. I'll try to stop by. I'll, I'll try. He ends the connection by pressing and holding down one of the buttons. I'll need my car, Henry. Ten minutes. Yes, sir. After he's pronged the receiver, Lex rubs a hand across his chin, his features composed into an unlikely expression equal parts disgust and empathy. When he strides toward the door, the LR1, carrying a fresh martini, pivots and follows. Seeing it, Lex stops. So does the robot. Lex pinches the glass by its stem, raises, and drains it. I'll be gone for a couple of hours, Caesar. Then Lex sets his glass down on the flat surface of the robot's head and walks out. Seal Stokowski thinks Lex Luthor is the greatest, kindest, smartest man on planet Earth. And if you are prepared to argue that with her, she is prepared to slug with you toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Ever since Herman went to the doctor in April complaining about shortness of breath and was diagnosed with terminal cancer, the alderman has taken care of all of the medical bills, the drugstore prescriptions, even the sick room rental equipment. And he never fails to visit Stick every other day, usually in the late afternoon. He'll sit bedside and talk to Stick for a few minutes, then read to him for an hour. He's a prince, that Mr. Luther. In Seal and Herman's time of crisis, Lex Luther, God bless him, has even found a way for Seal to make an income of her own. He's put her in charge of the mail order catalogs. There have been two so far, the original Smoke and Dynamite catalog and the Smoke and Dynamite Summer Supplement. A third, the Smoke and Dynamite Fall Arsenal of Values, is ready to be printed, and a fourth, the last, a clearance catalog, is in the works. Because Seal does all of the production work, layouts, photostats, paste-ups, then oversees the print runs at a clandestine typography shop in Hoboken, Lex now puts another $60 into Stick's pay envelope each Friday. She wishes he would give her the money she's earned in a separate envelope, one with her own name on it, but wouldn't dream of suggesting it. When Mr. Luther arrives at half past seven this evening... Mr. Luther, thank you for coming so quickly. Seal takes both of his hands in hers and draws him inside. The Stokowskis rent a two-bedroom apartment on the ground floor of a brownstone in Turtle Bay. The room's dark and sparsely inexpensively furnished. Hung on the walls are framed pictures of scenic wonders, the Matterhorn, Arizona Canyons, natural bridges. The only extravagances are a Stromberg Carlson radio phonograph in the living room and an African parrot named Zulu that Seal keeps in a rattan cage out in the kitchen. I shouldn't have called Mr. Luther. I hope you'll forgive me, but he seems so listless today, and I guess I just... Uh... It's fine, Seal. I'm glad you called. Is he awake? Last I checked. Lex nods, but makes no movement toward the bedroom. I was wondering about those proofs. Oh, they're all corrected. You can look at them before you leave if you want. Why don't I do that? Seal walks a step behind him, as far as the bedroom. He goes in and leaves the door open. She remains outside. Lex starts to sit down in a chair, but changes his mind. He gives Seal a sympathetic smile and shuts the door. In Stick's room, Lex always feels conflicted and uncomfortable. He is sorry that Stick is dying, he truly is. The man was a most efficient trigger man, but wishes he'd just go ahead and do it. Croak already. Let's get this show on the road. <coughs> Raised against three pillows in a hospital bed that rents for a dollar a day, Stick is pressing an oxygen mask to his face. It makes him look like a fatally ill bomber pilot. 
On the nightstand, along with the medicine bottles, spoons, and crumpled tissues, are a thick wooden crucifix, two stubby white unlit candles, and a pygmy-sized bottle of chrism. Hmm. Priest been to see you? Stick nods yes while letting his hand drop away from the mask. The mask plops onto his stomach. He looks so tired and wasted that Lex feels drained of vitality himself, just being near him. <coughs> Had extreme unction and everything. <coughs> Excellent, Stick. Just terrific. Come up with any new ideas lately? <coughs> Wish I had, sir. <coughs> but I think the medicine must be interfering with the old imagination. <coughs> well, don't worry about it. Stick is pretty far gone in the head. It's the morphine. But long before he started dosing with that stuff, Stick passed his days in bed dreaming up new criminal opportunities for Lex to pursue. Restaurants, bakeries, trucking companies, and suggesting fresh variations on the old standbys of policy, extortion, and loan sharking. Most of his ideas were pure cockamamie. One of them, however, was a real beaut. Flipping idly through a pile of Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward catalogs one day, it dawned on him that mail order might be the perfect way to move a warehouse inventory of small ordnance. Hand grenades, rifle grenades, smoke bombs, gas bombs, time bombs, dumb bombs, and novelty bomblets disguised as pencils, spaldines, and lumps of coal that Lex had acquired along with a score of bordellos in the aftermath of Lucky Luciano's imprisonment and Meyer Lansky's relocation to Southern California. The problem was that Lex had no idea how to unload the stuff. So for several months, he'd done nothing. The Italian government offered to buy whatever Lex could sell them, but they proposed delivery to a submarine off the southern coast of New Jersey, and Lex balked at that. When Stick mentioned his idea, beautifully printed, carefully distributed catalogs with a dozen postal blinds and automatic forwarding addresses to handle the direct mail business, Lex got it immediately. It was simple, and it was beautiful, and it would work. He would just set up a system where a dummy telephone number would switch incoming calls to an untraceable other number. It was also Stick who suggested that there might be another market for these kinds of products scattered among ordinary citizens. And he proposed distributing the catalogs at gun shows and rodeos and stock car races, at smokers and bachelor parties, bowling alleys and cabana clubs. While Lex was fully prepared to recruit one of the chief copywriters at the largest advertising agency in New York, incriminating photographs once again would be involved, Stick proposed letting Seal, who had done some editorial work as a young woman for a boosterism magazine in Putnam County, write all of the copy, as well as lay everything out. The first catalogs were mailed at the end of May. Orders poured in almost immediately. Lex considered his catalog business nothing short of an imaginative breakthrough in the annals of crime. Shall we continue with our story? <clears throat> Lex takes a seat, picking up the copy of Northwest Passage from Stick's bedside table. He opens it to the bookmark and glances at the page number, 159. Then he flips to the last page, 709. We'll never make it to the end, Sticky. <laughs> <coughs> Stick fumbles with both hands, searching after the oxygen mask. When he finds it, he holds it over his nose and mouth. Lex turns and examines the green oxygen cylinder. Stick removes the mask from his face. <laughs> yeah, I'd like it if you just read a little, sir. <sighs> Chapter 27. Rogers, it seemed to me, could go beyond the limits of human endurance. <laughs> Boss, you can't imagine what it's like. Oh, it's awful. Knowing that you're a dead man? Lex shuts the book around his index finger. <sighs> I'm worried all the time. Seal's going to be okay. Don't worry about Seal. I'll see to it that she's well taken care of. Lex has a cat house in mind, a little place over in Chelsea, one of those that formerly belonged to Lucky Luciano. Like the whole string of them, it could use strong new management. Seal has the starch, not to mention the heft, and the perfect madam's bosom. Uh, <coughs> I'm not just worried about Seal, of course. Of course not. Lex heaves himself to his feet and tosses the book on the table. There's nothing afterward, you know. What? Once you die, that's it. Oh, oh don't say that. Oh, don't say that, sir. Don't, don't say things like that. I'd think it would be a comfort to you, Stick. Once you're dead, you'll never know you existed. You're nothing. Stick's eyes dart uneasily. What about God, sir? <coughs> what about heaven? Think about it, Stick. Why would God surround himself in heaven with billions of idiotic human beings? 
when he can have anything he wants. Lex glances at his watch. Stick claps the mask back onto his face. Why would he do such a thing? It's just not logical. Lex turns off the oxygen flow. Lefty, loosey, righty, tidy. Stick is thumping his hands on the mattress and turning blue. But taking one last grab at life, he flings away the mask. Guff, Sanglass came to see me. Lex turns the oxygen back on. Richard Sandglass from the Detective Bureau? Yeah, boss. Came to see you. Stick nods. You two pals or something? Leaning over the bed, Lex takes the mask from Stick's hand. You pals with a cop. <sighs> he pinched me twice as a fly dick. Both times when I was Jimmy Walker's bootlegger. We're not pals, but he feels sorry for me, I guess. More than you can say for Polly. Forget Polly. <laughs> he never comes to visit me. I said forget Polly. We're talking about Richard Sandglass, who didn't come by here just to cheer you up. What do you want? <laughs> First, you gotta promise you won't turn off that oxygen tank again. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Lex sits back down. What did he want? <sighs> he. He said he was sorry to hear I wasn't going to get better and told me that a deathbed confession has the weight of sworn testimony. <laughs> Lex feels a sharp cramp in his abdomen and looks down at his hands lying flat on his thighs. Not a tremble, but his fingers have turned cold. So far as a cop like Sandglass is concerned, you're a legger who went legit after repeal. Why would he care about your deathbed confession? <sighs> He wanted me to tell him what I knew about you. What I did for you. And you said? <sighs> Take a hike. What else would I say? But he says you're nothing but a crook passing himself off as a politician. <coughs> no offense, sir. I'm just repeating his words. And when were you going to tell me about all this? <sighs> Leave me alone, sir. You don't know what it's like facing what I'm facing. <clears throat> Every second is precious. Don't spoil it. Lex thinks about that, weighs it, and finally nods. Case made. He picks up the Kenneth Roberts novel and finds his place. We'd no sooner made camp that night. Lex glances up and meets Stick's gaze. They both smile. From where she is sitting in the kitchen, Seal can see Lex Luthor step out of Herman's room and gently close the door. Hello, doctor. While he picks up the phone and makes a call, she puts water on for tea and drapes a towel over Zulu's cage. A few minutes later, Lex walks into the kitchen. I bet Herman was glad to see you. He was. These the blues? Lex picks up the proofs for the fall arsenal of values. He flips through several pages. The Crown Prince, the Medley, the Salvo, the hoopla. All of the copy is illustrated by photographs of rifles and hand grenades, bomblets, cluster bomblets, stench and stink bombs, there's a difference, infernal bombs and gravity bombs, everything offered at sharply reduced prices. Seal, I want to talk to you about an opportunity you might be interested in, but we'll wait till after the funeral. Uh, the funeral? He's gone, Seal. That was Stick's doctor I just called. He'll call Mahoney's. Mahoney's? The funeral parlor. It wasn't as though he expected Stick to betray him to Richard Sandglass, but why take chances? And besides, Stick's illness had dragged on. Lex did the man a favor. Lex promised Stick he would leave the oxygen tank alone, and he did. He was a man of his word. He used a pillow. The Smoke and Dynamite Fall Arsenal of Values is printed on August 9th, 1937. Between bootleg runs of How to Win Friends and Influence People and Gone with the Wind, that was Lex's own brainstorm, producing cheap copies of best-selling books for the English language markets in South and Central America. Booming business. Before the end of August, the orders start pouring in. One of them comes from a first-time customer in Hollywood, California, named Charles V. Brunner. Brunner is a 35-year-old trumpeter with the Bob Crosby Orchestra, a very decent Dixieland-style swing band, despite the band leader's complete lack of musical talent. 
But young Bob is good at fronting talent, and he has name recognition, being kid brother to Bing. Currently, the band is playing an extended engagement at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles. That's where Brenner picked up the Smoke and Dynamite catalog. It was lying around the dressing room in a messy pile of slicks and pulp magazines. Once Brunner realized what the catalog was offering, he found himself wholly absorbed in the array of products. The revenge idea popped into his head, practically full-blown, the same instant he turned a page and came upon the double spread, offering a wide selection of infernal devices. A time bomb. That's what he could do. He could blow her up with a time bomb. For the past several weeks, Brunner had been wondering just what the hell he was going to do about his wife's infidelity. She didn't know that he knew, that he'd seen them together. Charlie Brunner was biding his time, but he had to do something, and it was the catalog that made him decide upon his course of action. He would kill her, her and the boyfriend. The model Brunner chose was called the Tri-Nitro Deluxe. Three sturdy red cardboard tubes, TNT filler, fuse, safety clips, copper wires, and a Bulova silent tick alarm clock. All for under 30 bucks, postage included. He paid with a money order. The Tri-Nitro Deluxe is delivered in a sturdy carton wrapped with brown paper. And ironically, since it comes on a Saturday, Skinny carries it in from the mailbox. You got something. Skinny tosses the parcel on the coffee table, giving Brunner a sickening jolt, because he knows immediately what's inside. But he needn't have worried. It was banged around a lot worse than that in the mails. The material is well-packed in Excelsior. What'd you get? None of your damn business. Brunner gets up from the couch and takes the parcel with him down the hall to the bathroom. Be like that, see if I care. Almost since day one, the Brunner's marriage has been miserable and quarrelsome. A man should know better than to marry a woman with a shape like Skinny's. Pour a physique like hers into a nurse's uniform and watch out. Trouble with a capital T. And Charlie Brunner has that all right. Brunner had married the broad down at City Hall and brought her back out to California with him. Big mistake. But at least he knows what's going on. He even knows where they've been doing the dirty, in a cheap little bungalow on Vine Street, and when, every Tuesday afternoon. Brunner followed Skinny there twice, loitering around but unable to make himself go bang on the door. But Brunner intends to rectify his big mistake now. On the 28th of September, 1937, Charlie Brunner delivers his carefully assembled and packaged time bomb to the stoop of Bungalow 9 at the Haciendas on Vine Bungalow Court. The Tri-Nitro Deluxe is rigged to explode when the package flaps are opened, and if they aren't, the bomb will go off in 20 minutes. But Skinny Simon, now Skinny Bronner, doesn't meet Willie Berg at his bungalow this Tuesday afternoon, because today is special, a celebration day, and they've agreed to meet at noon at Rancho La Brea on Wilshire Boulevard, east of Fairfax. After they have a stroll around the famous bubbling tar pits and then walk into Hancock Park to look at the prehistoric statuary, they'll go grab lunch. Skinny has been living in L.A. less than three months, and this is her first visit to the tar pits. Willie's been a resident of Hollywood for eight months, but he's never been there either. The tar is amazing. Though it looks more like murky water and the stench of congealed oil is pretty brutal, but they can't really concentrate on the tour. They're both too eager to sit down on a bench and look at the contents of Willie's manila envelope, so they do. The envelope contains his contributor's copy of the new Odell's of Paris and Hollywood lingerie catalog, which features pictures of Skinny all the way through it, modeling peekaboo brassiers and frilly corsets, garter belts, bustiers, nylons, and negligees for the full-figured woman. <laughs> Skinny turns through the coded pages, attracting the attention of several tourists, a few of whom peek at the open magazine and are startled by what they see. These are great! <laughs> well, sure. Let's not forget this. Willie draws out a business envelope from the inside pocket of his coat. Oh, God! Did they really pay you? Of course they paid me. I said this was legit. It's legit. Say, doll, no, that guy at Odell's thinks you ought to find an agent, just by the way. What guy? The guy that hired me. The art director. He says you ought to take the catalog and go find yourself an agent. Oh, uh, I don't know, Willie. I'm just passing on what he said. He also wants to know if you're interested in any glamour work. I told him to ask you himself. You you didn't give him my home number, did you? No, or your name either. But what, you're never going to tell Charlie? Uh, I, I will, I will. Skinny frowns and takes another pass at the catalog. She points to one picture. I always thought I had a mole there. You do. I think it's sexy, but they wanted it off. Let's walk. Those people over there keep staring. What people? Work in that juice stand. Don't look. 
But of course she does, looking directly at the couple in the Ice Age drinks hut, a man and a woman, both sloppily overweight in cook whites and paper hats. They do indeed seem exceptionally interested in Willyberg and Skinny Simon, and don't glance away when Skinny meets their eyes. Okay, let's walk. Better safe than sorry. How do you stand it, Willie, being on the run? Most of the time I don't even think about it. And besides, I got a secret weapon, if I'm ever pinched. What do you mean, secret weapon? If I told you, it wouldn't be a secret. They walk on past statues of giant ground sloths, giant bears, giant vultures, giant rats. Twice Willie tries to hold Skinny's hand, but she won't let him. It makes her too nervous. She wishes their reunion had stayed platonic. Really. Even if her marriage is a mess. On the other hand, it's been so much fun seeing him again. And it was so incredible bumping into him by accident two months ago. What were the chances of that? Coincidences, in Skinny's experience, usually mean trouble, not delight. But that coincidence was sheer delight. Skinny volunteering at the Kernville migrant camp, Willie showing up there one day to snap some pictures after he dropped off his roommate at the nearby Prudential Studios. Willie Berg, with red hair. She recognized him instantly. It was great catching up. Yeah, yeah, she was married, can you beat that? Great spending time together, and more than great posing for Willie's camera after he landed that catalog assignment. The person who probably doesn't think it was so great is Willie's quiet pal, Clark Kent. He probably resents it like hell being kicked out of his own apartment every Tuesday afternoon so that Willie can take Skinny's pictures. Not that he's ever complained. I got a letter from Lois yesterday. She's working for the Daily Planet. No fooling. Good for her. She mentioned you. She did? Yeah. That she hasn't heard from you in about a year. It hasn't been that long. God, maybe it has. And there's something else. She's got a boyfriend. You don't mind? I've been gone for two years. It's not like we were so perfect together. Who's the lucky guy? A cop. <laughs> well, that's great. That's just... swell. She says his name I'm is... not interested. Look, can we talk about something else? That's him! That's him! Arrest the bomb! That no-good bomb! That's him! Willie swivels his head around and knows instantly that he's caught. And there's no point in trying to run. Four uniformed cops are approaching obliquely, the closest one not even ten feet away. They all have revolvers drawn. That's him! That's him! That's the crummy Shadan Harper! Skinny squeezes Willie's arm, but a cop shoves her away and grips Willie himself. Sir, could you come with us? As he is hustled away past the statues of gigantic rats, Willie glances at the fat woman from the juice stand, now giving him the finger. You should rot! You should fry! Ida! It's his sister. get to a hospital. No. They won't know what to do. He looked dazed. At first he couldn't speak. He was shoeless and his dungarees were in tatters. The pocket rivets were melted and so was his belt buckle. All that remained of his shirt was its left sleeve, part of the yoke, and a white ribbon of fabric that lay flat on his chest like a battle flag. She peeled that off him before she even walked him across the floor and sat him down. She didn't know his name so she called him Honey or Sweetheart or Doll. That was half an hour ago. Outside, the air is densely smoky, so thick she can't see 20 feet through her front window to the opposite bungalow. She snaps the curtains closed. Her name is Diana, Diana Dewey. Well, it is and it isn't. She was christened Gladys Murrah, but changed it to Christy Winsome when she landed her first job in pictures playing Harry Carey's pigtailed niece in monograms Hidden West. That was in 1928. The following year, she changed her name again, that time to Anne Blaine, maintaining it throughout her five-year stay at the mascot studios on Las Palmas Avenue, where, costumed always in skin-tight riding pants, she co-starred with Tim McCoy, Tom Tyler, Joe Bonomo, or Rin Tin Tin, and a dozen Western and Jungle Adventure serials, a few of which were recut later and released as five real features. But Diana Dewey is what Harry Cohn at Columbia Pictures decided he wanted her called two years ago when he okayed her admission to Starlet School. A permission he never would have granted had he known she was 27. She just looked 23. But then she caught the grip, contracted bronchial pneumonia, and her voice changed. But even though she washed out at Columbia, she got plenty of offers to smooch, none to act. She kept the Diana Dewey name. It was on her apartment lease and health insurance, and she was tired of traipsing to court and filing papers. 
A petite, athletic-looking woman, the type press agents would describe as sportaletic, Diana has sleek black hair parted in the middle, a relatively new coiffure that replaced her head of cutie pie curls, dark eyes, cherry red lips, natural not paint, and a white but healthy complexion. She wears steel-rimmed almond-shaped glasses. Turning away from the window, she looks across her living room now at the young man seated eerily still, glassy-eyed, and practically naked in the smaller of her two love seats. His hands clutch at his flat stomach. Sugar, there's probably an ambulance outside right now. No hospital. No ambulance. Please, I'll be all right. How do you figure that, sweetie? He doesn't reply, and Diana drops it. By all rights, this narrow-faced boy should be nothing but ash and bone chips, yet here he is, plopped in Diana's love seat, acting like he's suffering from acid indigestion. Well, no. Something a little bit worse than that. This isn't the first time Diana has seen him. The first time was at Grand National Pictures in April. Then a month later, he turned up on the Republic back lot. He was one of Yakima Knut's stuntmen. She watched him leap from a burning hayloft into the saddle of a galloping horse and topple from a cliff in Bronson Canyon. In July, she saw him speeding down Melrose toward Western on roller skates. Good looking, she thought, but no Gary Cooper. More like Paul Muni, but without the devils. Or Cagney with jet black hair and minus the smart aleck bug. At least, that was Diana's take on him from across the commissary or the street. What could she know or tell for sure? When she realized a month ago that he was living only 15 doors away, Diana felt the kind of juicy thrill in her solar plexus that she hadn't felt in a very long time. No denying it, she had the eagers to meet him. In recent weeks, she managed, or finagled, to be out and about the courts when he likely would be coming or leaving. And they'd exchanged smiling hellos on several occasions, the smiles growing steadily gladder and friendlier, although twice he'd been with his roommate, a red-headed masher who always gave Diana that look, that leer, that insulting up and down once over, usually punctuated by a wink. Him she didn't like. The kid, though. There was something about the kid that she definitely liked. And it wasn't just his trim acrobat's physique. Every other G in Hollywood had one of those. And now, here he is. And now his hands separate and drop away from his stomach, revealing a lateral gash, no wider and no longer than a toothpick. As Diana stares, a thin line of blood trickles out and fills in his navel. As soon as Skinny reads in the Wednesday papers that it was a time bomb... Hiya, Nappy. Hey, Gil. Either of you seen my hubby? She knew that Charlie did it, the son of a bitch. Hi, Bob, Dean, Maddie. You seen Charlie? Hey, thanks. She hadn't known about the explosion at Willie Berg's apartment till she saw a picture of the damage in the LA Times. At first, it didn't register. It took her several seconds before the page one photo turned suddenly into a place she knew well, had been inside of once a week for the past half a dozen... Tuesdays. The article said the bomb exploded at roughly 1.15 in the afternoon. Tuesday afternoon. And all the while, she thought Charlie didn't know. She took a cab to the rehearsal studio downtown. Eddie, is Charlie in there? Sure is, sweetheart. How you been? We haven't seen you in... Hey, you can't go in there. Skinny does, though, and finds her husband sitting on the toilet, reading the Times himself. Hey, what's going... The barrel of the little silver derringer from her coat pocket is pressed to Charlie's forehead. You tried to kill me. Don't! But Skinny does squeeze the trigger. It's going on 5 p.m., and the felony block is as quiet as an opium den. Willie isn't even sure how many of the other cells are occupied. Three or four would be his guess, but since he was processed in here yesterday, none of his neighbors have shown the smallest inclination to communicate with him or with anyone else. Which is good. He was afraid the place would be a bedlam, like in the movies. He was terrified he'd have to share a cell with some maniac. The end of the tier swings open, and a jail deputy, a freckle-faced blonde who looks like he ought to be jerking sodas at Curry's ice cream parlor, comes in and walks directly to Willie's cell. Stand up, turn around, and put your hands behind your back. What for? I have to cuff you. Oh, for the love of Mike. On the way down the block, Willie glances into all of the other cells. He guessed wrong. Just two other prisoners. Neither of them look at him when he passes. Where are we going? Captain Gould wants to see you. Captain Gould is the spit-and-polish type, deeply tanned and thick-bodied, his waist going to flab. His uniform looks just off the hanger. Hands in his trouser pockets, he stands behind a conference table situated lengthwise down the room. On the table, a littered gray cardboard box and a zipper-style briefcase with peeling varnish. Sit! 
Willie toes a chair away from the table and then awkwardly perches on the edge of its seat. His upper arms threaten to cramp, but he'll grind his back teeth to a fine powder before he'll complain about the handcuffs. Gould withdraws his hands from his pockets. They're huge, and the backs are covered with thick monkey hair. Picking up the littered box, he comes and stands behind Willie's chair. Willie's whole body tenses. Collins, unlock the prisoner's handcuffs. Yes, sir. Willie rubs at the grooves in his wrists. Gould takes the lid off the cardboard box. Flinging it aside, he tips the box forward, spilling on the table hunks of charred metal, part of the blackened face and radium dial of an alarm clock, scorched paper, bits of wire, bits of twine. You see this? It's what's left of the guinea football that blew up your apartment. Deliberately going for the Sako effect, he then scoops out a palm's worth of ash. And this is probably all that's left of your roommate. Well, he suddenly has a vicious headache, and it's hard to think above and between its steady pulse. The apartment? Guinea football? Clark? Wait a second. Hold on. What I think, Willie, I think somebody tried to blow you up. Either that, or your roommate blew himself up building a bomb. No. No? Clark doesn't know anything about bombs. Are you sure he was there? That's what the neighbors tell us. Well, he's not dead, I can tell you that. Who blew up your place, Willie? I don't know. Take a guess. You ever hear of a guy in New York named Lex Luthor? No. He's a politician. And a crook. And the guy that framed me. He could have sent the bomb to get rid of me. He could have found out where I was living and then... Willie's scenario is sounding implausible, even to him. Captain Gould returns to the far end of the table and unzips his briefcase. What now? Brass knuckles? Instead, he takes out a carton of cigarettes, which he slides down the table to Willie. A little gift from Maya Lansky. What? He read about you in the papers. Thought you might be needing a little pick-me-up. Just make them last, Willie. You could be here for a couple of weeks. For a moment, Willie thinks he might take the high ground and refuse the gift. But the hell with the high ground. He isn't about to pass up 200 smokes for a principal. Besides, he sort of liked Meyer Lansky. And he has the impression that Captain Gould sort of likes him too. Otherwise, Willie might be leaving here right now with a few busted ribs, a hamburger face, and a mouthful of blood. Clark, he thinks, for crying out loud, come get me. <laughs> Coming through the door, she flings her green felted beret on the wall peg and tosses the saucer man costume, still in its plastic bag, over an arm of the bigger love seat. Diana is in a black mood. The producer she expected to be working for throughout the autumn, perhaps till the end of the year, was fired yesterday, and now his latest chapter play, Saucer Man from Saturn, is officially scratched from the production schedule. Ever since she washed out as an actress, Diana has been designing and sewing, fitting and altering costumes for the Poverty Row Studios and conglomerates in North Hollywood. It's not what she ever wanted to do, God knows, but you get what you get and you do what you can. And she takes pride in being damn good with a singer machine. She walks into the kitchen and puts down the grocery sack and prepares dinner. Clark! Up here! When she comes back out into the living room and peers up, there's Clark on the narrow balcony leaning over the banister. How'd it go? It didn't. They scrubbed the picture. <laughs> what do you have on? He looks down at himself and grins. Pathfinder moccasins, the jodhpurs from an African safari shoot, a mailed shirt worn by a merman from an undersea kingdom, a domino mask, and a cowboy hat. He found everything crammed in with dozens of other wardrobe costumes on a pushboy in Diana's sewing room. He unties the mask, pulls it off his face, and drapes it over the railing. He's trying to be cute. Maybe you can sell the same costumes to some other picture. Uh, I'll be all right, honey. Don't worry about me. What about you? You feeling better? Yeah, much. He touches his stomach, the wound area, even presses it. She nods slowly, thoughtfully, walks back into the kitchen, grabs a pot holder, and opens the oven door. Using a spatula, she slides a nest of hash and beans onto Clark's plate, another onto her own. Help yourself to beets. Bon appetit. Before starting to eat, she removes her eyeglasses and puts them aside. <sighs> what? What do you mean? You just frowned. Nothing. No. Tell me. I like you with your glasses on. <laughs> You're crazy. They make me look like a sweatshop girl. No. They make you look even more beautiful than you... Thank you, Clark. That's very sweet. She puts her glasses back on. 
better? I'm sorry, I didn't mean... Thank you, I said. <laughs> Now let's eat. Clark. Uh-huh? It's Friday. Yes? You got blown up on Tuesday. That's just three days ago. The bungalow got blown up, not me. Diana's expression, almost but not quite afraid, the fear mitigated by confusion and awe, is the same one he's been seeing again and again over the past two years. He saw it only last week at the Prudential lot, after he'd fallen off the back of a galloping horse and slid under the left rear wheel of a stagecoach. Rolling over Clark's abdomen, the wheels shattered into great wooden chunks. The wagon pitched over, dragging the team of horses with it, injuring two of them. But Clark just got up apologizing, apologizing, even before the production crew reached him. <sighs> Clark, we have to talk. What about? What about? About you, about how you... I think I might be from another planet. <laughs> you too? What's the name of your planet? Mine's Tennessee. Diana and Clark are lying together, fully dressed, on her bed. Impulsively, he reaches over with two hands and removes her eyeglasses. She smiles until he fits the sidewires around his own ears. <laughs> What do you think? They make you look very... <laughs> intelligent. You think? Really? Clark rolls off the bed to go and stand in front of the bureau mirror. Yes, really. Now come back to bed, Superman. Because if there's one thing that I wish I was, it's... What did you call me? Later, after Diana falls asleep, Clark watches her for hours. He wants to wake her up, but he doesn't. Instead, he picks her glasses up from the table and puts them on in the dark. Intelligent, huh? Skinny Simon sits at the open window of her hotel room, looking out at the rain, relishing the breeze, wondering what next. Skinny's gun, of course, was only a novelty lighter. <laughs> she can't help smiling when she remembers the look on Brunner's face when she pulled the trigger. She has a divorce to look forward to, but after Nevada, what next? Take the Super Chief back to New York? Or stick around here, become a lingerie model? A model. She's a nurse, for God's sake. But when you come right down to it, nursing is a job. You do it for pay, same as modeling brassiers. And it's much harder work, draining work. Every time Skinny returns to that migrant clinic in Kernville, she discovers that another little girl or boy she saw the previous week has since died from a ruptured appendix or diphtheria. That takes its toll. At least when you're a model, nobody dies. Captain Gould, off-duty, stands watching it rain through the sliding glass doors of the pool room at an exclusive men's club in the San Fernando Valley. Wearing a robe of white Turkish toweling, he raptly gazes at the bazillion animated rings on the swimming pool water outside. Behind him, a man steps naked from the sauna. He is extremely white, pot-bellied, fleshy. <sighs> did you have an opportunity to pass on my gift? I did indeed, Mr. Lansky. Thank you. Glad to do it. Did, uh, the two of you know each other back in New York? This rain, maybe it'll bring down the temperature. Just, uh, more humidity. Pessimist. Fooey on pessimists. They get you killed. I thought it was the optimist did that. You thought wrong. He starts to go, shuffling off back toward the showers. Mr. Lansky, uh, who is Lou Dexter? I have no idea. He's a politician in New York, the bird kid. Lex Luthor? That's it. What do you know about him? Why are you asking? The, the bird kid what? Said he didn't kill anybody. That he was framed by this Lex Luthor, whoever he is. He's an alderman. And the kid's right. Which is too bad for the kid. By morning, the rain has stopped, the skies are clear, and it's a glorious, rinsed day in Los Angeles. Diana wakes to find herself alone in bed, but then hears Clark directly below in the kitchen. She smiles and stretches. After showering, she dresses in black slacks and a green blouse and goes downstairs. At the kitchen doorway, she stops dead in her tracks. <laughs> Today, my friend, I am definitely going out and buying you some real clothes. 
Clark has put on that saucer man costume, the blue tights with the red trunks, the yellow belt, a red S inside a black shield, appliqued to the chest. He turns from the stove, where he's using a whisk to scramble eggs. Fits good. Mmm, like a glove. You could get arrested for indecent exposure. She has embarrassed him, and he loves it. But I got a question. What's the S stand for? Saucer man or Saturn? Take your pick. Okay, but why would they even have the letter S if they're from Saturn? I mean, do they write in English there? Hmm. Diana sticks out her tongue. Shut up and feed me, Mister. Using a spatula, he shovels the eggs, slightly watery, a little charred, onto her plate and his. There's toast and coffee. Anything else? Only you. <laughs> he blushes again. Then, reaching behind him, he sweeps aside the long red cape before sitting down at the table. Personally, I never liked capes. I think they're great. Way better than neckties. Clark finally just hangs it over the back of his chair. But they always want villains and spacemen to wear them. Don't ask me how come. Diana smiles again. God, she feels like a smiling fool, thinking about last night. Listen, I've been thinking. <laughs> always a dangerous thing. Clark frowns. <sighs> Don't mind me. Thinking about what? I have to go get Willie. She smiles again. The guy is completely adorable. Too bad he's nuts. Clark, sweetheart, you can't just go bust your pal out of jail. But he's innocent. So you told me you still can't do it. No, see, that's the thing. I can. I really can. Clark sits on a cliff at Bronson Canyon, a short distance from Hollywood. Legs dangling, he stares at the green lagoon 50 feet below, then out to the rough, undulating, boulder-strewn wasteland beyond, where most of the Poverty Row studios film their western chases. He's worked here a dozen times over the past seven months, has, in fact, leapt from this very cliff, pretending to be shot. Clark was pretty awkward at first. Yakima Canute kept saying he didn't know how in hell Clark hadn't broken his collarbone at the very least, toppling off that Indian pony, the driver's box on that Wells Fargo stage, that promontory. In time, though, he got better. So good, he was bombarded with offers of work, too many for Clark's liking. But it sure was nice making money. Not that he has any of it now. He kept all of his savings at home, and now that his home is gone, blown to smithereens, his cash is gone too. After breakfast, Diana went out and bought him some new clothes. The shirt and trousers, socks and shoes he's wearing now. She also gave him a hundred bucks. I'll pay you back. Don't worry about it. No, I want to. She nodded, not smiling, and because he was so crazy about it, she made him a gift of the saucer man costume, acrobat's cape and all. She stuffed it into a string bag and threw in a pair of shiny red boots that belonged to another costume from another picture she worked on, Santa Claus versus the Gila Martians. He left her bungalow a short time later. Clark purses his lips, rattling the dusty leaves on a yucca tree some 40 feet away. The idea of rescuing Willie makes Clark sick to his stomach. He may never have experienced the majority of natural aches and activities. He's never hiccuped, never had the sniffles, he doesn't need to shave more than once a month, but he knows about feeling nauseous, and he knows about headaches, and he knows about strained nerves. And right now he knows about all of those things all over again. What if somebody gets hurt or killed while he's trying to break Willie Berg out of the L.A. County Jail? He'd feel so guilty. Such Methodist guilt. What if they put me in jail for life and I live 200 years? But how could they keep me there? Without Willie around, he doesn't have anyone to fret to. He used to fret to his mom, hardly ever to his dad. But even with them, he felt they couldn't understand how strange, how lonesome it is, being one of a kind. Being singular has always made Clark feel as though he's not quite genuine, that he's a made-up character and a story. And that's hard, especially since he's not smart the way that he feels he should be, all things being equal. Intelligence to match his physical powers? Is that too much to ask? Maybe he should start wearing glasses. Getting to his feet, Clark looks out across the canyon, a landscape that always seems to him both magical and personal, since it is identical to the one, it is the one, that he used to see in Western serials and African safari movies on Saturdays at the Jewel. He notices a crevice in a rock formation, and can imagine some famous cowboy ducking inside while dodging a hail of bullets. Tucking his elbows against his ribs, he crouches, trembles, and leaps. When he lands on a boulder down below, 
The soles of his new shoes give him no traction. <laughs> Swooping both arms for balance, he flings off his string bag and sends it whizzing a hundred feet down the canyon. He hops to the ground and retrieves it, then decides to jump from here to that shelf of granite down there and does. Leaping from outcrop to boulder to boulder to outcrop, he makes his way ever farther down the canyon. He doesn't notice when yet another long jump becomes a very high jump, but all of a sudden, he's rising straight up into the air, the clouds. A small tickling electrical charge starts pulsing around his body, his velocity becoming so extravagant so quickly that his shirt and trousers and shoes all seethe from the friction. Without conscious thought, Clark tucks his head toward his left shoulder, makes a fist with his left hand, and his body immediately follows that direction. I can fly! Mr. Mayor, oh, at Mayor LaGuardia, thank you for agreeing to meet with me tonight. Sir, there is a ghost gang operating in greater New York that has been systematically eliminating all of its criminal competition. Damn it, I, I sound like Tom Dewey. Relax. The mayor has agreed to see Dick Sandglass under the conditions the detective proposed to the mayor's secretary. On the weekend absent any staff, and with no record of the meeting entered on any appointment calendar. Tonight, 7.30, the mayor's apartment. Mr. Mayor, I have with me this evening damning proof that a man trusted by the citizens of this city, trusted by you yourself, sir, has abused that sacred trust and and has been positioning himself to become absolute king of the New York rackets. And that man, I'm sorry to tell you, sir, is none other than... That's when shots ring out from behind the curtain and you fall dead, Pop. Hey, kid. When did you get back? A few minutes ago. Spider Sandglass stands in the bedroom doorway with his arms crossed and a smile on his face. A paintbrush-sized hank of black hair flops across his forehead. The rest glistens with brill cream. He needs a haircut. He needs better posture. He needs a job. Ah, leave the kid alone, thinks Dick Sandglass. He's trying. Go on, Pop. It sounded good. Who's the mystery villain? You don't think I sounded like, uh, I, I don't know, some guy in the movies? No, it was great. Very professional. Thanks. No, 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 really. It sounded great. Yeah, before you know it, you'll be chief of police. Or wearing cement shoes in the Atlantic Ocean. Don't even joke, Pop. Who's joking? You want some to eat? You kidding? With the butterflies in my stomach? You go ahead, though. There should be some chicken left. I finished that. Well, then you'll just have to look and see what's there. Spider has been living with his father for three, going on four months now, since he got out of prison with time off for good behavior. He was only supposed to stay here briefly, just till he found some work, but so far he hasn't. Yeah, and who's going to hire an ex-con? Lay off, thinks Sandglass. He's your kid and you love him. And he loves you. Maybe. How much of what I was saying did you hear? There's a ghost gang in town? Where'd you get that? What, Ghost Gang? What, well, you, you, you don't like Ghost Gang? That's a little corny. So I won't use it. Thanks for telling your old man he's corny. Ah, I was only kidding, Pop. It's great. I can see it. Ghost Gang. <laughs> so you're really going to see the mayor? Yeah, I really am. Ever meet him before? Uh, once, when he was a congressman. Hey, I gotta run. See you when I get back. Already, Spider has turned his attention back to Ed Sullivan's column in the Daily News spread out on the kitchen table. He doesn't see the old man go out, but ten seconds later, for some unknown reason, he feels it necessary to glance up at the wall clock. When he does, he notices that his father left the envelope he was carrying on top of the icebox. Theirs is a front-facing apartment on 2nd Street just off the Bowery, and Spider flings up the kitchen window. Hey, Pop! Just as Spider hollers down five stories, a Hudson pulls to the curb in front of Dick Sandglass, and two men run up from behind him, grab his arms, pinion them both, Let me go, you son of a bitch! then drag him across the pavement and fling him into the back of the big car. Standing at the window in shock, holding the fat envelope in his right hand, Spider Sandglass knows with utter certainty that this is the last time he will ever see his father alive. Back in mid-July, Lois Lane found herself in possession of two press tickets to the Sunday matinee of a struggling Broadway show. She went, why not, there was nothing else doing, but she went alone. Everyone she'd asked to come along said no thanks. The reviews for Never Too Tired, 
Yet another society comedy by David Nero and S.B. Dillon had been universally stinko. By intermission, she was agreeing with the critics. She was waiting on line at the lobby bar, thinking maybe she wouldn't bother getting a drink. She'd just go home. Your name's Lois, correct? She turned, and yes, she knew that she knew him, but couldn't place him. A tall, good-looking blonde in his middle twenties, that chiseled Nordic look except for the spray of freckles on his cheeks. He was wearing a gun club check jacket and dark blue slacks. When she noticed his shoes, though, his black boat-like shoes, Lois placed him easily. He'd been the cop sitting guard outside Willie Berg's hospital room two years ago. He'd made her leave her purse with him, which she hadn't minded doing since he was cute and seemed genuinely apologetic. Oh, hello. I I'm sorry, but I've forgotten your name. Ben Yeager. As soon as he told her, she thought, Lois Yeager, because that kind of thing, sounding out her possible married name, had been instinctual with her since she was 12. Just an old stupid habit. It wasn't like she was looking to get married. She had a career, thank you very much. Lois Yeager. That wasn't bad, though. And neither was he. So, Lois, what do you think of the show? I've seen cemeteries with better plots. How about we sneak out of here and get a drink? Maybe dinner? Why not? Until their fourth date, when he took her to see the Giants play, first time anyone she knew ever suggested doing that, Ben Yeager never brought up Willie Berg's name. She'd been expecting him to, of course, and the fact that he had not led her to wonder with increasing unease if she were being used somehow to run Willie down. But at the polo grounds that afternoon, Ben suddenly mentioned his boss Richard Sandglass, saying that Sandglass still hoped Willie Berg would come back to town voluntarily resurface. Sandglass, Ben told her, might be able to help Willie out of his jam. Are you asking me to pass on a message? Because Mr. Sandglass has already asked me to do the same thing. It's Lieutenant. Lieutenant Sandglass. Yeah? And if I want to call him Mr., I will. You didn't answer my question. Are you saying you're still in touch with him? I asked you first. Hey, I'm not some fly dick, Lois, going out with you to catch a crook if that's what you suggested. Lois nodded vaguely and gazed out over the astonishing green turf of the outfield, the whiteness of the base bags. Yeah, I guess that's what I was suggesting. Well, I'm not. And I'm not in touch with Willie Berg, either. Damn, I've wasted all this time. <laughs> she poked him in the ribs, and they watched the rest of the game. Giants 4, Boston Braves 3. Ten weeks of twice weekly dates later, early Saturday evening, October the 1st. After taking in the new Van Gogh exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, Lois and Ben walk down 6th Avenue for a while. Then Ben checks his watch. Ah, sorry Lois. I need to make a call. Do you mind? It'll only take a minute. I need to check in. He doesn't say with whom. Spider, is your dad there? W what do you mean? Okay. Uh, okay, tell me everything. Lois stands outside the booth and sees Ben get more and more agitated as he listens to the voice at the other end of the line. All right, kid. It, it, it'll be all right. What? What's the matter? Ben's face is ghastly pale. Uh, Lois, I, I'm sorry. You're going to have to get home by yourself. Why? What's going on? He shakes his head. Ben! Something might have happened to the lieutenant. I'm going to his apartment. Let me come. No. Ben steps off the curb. Taxi! He puts Lois in while looking over the checker roof to see if he can spot a patrol car to commandeer. Then he bends down and leans into the taxi. I'll call you later. Lois has taken out a notepad, already flipped through several pages. Richard Sandglass, 28 East 2nd Street. Need a lift? Lois, don't. This is serious. I'll call you. 28 East 2nd. That's right off the Bowery. Up until 15 seconds ago, she had considered Ben Yeager her boyfriend. And not because they've gone all the way, because they still haven't. Not all the way. But because she knows his birthday, October the 5th, and for weeks has been trying to think of the perfect gift. Now, though, she's less sure. Maybe he's not her boyfriend. And driver, put on some speed. Pop just said he was going out. That's all he told me. He never mentioned he was going to see the mayor? LaGuardia? No. Spider, did you recognize either of the men? No, two guys. Hats, coats. Ben Yeager rubs a hand across his forehead, then palms it over the top of his head, flattening his hair. Uh, what kind of hats? Hats. Men's hats. 
Lois is sitting with them both at the kitchen table. She arrived at the Sam Glass apartment a full ten minutes before Ben did. Spider, how was he dressed, your dad? Was he wearing his uniform? No. His good suit. His only suit. Pop used to call it his funeral suit, you know, because it's black and he only wears it when he's going to wakes and funerals. Lois, I'm asking the questions, all right? Lois shrugs, but wants to kick him. Spider, this is important. Did your father take anything with him? Uh, a big envelope. He stares past Ben through the open kitchen window. I, I don't know. I, I didn't see any envelope. Mrs. O'Shea's husband, Denholm, is languishing in state prison at Sing Sing, has been for the past three years and will be for the next 47. Denny O'Shea killed a union organizer on the West Side docks, deliberately went after the guy, chased him for a block, then chopped off his head with a shed cutter ordinarily used to trim cabbage. He went down for depraved homicide. Afterward, Mrs. O'Shea found employment at the Straubin Miller Textile High School on West 18th Street. She supervised the kitchen, maintained the on-premises fabrics museum, and devised a streamlined accounting system that saved the arithmetically challenged principal hundreds of hours of headaches. Just about a year ago, however, an audit of the high school's finances revealed that Mrs. O'Shea had embezzled Straubenmuller out of nearly $20,000, which she'd used to buy a summer home in Deal, New Jersey. Lex Luthor heard about the crime during the idle chit-chat with an old-time ward healer in the district. The following afternoon, Lex visited Mrs. O'Shea in the House of Detention for Women in Greenwich Village and made her a proposition. Mrs. O'Shea, in return for my covering your debt to the city and seeing that all criminal charges against you are dropped, you will come and work for me. Of course. Lex raised his hand, stopping her. No, listen to me first. If you come to work for me, you have to know something. That you're a criminal? Yes, I guessed as much. I understand what that means, Alderman, and I accept your offer. Lex never forgave her for that, for having guessed as much. And how exactly did you guess? It takes one to know one. Do you remember the first time we met? The first time we've met, madam, is today, right now. Perhaps I shouldn't have said met. The first time you saw me. He was waiting with one eyebrow lifted. Well... You saw me at the high school's Christmas bazaar last December. You were there shaking hands. I was manning the silent auction table. She took out a cigarette. Put it away. Mrs. O'Shea did as she was told. I saw you ask the principal who I was. You're right, I did. I said, my God, that woman over there just gave me a start. She looks exactly the way my mother looked at 50. Mrs. O'Shea's face drained. She never would, or ever did, quite forgive Lex for that. This Saturday evening, while Lex is away having dinner with Joseph P. Kennedy and Gloria Swanson, Mrs. O'Shea avails herself of the Waldorf premises, bathes in the master bath with the solid gold taps, fixes a chicken sandwich and a potent Manhattan, and then gets comfortable on the sofa in the living room, settling in with the Nero Wolf novel she's currently reading. She hasn't gotten far, three or four chapters, and is looking forward to finishing it tonight. Mrs. O'Shea checks her wristwatch, ten past eight, and considers letting it ring out, but it could be her lord and master checking in. Luther residence. Let me talk to the alderman. I'm sorry, the alderman is not at home. And for your information, whoever you are, when you call someone, you should say who's calling. That's just common courtesy. Who is this, please? I'll call back. He does call back, ten seconds later. Luther Residence. Where's he gone to? When's he coming home? Do you have a number where I can reach him? Didn't I just instruct you in telephone etiquette? Lady, don't start. I'm hanging up right now. You're just plain rude. No, wait. My name is Stephen Sandglass. Is this Mrs. Luthor? This is Mr. Luther's personal assistant. Can you tell me where he is? I need to talk to him. Tonight. Mr. Sandglass, I'm certainly not telling you where the alderman is. Just what exactly is the nature of your business with him? The nature of my business? The nature of my business, lady, is that I want my father back. Your boss kidnapped my pop, and if he's hurt him, I swear to God all this stuff in this envelope I have right here in my hand is going straight to the mayor. And I'm not bluffing. What are you talking about? I want to speak with Lex Luthor tonight. That's not going to happen. Then the next time you see him, he'll be in jail. 
Listen to me. What did you say your name was? Sandglass. Stephen Sandglass, but people call me Spider. And how old are you, Mr. Sandglass? Well, what's that got to do How with old? 24. Then people shouldn't be calling you Spider. Now listen to me. Are you listening? If you would like to live to be 25, I wouldn't go around making these kinds of threats. Not to me, not to Alderman Luther, and not in the city of New York. I want my father back, and then he can have the file. I'm calling back in an hour, and Lex Luthor better answer this phone. Don't you dare hang up your phone. Who are you telling me what to do? Mrs. O'Shea replaces the handset, then stands up from her chair, plants her hands on her hips, and glares at the telephone. You ring right back, do you hear me? Don't you dare hang up on me again. Mrs. O'Shea? Oh, it's you. Yes, it's me. Has Polly phoned in? No, he has not. Any other calls? No, sir. Then who was it that hung up on you? I do have a personal life. Oh, how nice for you. But Mrs. O, do not conduct it on my telephone. Good night, Mr. Luther. Then she looks at her book and shrugs. The League of Frightened Men will have to wait. Mrs. O'Shea has no doubt who it is. In Los Angeles, where it is just a few minutes past five in the afternoon, Captain Gould is staring at a big hole in the exterior wall of a cell on the felony block of the county jail. Captain Gould, a dozen witnesses say they saw a guy in a blue leotard floating around. He punched a hole in the wall, picked the guy up, and flew away. Gould turns around in Willie Berg's cell. Did you say a floating man? Yes, sir. And he had a big red S on the front of his shirt. When he arrives back at the Waldorf just before midnight, Lex is in an expansive mood. But the moment he steps into the foyer of his suite in the towers, his face drops. The nine framed linoleum cuts by Reginald Marsh, rainy street scenes, have been removed from their hooks and are stacked on the floor. Impaled now on the brass picture hooks are photostatic copies of several incorporation documents along with private laboratory reports whose subject he sees upon closer inspection is fingerprint matching. Slowly, he follows the trail of documents down the hallway. Just outside his office, photographs are tacked up around the doorframe the way some people display Christmas cards. They are pictures, many looking as though they were taken from behind potted palms, of Lex Luthor huddled in conversations with Mussolini's first cousin, with investment bankers Prescott Bush and George Herbert Walker, and a representative of a Berlin chemical factory, with two mafia godfathers and a notorious madam. The door to Lex's office, usually shut and locked, is partly open. He pushes it the rest of the way with his fingertips. Mrs. O'Shea is seated behind the desk. She has on a Glen plaid business suit, a white shirt, and a gray tie that Lex recognizes as his own. In front of her is a delicate hand-painted coffee cup on a saucer. A matching cup is lying on its rim on the white pile rug near a brown stain that still looks wet. Also lying on the rug, is the rigid body of a young man in his early twenties. His eyes bulge, and his clenched teeth are flecked with dried foam. Have a seat, Lex. We need to talk. And this young man is... Stephen Sandglass. He said you kidnapped his father. Stephen Sandglass? Yes, but called Spider by his friends. He brought over a certain envelope he thought you'd be interested in. Ransom. So he was hoping. Now won't you have a seat? Poison? Mrs. O'Shea blinks, then sits up straighter. I convinced him I was shocked. Assured him that his father was still alive. He's not, is he? No. Then I offered him a cup of coffee. And now there's a dead body in my office. What am I supposed to do about it? You'll figure something out. I could, you know, remove all of those documents from the wall and call the cops. You poisoned your faithless young lover... He was about to dump you. It'll be a scandal, but I'll survive. You wouldn't. She stands up behind the desk. Why not? What's the alternative? Lex takes out his linen handkerchief, stoops down, and lays it over the coffee stain. He picks up the cup and smells it. I asked you, what's my alternative course? You call Polly, and he takes the body off to the dumbwaiter. We get a professional carpet shampoo, and from now on... 
I'm a full partner. No, I believe I'm still inclined to my suggestion. With the added element that you killed yourself afterward in fear of disgrace and the electric chair. Try and make me. He didn't want money? Apparently, just his dad returned unharmed. Lex grins and finally sits down on one of the upholstered chairs along the wainscoting. You know what's funny? No, what's funny? I don't even know your first name. Helen. It's Helen. He stretches out his legs, crosses his feet over his ankles, and stares at Spider Sandglass. Helen. Well, well. Usually on Mondays, Mrs. O'Shea takes the train to Ossining and visits Denny at the prison there. She brings him his weekly cigarette money and a dozen nickel chocolate bars. Then they both lapse into awkward silence for half an hour. But today, her first conscious thought is that she won't be visiting her husband this particular Monday, and perhaps never again. Who knows? She throws off the comforter and rolls out of bed, Lex Luther's bed, then steps quickly to the bathroom and jumps into the shower. She keeps the water as hot as she can bear it and scrubs and scrubs at herself. Then she begins reducing the cold water till the spray is entirely hot water and her body scalds painfully. Then she twists off the hot tap and stands there dripping. Mrs. O'Shea's shoulders and meaty chest have turned bright cherry red, even beginning to blister in places. Back in the bedroom, Mrs. O finds one of Lex's royal blue bathrobes and puts it on. There are no slippers that fit. She flings open the office door and then stops abruptly. Dressed in a midnight blue tuxedo, Lex is seated behind his desk. He has on a pair of headphones and is scribbling madly on a pad of yellow fool's cap. When he sees Mrs. O, he frowns, then holds up a warning finger. Be quiet. He writes more. Mrs. O half turns her head to the left, and not expecting to find anyone else here, she flinches. Caesar Caluso, that garlic eater she can't abide, is perched rigidly in one of the chairs, his black hat on his lap. Stationed beside him is yet another of his shiny tin men, another of those creepy robots, this one larger than the other she's seen, less tubular, leaner. The others were unnerving but ridiculous. This one frightens her. It seems to be turned off. But how can you really tell? Lex snaps a toggle on a small radio receiver. He removes his headphones and tosses them down. He looks at Mrs. O, then at Caesar Caluso. Apparently, I am now the focus of a very classified secret criminal investigation. How do you... Helen, I was just read the transcript of two intercepted telephone calls, one outgoing, one incoming, from the mayor's private line. I gather that Fatty has spoken with the late Lieutenant Sandglass's young sidekick and has chosen to believe what he says, even without documentation. What does this mean? Now what? Oh, I'll think of something. Are you Clark? A slender brunette is tapping him on the shoulder. Lois? Sorry I'm late. That's all right. Is Clark your I... first name or your last? First. Her thick hair reminds Clark of the color of milk chocolate. It is so... shiny. Did you come by yourself? I'm a reporter, not a cop. I was just being Is careful. Willie in New York? Yeah, we're living... Clark stops himself and vaguely swings his left arm behind him. In that direction, somewhere back there. When did he get here? We both got here four days ago. No, five. Clark nods toward Avenue A, toward St. Mark's Place. How about we start walking? At last, there's a break in traffic. Clark and Lois rush across Avenue A, then continue west on St. Mark's Place, past stoops and tenements, dodging fatigued-looking women pushing baby strollers or dragging small children, weaving around sidewalk clusters of young Jewish men in skullcaps, older Slavic men in shabby suits smoking brown cigarettes, as they're coming up on a grocery store... Did you pay for that? Stop! Thief! A lithe and lean 30-ish looking man leaps through the open doorway, a loaf of silver cup bread squeezed in each fist. He dashes in front of Clark and into the street, then takes off sprinting in the direction of Cooper Union. The grocer runs outside. Uh, the cops all him up. He glares at Clark, who looks down at his shoes and hurries on. So, you a bleeding heart? Were you just afraid the guy'd bop you with a loaf of bread? People are hungry. That's true, some people are. 
But what about the poor guy who owns the grocery store? People keep stealing his bread whenever they're hungry. Pretty soon he'll be hungry himself. Or don't you see it that way? What are you, a Republican? The guy was hungry. I'm supposed to grab a hungry man and send him to jail? So he was hungry. He needed to steal two loaves of bread? <sighs> Maybe he's got a big family. Oh, for the lover. Okay, okay, so he was a thief. I should have tripped him. Love is a fickle thing. If someone were to walk up to him right now and ask, how's Diana? Clark would most likely say, Diana? Diana who? Fifth floor, huh? Two more flights. As always, cooking odors, last nights, last weeks, last years, last centuries, are heavy and oppressive in the stairwell. On the fourth floor landing, they meet one of the housewives who lives in the building. Hello, Mr. Kent! Oh, and who is this nice young lady who is with you? <sighs> this is my friend Lois, Mrs. Pelabisky. She's just stopping by for lunch. Oh, I see. That's nice. Mrs. P glances at Lois and gives Clark a sly, old-world wink. <clears throat> have a nice day, Mrs. Pelabisky. You have a lot of friends over, Mr. Kent? With Lois following him along the hallway, Clark takes out his door key. Well? He was here. Look, Kent, this... Wooly has rushed up to Lois from behind the door and thrown his arm around her. <laughs> Casually, she drives an elbow into his stomach. Then she whirls around with a blazing smile. <sighs> Hello, Willie. It's been a long time. <sighs> Maybe not long enough. <laughs> uh, shall we get reacquainted? Willie gestures to a chair at the kitchen table. Coffee? Cup of tea? Clark has some yoo-hoo. What are you doing in New York? You couldn't that wait a minute? No. <laughs> okay, all right. The plan was, I'd hook back up with you, and you'd hook me back up with Dick Sandglass. You've heard? We heard, but not till we got here and saw what's in the papers. Lois doesn't take her eyes from Willie's face. Perfect timing. Yeah, that's what me and Clark have been saying. Dick Sandglass was a good guy. There have been a lot of rumors circulating that he was anything but that. Luthor's doing. Oh, I agree. But they're doing their damage. Removing a pencil and a small notepad from her coat pocket, Lois takes a seat at the kitchen table. So where you've been since you got out of jail? Mexico, for about three weeks. Seemed like a good idea to go where nobody was looking to arrest me, and kind of take stock, figure out what to do next. And you decided to come back here and see Dick Sandglass? You and Dick. The both of you. But yeah, that's what we decided. Why didn't you do this a year ago? We weren't ready yet. He looks drolly, or is it critically at Clark? Lois doesn't seem to register the plural. Well, let's get down to business. First, I want to know how you managed to break out of jail. Then we'll talk about the situation here. She flips through her pad, full of quotes she jotted down during her long interview yesterday with Manhattan DA William C. Dodge, till she finds a fresh page. Do we have a deal? <laughs> Are you sure you're the same Lois Lane that I used to know? Come on, Lois Willie. Do we have a deal? Do we? Yes, we have a deal, Miss Lane. Okay, somebody put a hole through the wall of your cell. A guy in a red cape. Care to enlighten me? Superman. Excuse me? His name is Superman, and he's a buddy of mine in Clark's. Red cape and blue tights. Superman. With no hyphen. Superman is one word. You met him in a boxcar? Somewhere in Oklahoma, and the three of us decided to bum it together. They had discussed it a lot, the story, rehashed and rehearsed it. First down in Mexico, then during the seemingly interminable flight from Sonoito to Albuquerque to Omaha to Philadelphia to New York City. Willie squirmed a lot, embarrassed to be carried scooped up in Clark's arms across the United States. He complained nonstop. He was nauseous, he was freezing. Couldn't Clark fly lower, where the air was a little bit warmer? Once they were holed up in their apartment, they covered every detail of the story they could think of, and agreed that when the time came, Willie would do all of the talking. He could be the storyteller. It made sense and felt safer. Obviously, the first thing anyone was going to ask was how Willie escaped from the Los Angeles County Jail. So it ought to be Willie who answered, especially since Clark would be in no position to speak with authority. After all, he hadn't been there. Clark hadn't had anything to do with that. It was... Superman. And what's Superman's real name? That is his real name. You call some guy Superman? <laughs> is that what you're telling me? That's what I'm telling you, right. We'll say, hey, Superman, get a load of that sunset. Hey, Superman, check out that sweet trick in the bobby socks. 
Look, toots, scoff all you like, but I did get out of jail and there was a hole in the damn wall afterward and a lot of people did see a guy dressed in a blue union suit and a red cape flying all over the place. Scoff on, Lo, but you asked. So you, the four eyes from Kansas, and this Superman from Oklahoma... I don't know if he's from Oklahoma, Lois. We just met him there. You all just wandered around together for how long? A little over a year. Him, Clark, and me. Correct. There it is. The gist of the story. It hasn't been just Willie and Clark. It's been Willie and Clark and Superman. The lie is simple, easy to keep straight. Two becomes three, one becomes two. Will it work? Can it? And who bombed your apartment, Willie? I was thinking Lex Luthor. You think he found out where you were? What, that's not possible? Lex? Mrs. O'Shea grips his elbow gently, barely touches it. It's noon. Don't you think you might want to get up? <sighs> he rubs his forehead with the tips of his fingers. Fully awake now, alert, refreshed. Has Hadorn called? Philip Hadorn, Lex Luthor's personal attorney and one of the best in New York City. Two years ago, he poisoned his first wife in order to marry his secretary. An undiscovered, unpunished homicide that Lex spent $20,000... Midnight exhumation, laboratory forensics, college tuition for all five children of a certain druggist in Chelsea, proving beyond the shadow of a doubt. But the proof will remain locked inside of a safety deposit box so long as Hadorn provides Lex with expert legal counsel. Pro bono, of course. He phoned around ten, yes. But I didn't wake you since he was still waiting to hear from Dodge. He thinks it'll be today, though. Lex tosses off his sheet and blanket. Excellent. <sighs> Twenty minutes later, he is sitting at the kitchen table and reaching for a box of Wheaties when Mrs. O'Shea comes in with a telephone. Hadorn. Well? I see. Done. No chance they'll suddenly change It's the... done. <laughs> call Polly Scaffa and tell him to grab that other monkey and be over here in twenty minutes. Then call the papers. Yes, sir. And say I'll be happy to meet with reporters today at one o'clock. No, make it one fifteen. In City Hall Park. Why not at City Hall? The park, Mrs. O, at the Statue of Civic Virtue. Lex picks up the cereal box and fills his bowl. A square white packet drops out. He plucks it up and nearly tosses it aside. Instead, he tears off a corner and shakes free a small green toy, a rocket ship exhibiting a star-ringed decal transfer that reads, Solar Scouts. Lex is silent for a long time, just looking at the toy. Then he gets up, no longer hungry. While Clark uses up the last of the spiced ham and sliced bread, fixing three sandwiches, Willie has both elbows planted on the kitchen table and his face squeezed between his hands. Tell me it ain't so, please. Wish I could. LaGuardia is getting nowhere on Luther. As Lois has just finished explaining, the special investigation of Lex Luther, announced four weeks earlier by Fiorello LaGuardia, has spluttered into a metropolitan farce generating titters on the street, skepticism in the press, and gag cartoons in The New Yorker. Each and every locale that the late and lately much maligned Richard Sandglass planned to identify as housing one or more of Lex Luthor's felonious enterprises turned out to be completely and unimpeachably legitimate. The alleged brothels in Greenwich Village, Chelsea, and Turtle Bay were just rental apartments, single-family dwellings, and licensed nursing homes. The administrator of one of those hushed residences, a still grieving widow named Seal Stokowski, was not amused when the premises were invaded one morning by a squad of uniformed policemen. In Hoboken, the counterfeit printing operation was only a laundry and dry cleaners. No munitions were found stockpiled in a warehouse on Staten Island, instead it was filled with Persian rugs, and there was no telephone call tapping station on Blofeld Street in Queens, merely a permanent waving establishment. The originals of incorporation papers and real estate transfers, documents Sandglass presumably had photographed with a spy camera, turned up either missing or telling a very different story than the one the slain police lieutenant would have claimed they told. How did Luthor do it? I already told you. He got hold of the file that Dick put together. But how did he manage to undo everything so quickly? He was ready for this. Or at least prepared for it. Wasn't there a copy? Clark slides one plate down in front of Lois, another in front of Willie. You said there were photographs. Where are the negatives? Didn't he keep the negatives? Clark takes a bite from his own sandwich. If he did... If? Listen, farm boy, quit talking when I'm talking. And don't talk with food in your mouth. 
If he did keep a copy, nobody's found it. Did they search his apartment? Of course. Ben went through the whole place the same night Dick's sandglass was murdered. Ben? Ben did? This wouldn't by some chance be the cop you're dating? How do you know who I'm dating? Is it? That's none of your business. But yes. But maybe he didn't keep a copy at home. Maybe someplace else. What about a safe deposit box? If he rented one, nobody's found a receipt. So now what? Well, there's always Superman. Lois takes a mincing bite of her sandwich. He's real, Lois. Uh-huh. He is. You'll see. I can't wait. Do you have any mustard? Lois lifts the top of her sandwich to frown at the spiced ham. Gee, no. When she pushes her plate aside, rejecting lunch, Clark, on top of everything else he's feeling, worrying about, even suffering at this particular moment, is all of a sudden ardently and utterly in love. The barber shop is below sidewalk level on Broadway, just above Canal. The barber is Italian, in his 50s, small and short. He wears lifts on his shoes. He wields a comb and scissors now around Ben Yeager's head. All the steel or I cut your ear. <sighs> ben is drunk, very drunk, sliding down and shifting around in the chair, rolling his head, snoozing off and then flinching awake. Ben's been drunk since this morning, when the mayor of New York himself fired him. He showed up at the office of the special task force charged with investigating Alderman Lex Luthor to find the phones disconnected and a note telling him to report to room 411. He had expected reassignment after this fiasco, but instead he was told to hand in his shield and his gun. <laughs> you don't keep still, I cut your ear. Uh, sorry, Paisan. Ben sits up and squares his shoulders. Look straight ahead at a wall of framed and autographed celebrity photographs. Don Budge, Clyde Beatty, Eddie Arcaro, Joel McRae. You okay? Yeah, sure, sure, I'm fine. You don't look fine. The barber continues to work on the right side of Ben's head. WGBS News Time is 1 p.m. To end insurgency in the Holy Land, British authorities today are burning the homes of Arab terrorists. Emperor Hirohito has once again declared that Japan will continue its war in China until victory is achieved. Local news and weather in a moment, but first, this important word from Jordan Shampoo. Ah, that stuff's no good. <sighs> no? Not so good, no. Embattled Alderman Alexander Luther has called a news conference for 1.15 this afternoon at City Hall Park. No, oh, hold the steel. Shh. With half of his hair barbered and the other half not, Ben Yeager is out the front door. Only a few blocks away from City Hall is the bustling Fulton Fish Market, but over here, the cobblestone street and broken sidewalks are deserted. Identical low brick buildings, former tanneries dating back to the early 19th century, face each other across Water Street. Lex uses a key to let himself into the most decrepit looking one. Inside is a long, freshly plastered room lit by fluorescent tubing on the ceiling. Against the south wall stand more than a dozen robot prototypes, the original LR series, each partly disassembled. Against the north wall, stacked three deep, four high, and numbering over a hundred, are square and softly lustrous metal boxes. Except for the suitcase-style leather grips mounted on the lids, they resemble doorstep milk boxes, the kind provided to customers by local dairies. In a crate nearby are an equal number of small flat radio transmitters and Bakelite housings. Positioned against the east wall and taking up nearly its full length is an electrostatic generator with crackling sparks jumping from electrode to electrode. At a semicircular work table centered in the room, Caesar Caluso is bent over a circuit board no bigger than a playing card. He is applying solder. A twist of smoke rises and breaks when it touches his forehead. Scattered across the tabletop are various transistors, plug fuses, miniature vacuum tubes, a radio frequency oscillator, pipes of different lengths, and a few small black cubes equipped with terminals and ground wires. Well, Lex strolls over to the wall of metal boxes, lifts the hinged lid on one, peeks inside, and shuts it again. Any progress? Oh yes, progress indeed. When Lois asked where was the closest place with a public telephone, Clark said there was a candy store just a block and a half away. Then he offered to walk her there. He didn't want her to, you know, walk past it. Why should I? Is it disguised as a Chinese laundry? Just let me walk you. No, that's all right. No, I insist. So do I. And she left. Clark waited ten seconds. 
Lynn followed her down and out to St. Mark's place. Falling into step beside her, Clark couldn't help but admire her profile. He liked her chin, he liked her throat, he liked the way that her eyebrows arched. She didn't pluck them, did she? It didn't look like it. Can I ask you something? What? I used to be a reporter for the Smallville Herald Progress, that's in Kansas, and I was wondering if you could help me get a job with your newspaper. She rolls her eyes. He likes those, too. I'm serious. <laughs> you don't have to do that. You could have just said, no, you, you can't help me, but you didn't have to laugh in my face. Oh, my. Yes, oh, my. I apologize. I'm sorry. Thank you. Clark points behind her. The candy store. Now you can make your phone call. He turns around and starts back down the block. Kent? He hates it whenever somebody calls him by his last name. I practically just got hired myself. I don't have any clout. Two little boys, one dressed as a pirate, the other as a cowboy, scoot around Lois into the candy store. But for what it's worth, my editor has this standing offer. If you scoop everybody else and bring him a story that makes the front page, he'll hire you on the spot. Yeah? That how you did it? I graduated from journalism school. First in my class. Oh. Yeah. Oh. She walks into the candy store just as the two boys in Halloween costumes walk out, chewing on braided sticks of red licorice. Clark is still waiting when she comes rushing back out and points beyond him. I need that cab! In a moment, Clark has sped 20 yards up the street and is keeping pace with a checkered cab, thumping a hand on the roof. Clark pulls open the back door and waits for Lois to arrive at a trot. You have some legs, mister. He grins, but wishes she'd start calling him Clark. Tell Willie our friend the Alderman is having a press conference right now. That where you're going? City Hall Park. Can I come with you? By the candy store clock, it's 1.25 when Clark plucks a pamphlet-style tourist map from the spinner rack and turns to the index, runs a finger down the list. City College, City Court, City Hall, City Hall Park, H5. Hey, it's not a public library! He buys the map for a dime. Gentlemen and Miss Lane, thank you all for coming. For the past month, as you know, I've been the subject of something called a special investigation. From the start, I have proclaimed both my outrage and my innocence. This afternoon, I have the great pleasure to inform you that Mr. Dodge's task force, a task force assembled at the instruction of Mayor LaGuardia, has completed its work and that I have been found completely innocent of any wrongdoing of any kind. I'm relieved, of course, but more than that, I'm sorrowful. Sorrowful that despite all of my efforts on behalf of the citizens of Greater New York, I could have had my reputation impugned and my freedom imperiled by a series of wild accusations made against me by two members of our city's otherwise superb police department. Officers corrupted by their association with known criminal elements. Lois opens her mouth, and standing 20 yards away and half hidden behind a Dutch elm, Clark watches her close it again. One of these officers, the instigator of the attack against me, was murdered several weeks ago by his own cronies in their narcotics trade. I am speaking, of course, about Lieutenant Richard Sandglass. But we need concern ourselves no longer with him. Almighty God will handle Lieutenant Sandglass if he hasn't already and save our courts the expense. Alderman, just what proof do you have that Lieutenant Sandglass was involved in the narcotics racket? Or anything else illegal? Miss Lane, I'm not finished. No, but we're all supposed to quote you tomorrow and that'll be the proof? If I may continue. Her fellow reporters are glaring at her, most of them. The others seem amused. A just god, as I say, will take care of Lieutenant Sandglass. In the meantime, I take satisfaction in informing all of you that the Lieutenant's partner in mischief and crime and calumny, Benjamin Harold Yeager, was dismissed from duty earlier today. I am fully confident that charges will be brought against Officer Yeager at the proper time. That staggers Lois, but she quickly recovers. Alderman, I'm asking you again, what proof? How do you spell Jaeger, Lex? Sure, Walt, that's a J-A-E-G-E-R. 
My name is spelled J-A-E-G-E-R. And yours, you murdering son of a bitch, is spelled L-I-A-R. Along with everyone else, Clark turns and looks. Ben Yeager's bright yellow hair is shorter, much shorter on one side of his head than it is on the other. And he's drunk. That, thinks Clark, is Lois Lane's boyfriend? Although it seems likely Ben Yeager, tromping through the crowd with his arms thrust out like Karloff's Frankenstein, will hurl himself momentarily at Lex Luthor, Lex himself never budges. Nor do any of the press brigade try to impede or restrain him. They all merely step clear like it's none of their business. No, Clark realizes, not that. Like stepping clear is their business. Which Clark supposes is true, it just isn't true for him. But before he can do anything, what exactly, Clark has no idea, Lois Lane tosses away her pad and pencil... Ben, don't! ...and lunges in front of Jaeger. She grabs his wrists. For a moment, he struggles. It looks as though he'll twist free and send her reeling. Then he just quits. With her right hand still clamped to his wrist and her left pressed gently now to the small of his back, she leads Ben away. From a distance of 50 or 60 yards, Clark hears her. It's going to be all right, honey going to be okay. Honey. For two or three seconds, Clark's heart doesn't beat. Walter, did you get that spelling? <laughs> Clark steps away from the tree and walks over to where Lois dropped her pad and pencil and picks them up. Lux has noticed Clark as looking down at him with an amused expression. Clark coolly stares back and Lux's smile falters. He remembers his type remarks and consults them. I have... <clears throat> Just one more thing to say before I let all of you gentlemen go about your business. From the edge of his eyes, he glances back over at Clark. Clark is still staring at him. Now that this malicious investigation has been concluded and my good name restored, I am announcing today my resignation from the Board of Aldermen, effective immediately. Rex looks back over to the spot where Clark was standing, but Clark is gone. Lex seeks him elsewhere in the press crowd, but no, he's just gone. It's Halloween, and Willie Berg has the blues. What really plunged Willie into full-blown wretchedness was a one-sentence plug in Ed Sullivan's Saturday column for a new exhibit of Bernice Abbott's photographs at the Museum of the City of New York. Back in 1932, Willie had gone there to see Abbott's first one-woman show and was amazed by her pictures of Manhattan's bridges and piers and ferry slips, its car barns and railroad stations, hotels, theaters, flophouses and skyscrapers. Her prints made Willie feel special, like he was onto something. Maybe something permanent. He loved her stuff. Last night, Willie tore Sullivan's column from the paper and circled the item, found a tack and stuck it to the kitchen wall. All done before it dawned on him, he couldn't go to see Bernice Abbott's new exhibition. Was he nuts? He couldn't just waltz into a museum. He's a wanted man. He crawled into bed last night at 8. Now it's 17 hours later, going on 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon, and Willie is still in bed with a creaky back and a full bladder. Clark sticks his head into the bedroom. Don't worry, it's just some kids trick-or-treating. How do you know? Clark squints at him in amusement. Oh, right, those eyes. After Clark is gone and dispensed penny candy into several open paper sacks, Clark returns to Willie's bedside. Why don't you get up? It's a beautiful day. Leave me alone. Want to play Parcheesi? Beat it! Another half an hour goes past, and by this point, Willie knows if he doesn't go to the bathroom soon, he's going to burst. With reluctance, he sits up and swings his legs to the floor. Willie stumbles because his right foot has fallen asleep. He's still wearing yesterday's clothes. After a visit to the bathroom, Willie has limped into the kitchen, where he finds Clark dressed in his Superman costume but it's been newly accessorized with one of Willie's size 34 black belts cinched around his waist. The belt is narrow and braided and has a dull pewter buckle. What do you think? The belt's gotta be wider. I think so too, but in general, you like? Yeah, it's not too bad. You think a belt looks good though, right? Yeah, terrific, but get your own. I will, I'll get one that's a little wider, like you said. More kids. Clark picks up the sack of candy. Hey, you can't open the door dressed like that. Why not? It's Halloween. Anything for Halloween! It's a trio of boys in Brooklyn Dodger uniforms. 
with their mouths all full open. Holy smokes! Who are you supposed to be? Me? I'm the saucer man from Saturn. <laughs> I just had the greatest idea. Clark strides purposely into the bedroom and pulls the sheet off the bed. He starts ripping it into long strips. Clark, what do you think you're doing? Hey! You want to go to that museum, right? Let's go today. Let's go now. You're nuts. I can't go to any museum. I know you can't. Clark starts wrapping one of the strips around the top of Willie's head. But what's to stop the invisible man? It's Halloween, Willie. Don't you get it? Trick or treat. Dress up. <laughs> <laughs> It was a mistake to name her joint sodas. From the night it opened, people have been walking in expecting fountain service, wanting a strawberry milkshake, a chocolate malt. They always want to know, so why is it called sodas? She'll tell them why, because that's her name. Her name is Soda Waters. She was Edith Waters before she joined Harry Seltzer's Carbonated Rhythm Orchestra. It was a joke, of course, but the name stuck. What the heck? She likes it. This afternoon in her club, formerly a billiard hall for coloreds on South Orange Avenue in Newark, New Jersey, she sits alone drinking at the bar. <sighs> Outside, neighborhood children pass by in pairs and bunches dressed up for Halloween. When Soda cabbed over here earlier from her apartment near Five Corners, she brought along a 24-count box of candy cigarettes, and for a while, the first hour or so, she got up and dispensed goodies whenever some trick-or-treaters tapped on the door. But even before the candy was depleted, she quit answering no longer trusting her legs. She is a large woman, nearly 200 pounds, and if she falls, she's liable to fall hard. The club is closed until tomorrow night, and she just might sit here drinking till then. She's tired of everything. It is half past three now as she tips the bottle again, avoiding her own eyes in the mirror. She's never going to see him again. It's been more than a month now, and he's not coming back. The first time she saw him was in late June, a weeknight. He was sitting at a table by himself, and Soda was doing a set with the house band. She was, she recalls, singing I'll Get By. He wasn't especially good-looking, not the kind of man that girls think of as handsome, she thinks now, and smiles, but he had something. And from across the room, she could identify that something as decency. He looked about 50 and was dressed in a dark gray tropical worsted suit. Don't be no copper, she thought, please. Soda didn't talk to him that night, or the next time he came in either, or the time after that. But the time after that, she bought him a drink. He invited her to sit down, told her he loved her voice and how she could put a song across. For the next 45 minutes, they talked about band singers. He knew his stuff. The man knew about popular music, that was for certain, and took delight in all of her stories about musicians she'd known, still knew. The man seemed to take delight in hearing anything Soda wanted to talk about, including her two marriages. Now your turn. Wait, though. You're not a policeman, right? Tell me you're not. That wouldn't be good? That wouldn't be good. And why is that? My daddy was a copper. <laughs> Sounds like a song. <laughs> it wasn't no song, honey. So, you ain't, are you? He shook his head. Now we're cooking. Are we? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think so, too. By that time, they were sitting together on the daybed in Soda's private office at the rear of the club. So what do you do, honey? Can you wait on that one? You on the lamb? No, I can swear to you that I'm not on the lamb. Married? No. Mm. Mm. She kissed him. You're the funniest guy I ever met. I doubt it. You a musician? Mm, no. <laughs> this time, he kissed her back. He returned a week later and sat at his regular table and drank his usual beer and a half. When she'd finished both of her sets and the crowd thinned out, she sent over a bottle of straight bourbon. He stayed till the club shut down at two, then helped her upend chairs on the tables. He stayed the night. Soda fell in love, and he didn't. Or maybe he did, she couldn't tell. But he was always decent to her. Oh my God, was he decent to her. He was the nicest and the tenderest man she ever had met. Told her his first name, but not his last. In time. All in good time. But time had run out, and her sweet loving daddy was gone. Um, honey, could you do me a big favor and keep this in your safe? 
Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Then, he never came back. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The package. That fat envelope with the red flap string he left with Soda the last time they were together. As soon as she is sober enough to walk back to her office and her fool head is clear enough to remember the safe combination, Soda is going to take a look at that envelope and maybe, just maybe, find out Richard's last name. Some other things, too. In addition to the torn sheets wrapped around his head, Willie's disguise, his Halloween costume, includes dark glasses, leather gloves, and a black trench coat. Everyone they pass on the street or ride with on the IRT local identifies him immediately. Hey look, it's the Invisible Man! Whenever someone laughs or makes a friendly crack, Willie responds in a lousy British accent, play-acting Claude Rains. Clark takes delight in how completely emancipated Willie seems to feel. Behind that linen wrapper, he is laughing his head off. An enormous five-story building faced with red brick and trimmed with white marble. The museum is, according to the free booklet Clark picks up, the city's attic, a palatial depository of dioramas depicting events from the purchase of Manhattan Island to the construction of the Empire State Building, and galleries cramped with historical furniture, portraits, costumes, documents, and memorabilia. But Willie makes it clear that he's not interested in any of that old junk. He is here for only one reason. We're here to see Bernice Abbott's photographs. As they follow arrows to the proper gallery, Clark keeps stopping to admire things. A Dutch sleigh, a tally-ho coach, the figurehead from an old clipper ship. He is powerfully affected by it all, but couldn't say why. Following Willie down a long hall, he notices a pair of open doors leading into a raked auditorium. Just inside the entrance, a sign is still posted for a two o'clock lecture long since over. From there to here, from there to home. The immigrant experience. Would you get a move on? I'm coming. From there to here, from there to home. His red cape sailing out in back of him, he puts on a little speed, just a little, and ends up beating Willie to the exhibition gallery. Think you're funny? Well, you're not. Clark slings an arm around Willie's shoulder, and together they go inside and look at pictures of the city. Willie's city. And maybe, Clark thinks, his city too. The name of the exhibition is Metropolis. Seal has not seen Lex Luthor since the evening her poor husband died. She's talked to him on the telephone several times, however, their longest conversation being the one they had a week after Herman's funeral. Mr. Luther, bless his soul, paid for everything, including a granite headstone with a polished area for Herman's name and dates. During that particular conversation, Seal readily agreed to take over the running of one of Mr. Luther's entertainment establishments in Chelsea. And while she initially felt some misgivings about the work, she was in no position to turn it down. The salary was generous. Seal enjoyed operating the house, a four-story, seven-bedroom brownstone on West 23rd Street. And she felt motherly toward the girls, who were mostly Scotch-Irish, and they all behaved themselves. So it was awfully perturbing when just a month ago, she received another call from Lex Luthor, one that lasted only a few seconds. He merely spoke the code word she'd hoped never to hear. Blue. At once, Seal followed the protocols. Immediately upon hanging up the telephone receiver, she hurried downstairs to her office and drew out cash packets and open airplane tickets from the wall safe. She next emptied the house of clients, then summoned her girls to the front parlor, gave them each a thousand dollars and a plane ticket. They were packed, kissed goodbye, and gone by taxicabs in under an hour. Before they'd even left the premises, a crew of carpenters arrived, then a team of movers who carried in a dozen hospital beds and carried out the canopied in sleigh beds. By morning, the first patients were delivered, a contingent of destitute geriatric felons gathered from Lord Only Knew Where. A manager is a manager, Seal knows, and it really shouldn't matter what she manages. But a nursing home just doesn't have quite the zest of a cat house. 47th floor. Seal is surprised to discover that her destination is also that of the four men sharing the car with her. An attractive, slender woman with piled white hair and dressed in a royal blue dress stands waiting in the corridor. She holds a clipboard. The woman presents a formal smile and pulls open the glass door by its tubular handle. Gentlemen, go right in, please. The woman halts her with an expression both mild and despotic. Mrs. Stakowski, would you mind coming with me? She leads Seal down the corridor. I'm Helen O'Shea, Mr. Luther's personal assistant. Seal Stakowski nods. 
having already noted two things. First, Helen O'Shea hesitated ever so slightly before saying personal assistant, as if not entirely sure that's what she is. And second, Mrs. O'Shea has a flat fanny, and no hips to speak of, and her ankles are thick. All right, that makes four things. Seal doesn't like the woman at all. At the end of the corridor, Mrs. O'Shea turns left and brings Seal to an unmarked door. Without waiting, she opens it and ushers Seal inside. Besides Lex Luthor, there are several other men in the office, at a table, on a sofa, but Seal registers only their presence, nothing else. Hands clasped behind his back, Lex is standing at a picture window that looks into the conference room next door. The men Seal came up with in the elevator are seated in there now, at a long mahogany table with another half-dozen men of identical mien. Each is reading through his own legal-looking document or signing it with a pen that must have cost a hundred dollars. The window, Seal assumes, is a mirror on the conference room side. Thanks to Herman, she knows about such things. Mr. Luther, I Seal! Thought... Wonderful to see you again. Oh, it's good to see you again, sir. Beaming, he walks across the office with a rhythmic stride. She thinks he might greet her with a hug, but he does not. He waits for her to put out a hand, because that's what a gentleman does, and then he grips it in both of his. Thank you for coming. I'm only too glad. Congratulations on how everything is worked out. Thank you, Seal. But it's all in the past, as though it happened years ago. Well, I'm not voting for LaGuardia on Tuesday, I can promise you that. <laughs> That's very loyal of you. Excuse me for a moment. Mrs. O, would you go and collect those confidentiality statements and make sure they're all properly initialed throughout and signed? Yes, sir. And Mrs. O, after you've done that, we'll be ready to serve cocktails. She nods curtly and exits. Taking Seal by the hand, Lex conducts her across the office, a huge space carpeted in dark green spongy broadloom. In the carpeting are the impressions where a long desk and several bookcases once stood. On the walls are the outlines of missing paintings or framed photographs. I want to introduce you to some associates, Seal. Three men who seem all of an age, late twenties, early thirties, are huddled around a solid heavy table littered with pads of paper, squares of oak tag, pencils, black crayons, alphabet stencils, brushes, and bottles of India ink. There are half-eaten hamburger sandwiches, too, and cardboard coffee containers. Mounted on the ledge of an easel standing catter corner to the table is a large poster that reads, Introducing the Marvel of 1937. The men look exhausted, ashen, near collapse, and their good clothing is disheveled and wrinkled, speckled with coffee and ketchup and mustard and ink stains. These fellows were once employed by Young and Rubicam Ad Agency, but I convinced them to come work for me, and uh, of course you know Polly Scaffa. He is sitting with another man, a small, olive-skinned man, on the sofa off in a far corner, and partly concealed behind a stack of doorstep milk boxes. Well, Seal guesses they're not really milk boxes, but that's what they look like. Polly, how are you? She will never forgive him for not visiting poor Herman when he was so ill. Nice seeing you again, Seal. She could swat him when he doesn't so much as get up from his seat. But at least his companion shows some manners. And this is Cesar Caluso, my chief engineer and bottle washer. Ahem, signor. <clears throat> After standing and bowing his head, the little man sits back down and refolds his arms across his chest. Seal, won't you take a seat? Lex steers a roller chair around behind her. Oh, thank you, Mr. Luthor. <laughs> now, Seal, I asked you here because I need your help. Mine? <laughs> uh, certainly, I'll do my best, but... I'm going to show you something. And you have to promise you won't say a word about it to anyone. Of course. You can trust me, Mr. Luther. I know that. He pats her on the shoulder like Daddy used to do whenever she'd bring home a good report card. Polly? Immediately, Polly gets up from the couch. <clears throat> Lifting one of those milk box things by a leather handle on its lid, he conveys it across the office. The box doesn't appear to be heavy. The trio of advertising men responding to a scowl from Lex Luther clear a space for it on the table. And may I have a remote control, Caesar, if you don't mind? From the inside pocket of his ill-fitting sport coat, the little Italian removes a flat piece of black plastic about the same dimensions as a Hershey bar and passes it to Lex. Now, Seal, what I am about to show you is, well, think of it as the next essential thing. There are some who believe that the next essential thing, the product that every human being simply must possess, will be a thing called television. But they're wrong. Dead wrong. 
He aims the piece of black plastic in the direction of the milk box. Then he carefully presses the buttons on it in a prescribed sequence. The lid opens, and a post of gleaming nested metal shoots two, two and a half feet straight up from the box. Immediately, the post begins to reconfigure itself. Narrow rods unfold from a dozen grooves. From the rods come other, slimmer, more articulated rods, which in turn are grooved with channels, and from which comes something else. Oh my goodness! It's like a gigantic Swiss army knife. But instead of a couple of blades and a nail file, a screwdriver, a toothpick, an orange peeler, a tweezers, and a key ring, it contains, neatly and miraculously within itself, <gasps> a mechanical man! When completely unfolded and self-assembled, it is 27 inches tall. It steps from the box onto the table. With its red eyes blinking, its arms moving forcefully up and down, its fingers clenching, its knees bending, legs pumping, it does a kind of martial parade in place. Mr. Luther, you built a mechanical man! How wonderful! He presses another sequence of buttons, and it stops marching. Then another sequence. What a marvelous... It's not a toy, Seal. Oh, I wasn't going to say that, sir. But yes, yes she was. That was exactly what she intended to call it. It's the next essential thing. This is our very basic model. In addition to being equipped with both commercial and shortwave radio, it contains a library of classic novels. Oh. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And of course, it can... Lex reaches over, picking up a pad of fool's cap from the table. He flips the top sheet over, finds what he's searching for, and then squints to decipher handwriting not his own. It can do... Uh, let's make that perform, shall we? It can perform a multitude of household chores. Run the vacuum, fire the furnace, feed the dog, clean the cat box. Our luxury models are not only taller, but smarter. They can prepare meals, from plain fare to a five-course banquet. Mm, five-course banquet. How about we say fine dining instead? From plain fare to fine dining. One of the admin leans forward and puts his elbows on the table and his face between his hands. Seal, meanwhile, notices that the little Italian man is doing a slow burn, but trying to contain it. His lips keep moving in and out as he fixes Lex Luthor with a baleful stare. What is going on? And why, Seal asks herself, is she here? Now Lex points behind her with a pad of paper. Those are the luxury models. Seal turns, and what she sees jolts her again. <gasps> In the conference room, on the other side of the glass, a pair of six-foot-tall mechanical men is gliding around the table with pitchers and cocktail shakers, ambidextrously filling glasses with martinis, Manhattans, Rob Roy's, and whiskey sours. The gentlemen assembled there, whose demeanor hitherto seemed so worldly and rigid, look as wonderstruck now as little boys at their first circus. Seal? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Luther. I'm just, uh, <laughs> flabbergasted. Excellent. Very excellent. It's the reaction I was hoping for, and the one I expect from everyone, in due time. Lex pointedly looks at one of the advertising men, the one introduced to Seal earlier, as the director of market research. Mr. Luther, you said something about needing my help, but I don't see... It's quite simple, dear lady. I need your expertise. Sir? These gentlemen have been working on a campaign to launch this marvelous creation of mine, to introduce it to the world. Well, first to New York and then to the world. But they're still not quite on target. In the meantime, one crucial question remains. What do we call this marvel of 1937? Call it? You referred to it as a mechanical man, but that's hardly catchy, is it? Our friends here in the ad biz keep urging me to simply call it the Luther, as if it's an automobile. The Chrysler, the Studebaker, the Luther. But it's not an automobile seal. No, it's the next essential thing. And our friend Polly, taking his cue from Mr. Walt Disney, wants me to name it Rudy, as if it were a cartoon character. Rudy Robot. But it's not a cartoon character, Seal. No. And Mr. Caluso over there, he wants me to call it the Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> Sneaking another glance at Caesar Caluso back on the sofa, Seal can see high color rising in his throat, his cheeks. He looks capable of homicide. All ridiculous names. 
completely inappropriate. But the problem has become suddenly grave, Seal. Grave, sir? Extremely, because I have a room full of investors next door with millions of dollars at their disposal. Millions that I intend to use for the manufacture of millions of robots. But what do we call them? He taps the basic robot's head. Quite a problem. But then it dawned on me. Who is better at this very thing than Seal Stokowski? Mr. Luther, I don't... <laughs> you, dear lady, are going to christen the next human necessity. Come up with the next household name. Right here, right now. You. M me? B -b -b Mr. Luther, I don't know anything about don't it. Don't be so modest, Mrs. Smokin' Dynamite Fall Arsenal of Values. But, sir, I didn't... Who could ever forget your Crown Prince, your Medley, your Hoopla, your Salvo, your Trinito Deluxe? Wonderful names, all of them. Names so good, so perfect, they emptied out an entire warehouse seal. But that was Herman. Mr. Luthor, Herman came up with all of those names. I just pasted up the catalog. Please, stop. I don't appreciate false modesty. So... What do we call it? I'm expected next door in two minutes, Seal. I need a product name. Give it to me. Sir, please. A name. The perfect name. Miss Luthor, I swear to you, Herman made up those names for the catalogs. He enjoyed it. He had nothing else to do. Seal. I think I know what Herman was and was not capable of. He did the word scramble every day in the paper. Herman was very good with words. It was a hobby. Oh, Seal, he was a common thug. He couldn't even spell medley. It's as if Lex Luthor just struck her in the stomach. She can't catch her breath. Seal, the perfect name, please. We have less than two minutes. You have less than two minutes. Seal turns her head and looks at him dead on. And she knows, instantly she knows, that her husband did not pass from his cancer. Seal, I'm waiting. She shakes her head. Still waiting. The name that tens of millions of people will utter day after day for the next hundred years. I'm waiting. Lex Bob. I didn't hear you, Seal. I, I, I said, call it the Lex Bot. For a long time, Lex remains crouched beside her, huh? his hand painfully squeezing her shoulder. <laughs> the Lexbot! The Lexbot! Lexbot! The Lexbot! Did you hear that, gentlemen? It's the Lexbot, the marvel of 1937. Seal's shoulders move helplessly up and down. Very good. Seal watches him type L-E-X-B-O-T on a cramped keyboard attached to a small die-cut device. He yanks down hard on a side lever and out shoots a small lozenge of metal. He holds it up between his thumb and forefinger. Lexbot, thank you, Seal. Mrs. O'Shea will show you out when you've composed yourself. By the time the gentlemen from the Ford Motor Company, the DuPont Corporation, the Union Banking Corporation, the L. Henry Schroeder Banking Company, and the investment firm of Brown Brothers Harriman leave the conference room late this Sunday afternoon, all of them are tipsy and swaying and utterly convinced that Lex Luthor's robots, God bless them, make the world's most perfect martinis. The men have become enchanted by the machines, as well as by their profit potential. Television? Feh. In combination, they pledged a total of $12 million for the construction and outfitting of three Lexbot factories. Congratulations. Still seated at the head of the conference table, Lex is turning a small black socketed cube around and around with the fingers of his right hand. Thank you, Mrs. O'Shea. He sets the cube down in front of him and picks up a remote control device. When he presses a sequence of buttons, one of the two luxury Lexbots in the room steps away from the wall and glides to the table. And tomorrow, I'm expecting to do equally well. Even better. In the morning, Lex is scheduled to meet with executives from across the Atlantic. As Lex realized the day he first saw Caesar Caluso doodling on a pad in that lecture hall, nobody can resist a robot. Nobody. <laughs> Mrs. O watches Lex get up and open a small panel in the back of the machine. He snugly fits the cube inside, shuts the panel, then walks over to the long mirror on the wall, reaches up, and pulls down a blackout shade. If you don't need me anymore... Now, 
or entirely. He stabs in another sequence of buttons on the remote control device. I'd like to go home. You do that, Helen. Have Polly take you in his car. And tell Caesar I want to have a word with him upstairs in ten minutes. And what about the admin? Order them more coffee and sandwiches. You may leave, Mrs. O'Shea. Yes, sir. Congratulations again. Lex, I think we might have a problem with Seal Stakowski. I didn't like the way she looked Don't at you Don't worry about Seal. Just go. Lex presses a red button. Suddenly, the 12-foot-long table is hurled across the conference room. It smashes against the far wall, blasting cracks through the plaster. Mrs. O sticks her head back into the room. She is pale. She looks at the table, its surface now scorched and blistered. Here and there, tiny flames struggle in patches of varnish, then wink out. <laughs> Lex manipulates the remote control again. The Lexbot swivels, moves back to its carrying case, steps into it, and stands motionless. With yet another poke of Lex's finger at a button, a gray one this time, it disassembles itself, turning back into a gleaming metal post. The top section of the post slides down, nesting in the section below it. When the top of the post is flush with the ledge of the carrying case, the lid satisfyingly slaps shut. Good. You're still here. Mrs. O, before you leave, ask Polly to return these two boxes to Water Street. Is this Lois Lane? Yes. The reporter? Yes. I, I hope you don't mind me calling you at home, Miss Lane. I called the Daily Planet, but you weren't there, and they wouldn't give me your exchange. But it's in the directory, you know. Yes, I know. Who is this? Miss Lane, I'd like to speak with you about Lex Luthor. I read your stories in the paper, and I think we should talk. And your name is? Oh, I'm sorry. It's Seal. Seal Stakowski. Mrs. Herman Stakowski. Sticky's wife? His widow, Miss Lane. Do you think we might get together? Could you hold on for just one second? Lois gently closes the bedroom door, where Ben Yeager is asleep in his undershirt and skivvies. Of course we can get together, Mrs. Stakowski. Tonight? While the Invisible Man is making his tenth circuit of the Special Exhibition Gallery, the Saucer Man from Saturn, who by this time has had his fill of Bernice Abbott's photographs, drifts back out into the corridor and strolls around the museum by himself. Walking from room to room, floor to floor, cursorily inspecting displays of 18th and 19th century furniture, costumes, theater posters, and the like. George Washington's boudoir slippers, Alexander Hamilton's comb and brush, a recreation of John D. Rockefeller's bedroom, circa 1880. The elastic band on Clark's black mask is uncomfortably tight, and the mask itself feels constricting, making his cheeks sweat and feel slimy, and his eyebrows itch. Strolling back into the main hall, Clark finds a cushioned bench. For a while, he watches people, mostly families with small children. Some of the children are dressed for Halloween. None of the adults are. The Invisible Man finally appears. You ready to go? By now, it is late afternoon. The temperature has fallen sharply, and there's a nippy wind. But that doesn't bother Clark, and Willie has his trench coat. They decide to walk for a while, turning south at Fifth Avenue and heading back downtown. So I guess you enjoyed the show? Yeah. You okay? I'm fine. You don't sound fine. You seem... I don't know. You sure you're okay? I'm fine, Clark. God! Without any conscious thought or decision, they enter Central Park at 99th Street onto a footpath that winds past baseball fields and running tracks. What are you thinking about? Nothing. You're all mopey again. I'm not mopey. Why do you always have to talk all the time? Willie picks at the cotton strip below his bottom lips and irritably tugs it down. Hey, come here. Clark pinches hold of one of Willie's coat sleeves, pulling him off the path onto a graveled running track. Just stand here. He releases Willie's sleeve and stands beside him, two feet apart. Race you. I don't want to race anybody. I won. You lost. What? I just ran all the way around the track. Didn't you see me? <laughs> You want to race again? You're full of it, Ken. You didn't run around any track. You're not that fast. What did I do? Did I do something wrong? <sighs> I'm sorry, all right? You don't have to apologize. Just tell me what's wrong. What's wrong? I mean, what's wrong now? Did something happen at the museum? Those pictures were great, weren't they? Yeah, sure. So? That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do again, but I can't. And I won't, ever. That's not true. Oh, you're so sure? How am I supposed to get my life back? 
I thought that's what I was for. You willing to snatch Lex Luthor and, and threaten to throw him off the Brooklyn Bridge? Maybe. Of course we can get together, Mrs. Stakowski. Tonight? Would nine o'clock be too late? I, I know it's silly, but I have some programs I like to listen to. Nine o'clock, then. And where would you like to meet? My house? Would that be all right? More than all right, Mrs. Stakowski. Seal. Let me just grab something to write with, Seal, so I can get your address. Mrs. O'Shea presses a finger on the hook and holds it down for a count of three, then releases it. She doesn't need to hear any more of the recording. She knows perfectly well where Seal Stokowski lives. Pressing and releasing the telephone button once more, she is reconnected with a phone tap supervisor on duty that evening. The rerouting station has been relocated from the split-level home in Corona, Queens, to a liquor store basement in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Thank you again. Certainly. You can erase it now. Of course. For a minute, Mrs. O stands mulling in the living room of Lex Luthor's apartment, which is hers too, really, at the Waldorf Astoria. Holly, do you have any idea where Mr. Luther is? No. Why? Something the matter? She glances at the small clock on the mantel. It's a few minutes past seven. I need you to drive over here now and pick me up. What's going on? Polly, hang up. Get into your car and drive over here now. Since when do you start giving me orders? Now, Polly. Pop, Pop, don't you want to look at this? I think you'll get a kick out of it. After dropping off Mrs. O'Shea at the Waldorf Astoria, Polly drove down to Water Street like the boss said, but instead of leaving both robots there, he left only one and took the other home with him. He figured the old man would enjoy seeing it. When Polly was 11, his pop bought him an erector set, but he couldn't assemble even the most rudimentary bridge or ferris wheel, so the old man claimed it for his own and played with it for years. Pop, look! Polly has some difficulty now recalling the proper sequence of buttons. He's never used the remote control device before, just watched Mr. Luther. The lid won't open. Finally, though, it does. But once the metal pole rises up, a lot more slowly than it ought to, he can't make the Lexbot assemble itself, which is the best thing about it in Polly's opinion. Now he's jabbing buttons randomly, frustrated that he's such a klutz, annoyed that his father isn't responding. Doesn't he have the common courtesy to wake up and pay some attention to his only son? But why should tonight be any different? At this annoying sound from inside the box, Mr. Scaffa finally opens his eyes. What the hell are you doing? What's that thing? Why'd you bring that thing inside? All right, now he wakes up. Just in time to see Polly looking stupid. Well, it's a robot, Poppy. Wait, you'll see. What are you telling me, robot? What are you bringing that in here for? Hey, Pop, look. It opens up and turns into this big robot. Polly scowls, jabbing more buttons. The palm of his right hand so slick, the remote control housing is sliding all over the place. The box, sitting on the living room rug with its two feet steel pole sticking out, begins to vibrate so tremulously that it bounces several inches to the left, then vibrates further in a half circle. Put that away. I want to listen to Edgar Bergen. Barbara Stanwyck's going to be on. I got to go back out, Pop. Good. Put on the radio before you leave. Yeah, sure. Polly looks at the remote control in his hand, at the open box on the floor, at the gleaming metal pole, the unassembled Lexbot. This is positively the last time he's going to do anything nice for the old bastard. It's just not worth it. He tosses the remote control on the telephone table. <coughs> the Lexbot starts shooting out appendages and sub-appendages, building its own bulk, assembling itself at twice the speed it ordinarily does. Polly doesn't like the sounds it keeps making. Turn it off! It's a robot, Pop! See? Isn't it great? Everybody in the world's gonna own one! <coughs> When the high back of Pop's armchair bursts apart, the old man flings himself forward as though ejected. And in that way, although he bangs his elbow and sprains an ankle when he hits the floor, Mr. Scaffa saves himself from serious injury. Then, the entire chair erupts into flames. Polly goggles at the tall Lexbot in his living room. Since when is it supposed to do that? Walking down Broadway, Clark can't help grinning at all of the vaudeville and radio theaters they pass. The first-run movie houses, the restaurants and nightclubs, the legitimate theaters lining the side streets, the Continental, the Hollywood, the Capitol, Lindy's, Jack Dempsey's, the Cotton Club, the Paradise, the Gaiety, the Fulton, the Schubert. Holy cow! George M. Cohan, Catherine Cornell, Fanny Bryce, Orson Welles, and Julius Caesar. Clark is dazzled. 
by the electric lights and the walls of ever-shifting colors, by the blinking signs for chewing gum, beautiful girls, razor blades, by the pulse of inexhaustible energy, by the crowds, by the crush. Would you come on? I want to show you something. Let's walk. Five minutes later, Willie plants himself in front of a padlocked accordion gate pulled across the front of a pawn shop. This is what I wanted to show you. This is that pawn shop? Yeah, the sign used to say Chodashes. Now it says, Manhattan Hawk, we pay cash for gold. Clark peers through a chink in the grating, studying the guitars, knives, pocket watches, and harmonicas on haphazard display in the window seat. Narrowing his eyes, the pupils turning to vertical slits, he takes in the wardrobes and bureaus and china closets on display inside, the rolled-up carpets, feathered quilts, and cruel bedspreads, the steamer trunks and Chinese screens. Musical instruments, saxophones, cornets, trumpets, banjos, violins hang from hooks on the wall. A big brass national cash register, the glass-fronted showcase, deep shelves behind it that climb to the pressed tin ceiling. You think that Luther guy still owns this place? Think it's still a front? Where'd you learn about fronts? And how should I know? I bet he does. Clark bends down, makes a sharp move, and rolls the gate back just enough to squeeze through. What are you doing? The pawn shop door swings open. Clark smiles over his shoulder at Willie. Then he's gone. Now he's back, pulling the door shut, sliding the gate back, grinning broadly, and passing Willie Berg a bulky 4x5 speed graphic camera, flash gun attached. You're nuts. You're nuts. You are completely and totally nuts, and I'm gonna kiss you. Don't, okay? Let's just get out of here. I can't believe you did that. Let's go. Oh, oh. Claire can't bring himself to tell Willie that he left a $20 bill back on the ledge of the cash register. He hopes $20 covers it. The moment Cesar Caluso, carrying a battered-looking satchel, walks into the small office that Lex maintains on the 52nd floor of the Chrysler building, his eyes dart to the file folder on the desk blotter. His eyebrows inch up, but otherwise his facial expression remains the same as always, blandly furious. You seem a little surprised, Caesar. Didn't I promise you I'd have it? You'll excuse me, sir, if I don't trust you. No, no, I don't believe I will excuse you. I'm a man of my word. You've given me what I asked you to deliver, and now I'm delivering you this. He taps the folder and then opens the cover. Inside are slightly more than a dozen photographic prints, face down as a courtesy. There is also a strip of negatives, as well as a banker's check made out to Caesar Caluso in the amount of $500,000. I'll be sorry to see you go, Caesar, but a deal is a deal. The machines are magnificent. Of course they are. Since he came into the office and stopped, Caluso has not moved one step closer to the desk. Shall we have a drink? I'd like to propose a toast. No. Thank you. Lex sits back in his chair, pressing his palms together, steepling his fingers. You're more than welcome to stay on. I think not. I thought not. Well then, shall we make the exchange and bid each other farewell? Lex gets up and comes around from behind the desk. Everything is in the satchel? Everything. And naturally the schematics, etc., are all authentic? Would you know if they weren't? <laughs> You'd be surprised, Caesar. So why don't you just wipe that little sneer off your face? Lex reaches behind him and without looking picks up the folder, holds it out. With a dubious scowl, Caluso takes it. He hesitates for a second before passing off the school bag. What are your plans now, Caesar, if you don't mind my asking? I do mind, and my plans are no business of yours. Not entirely true. I'll remind you of those non-disclosure forms you signed. They're quite binding. Good night, Mr. Luther. And goodbye. Five hundred thousand dollars is no paltry sum. Compared to what you'll earn from my machines? This has never been about earnings, my friend. Oh no, then what has it been about? Lex's eyes flash briefly, and he smiles. And he walks Caluso to the lobby. 
My dear Caesar, by summer next year, by my conservative estimation, there will be at least 10 million Lexbots in circulation worldwide. Each one, thanks to the little black cube, under my absolute control. Secretly recording conversations, filming scenes in the boardroom, the bedroom, and the situation room. Memorizing ledgers, secret codes, secret formulas. Spying on secret kisses, secret deals. Recording labels of prescription drug bottles, the combinations to wall safes. Oh, yes! And the list of things just goes on. And by this time next year, there'll be 140 million Lexbots. Playing music, playing cards, doing dishes, doing homework, doing the taxes, driving limousines in the family Ford, keeping people company. I could have Hitler strangled in his sleep. Or Einstein. I'll blackmail everyone from boot blacks to prime ministers, from Bing Crosby to the Pope. Loot the crown jewels, bankrupt Warner Brothers, sink the Normandy. And in a couple of years, there'll be a Lex spot for every 10 people on Earth. And that's when the fun will really begin. Kidnap 1,000 babies, 10,000 maybe, in one fell swoop. Assassinate every male over the age of, what, 18, 21? 35, or maybe I'll just let the robots run amok. And you know what, Caesar? There will be no one to stop me. The elevator doors open. I think we're done. Lex grins all of a sudden, snatches the file folder with one hand, <gasps> and shoves with the other. <gasps> there is no elevator car behind Caesar. Just cables. Carl Crusada appears from behind the fire door and joins Lex at the lip of the elevator. Together, they look down. Good work, Carl. Did it give you any trouble? Not really, sir. No. Excellent. In Lois Lane's apartment, Ben Yeager is stretched out on the sofa, haphazardly flipping through a back issue of Life with hunting spaniels pictured on the cover. Lo, what are you doing? You feel like getting something to eat? Lois? No answer. He kicks off his shoes, crosses his ankles. Then immediately jumps up and goes to the window. Ben figures he's going crazy. If he doesn't think of something pretty soon to salvage his reputation, his job, and come on, pal, admit it, his girlfriend, he is definitely headed for the nut house. Hey, Lois, you want me to answer that? Hello? Hello? As he is turning away from the nook, an address, scribbled hastily on a notepad, catches Ben's eye. On at least two occasions, he drove Lieutenant Sandglass to that same address in Turtle Bay and waited in the car while the lieutenant went inside to speak with Herman Stokowski on his deathbed, 39th Street between 2nd and 1st. He grabs up the pad and crosses the living room into the bedroom. Just where the hell are you going tonight? Lois is taking her peacoat off a hanger in the closet. To work. It's what I do, Ben. I work. Do you mind? He holds up the telephone pad. Who gave you this address? I'll thank you to leave my stuff alone. Now, why don't you go sulk some more? You're so good at it. Meanwhile, I'm going to work. At the corner of 29th and Broadway, Clark draws himself up, faces east, and frowns. You hear that? What? Clark flips the black mask up over his forehead. I just heard Lois. What? Willie looks up and down Broadway. You got that skirt on the brain. She doesn't live around here, does she? As if you don't know. How would I? I must have told you. Never. She lives right over there. He points down 29th Street. Tugging the mask back down over his eyes, Clark turns east. What did she say? You heard her say something, really? What did she say? That she's going to work. How come? You're asking me how come I want to go with you to see Sticky's wife? Damn, Lois, this could be it. What we're looking for. Ben stands blocking the door. Get out of my way. I can't believe you weren't going to tell me that Seal called. Ben, you've been acting like a jerk, and I don't need some jerk messing up my interview, okay? I know what I'm doing. I can take care of myself. Oh, yeah? And what if it's a trap? A trap? Who do you think you are, Doc Savage? Doc Savage? Lois knows about Doc Savage. Who the heck is Doc Savage? Shh. They're standing on the sidewalk opposite Lois Lane's apartment building. She's going to see somebody named Seal who lives someplace called Turtle Bay. That's just east of here. Runs uptown. Who's Seal? I don't know. She's Sticky's wife. Sticky? Lois said Sticky's wife? That's what she... Hold on. They're coming down. Willie tugs Clark up the steps of the apartment house behind them and into the unlit vestibule. Moments later, Lois and Ben come out and turn left. 
and begin walking toward Madison Avenue. Let's go! Who's Sticky? But Willie is out the door and down the steps, turning to his right and moving fast. <gasps> Who's Sticky? The guy that might have shot me. Now come on if you're coming. Shake a leg, saucer man! <gasps> Mrs. O was angry enough when it took Polly Scaffa more than twice the time she estimated it should have to drive from his flat to the Waldorf Astoria. But then she found out why. Who gave you permission to bring one of those things home with you? I didn't think there'd be a problem. Polly tried to control his own anger by squeezing the wheel and driving hunched way over it. And he wouldn't look at Mrs. O. Where is it now? In the luggage compartment. Is it back in its- Yes, it's back in its box. But you're missing the point. What the hell did it do? You see what I'm saying? It blew up my chair. I thought these things were supposed to mix drinks and play music. So I'm thinking, maybe there's something wrong with that stupid guinea's machine. Some flaw, like. We should tell the boss. How on earth did he ever find you? Lady, you'll give me a pain in my neck. Do you think you could put on a little speed? It's already 8.30 thanks to your robot demonstration. I want to be in and out before her company arrives. I thought you called the skirt's house and she was still home. I'm assuming she was if her boyfriend was there, but I can't know for sure. It was 20 minutes before 9 when they turned off 2nd Avenue into East 39th Street. There. That's the house. I know the house, lady. I've only been inside it 2,000 times. She put a hand on his knee before he had the chance to open his door. You can wait here. I'll go in. You brought me all the way from Brooklyn so you can do the job? Why didn't you just take a taxi? Because taxi drivers can be questioned about fares. Then you could've walked. I'll be right back. You got a weapon? I don't need one. Seal outweighs you by 50 pounds. He pulled up his shirt and removed a 45 caliber automatic from the waistband of his trousers. Take this. I said I don't need a weapon. In Seal's kitchen, she hears the oven timer go off, which means the Toll House cookies she baked to serve to Lois Lane are done. Seal transfers the cookie sheet to a trivet on the counter. In his cage, the African parrot watches her. Herman says hello. Herman says hello. Ah! Herman says hello. I know he does, darling. Ah! Herman says hello. Herman says hello. Herman taught Zulu to say that so that Seal would know he was thinking of her on those long days and nights when he was away from home working for Lex Luthor. Herman was no saint, but as a hubby, the man was peerless. She goes back into the living room and sits down to wait. When she thinks about what she is about to do, a sharp pain just below her sternum takes Seal's breath away. Maybe she won't answer the door when Lois Lane arrives. Maybe she'll return to work tomorrow. No. She saw something in those eyes today that scared her half to death. Seal gets up to go put the coffee on. She glances at her wristwatch. It's only a quarter of nine, and she told that girl to come by after nine. Rubbing her palms against her skirt, she goes and answers the door. Mrs. Helen O'Shea stands in the vestibule. Good evening, Seal. The blow from Mrs. O'Shea shatters the cartilage in Seal's nose and sends her staggering backward. Before Seal can recover from the shock, Mrs. O locks both hands around her throat. Kneeling squarely upon Seal's chest, Mrs. O removes one hand from her throat and snatches hold of her hair. Now she is both strangling Seal and hammering the floor with the back of her skull. Summoning what little strength she has left, Seal's fingers scrabble till the tip scrape against the leg of a small drop-leaf table. She pulls the table toward her, then whirls it down like a club. A deep gash opens above Mrs. O's right eye, and she loses teeth. And Seal is quickly on her feet, bracing herself against the Morris chair and shaking her head to clear it. Anger burns up the back of her neck. She's never felt this furious, this crazy furious. Probably the closest she ever came to it before was 30 years ago, age 14 in the 8th grade. A rainy day in April when she failed three tests, forgot her lunch, and then was called without provocation a dumb Pollock by Geraldine Walsh, hands down the stupidest girl in her class. <coughs> Seal kicked Geraldine Walsh, too, when she was down on her knees. <coughs> Although not nearly as many times as she kicks Mrs. O, or with anything close to the ferocity. <coughs> Face flushed, she takes a step back, intending to land one final, perfect, and incapacitating blow. 
But when she lashes out with her right foot, somehow she turns it. When it strikes flesh, an acute and stabbing pain flares through Seal's ankle and radiates to her groin. Even with a broken foot, even with her nose swollen, Seal is taking great satisfaction in this. Mrs. O pushes with her hands, managing to lift the upper half of her body. Her lips are balloon-like, blood streams from her mouth. Her eyes find Seal's. You think you're great? You think you're so great? Guess what, girly? You stink! You stink on ice! There are droplets and thick strings of blood clotted in Mrs. O's white hair. I... What? I can't hear you! You want to say something? Speak up, you mick piece of... Seal, I'm surprised at you. You know what Mr. Luther thinks about that kind of talk. Paulie Scaffa is standing now in the arched entryway to the living room. He looks at Mrs. O down on the floor, raising his eyebrows when he sees the bloated ruins of her lips. Then he looks at Seal, the raw scratches on her face, the broken nose, the bruises on her throat. Kill her, Polly. Oh, I thought you wanted to handle this. Kill her. <coughs> the 45 automatic is silver-plated and looks brand new. Polly, no, please, Polly, you were Herman's partner. Don't hurt me. Please. Herman loved you. Eh, I wouldn't go that far, Seal. We got along okay. Kill her, Polly. <coughs> Shoot her. Polly, please. You ate Thanksgiving dinner here how many times? Please. Seal, I hate to tell you this, but I never really liked you that much. <laughs> Polly turns the gun on Mrs. O. <laughs> you think that's funny? Here's something even funnier. I don't like you either. Herman says hello. Herman says hello. Ah! Polly considers shooting the damn parrot, too, but that would just gum up his brilliant idea. He shot Mrs. O once in the stomach so it hurt, then once at close range between the eyes. He's almost sorry Mrs. O is dead, because he really wants to rub his idea right in her snooty face. <gasps> oh, thank God, Polly. I knew you wouldn't hurt me. He smiles at Seal, then walks over and frowns at her broken nose. Oh, that must have hurt. We'll have to see about getting that fixed up. Polly bends down of her seal's dead body, lifts her right hand, presses her pinky third and second fingers around the grip of the 45 and her index finger through the trigger guard. When he lets her hand fall, the gun drops where it might have fallen naturally to the floor. He's quite certain the cops in the press will flag this as a forbidden love turns fatal thing. There hasn't been one of those in the news for a while. One murder, one suicide, and one hell of a brawl beforehand. Herman says hello. Ah! Herman says hello. Hello to you too, Herman. I sent you your lovely wife. Hope you appreciate that, Pally. He turns out all the lights before shutting the outside door, which locks behind. Across the street, a man and a woman are standing in deep shadow, and Polly figures them for a couple on a date. He hurries to his automobile, but as soon as he starts to get in, everything turns bad. Polly, wait up! I need a word with you! Ben Yeager is coming into the street, and there goes Polly's beautiful lesbian sweetheart's angle. He is so chagrined, it's like some moron piping up after you've worked your way through an entire joke and spoiling your punchline, that Polly yanks out a revolver and shoots Yeager in the chest. Then he jumps behind the wheel. Glancing into the side view mirror, he sees a woman, has to be that Lois Lane, run out and stoop down beside Jaeger. She looks toward the car, and her eyes meet Polly's in the side mirror. That decides it. He steers away from the curb, twists the wheel, making a U-turn, and heads for the woman with Jaeger. But less than 10 feet away from its targets, the car stops with such suddenness that Polly slams against the steering wheel hard. Something breaks inside of his chest. The front tires are spinning, the rubber burning, great chunks splatting off to bounce freely down the street. The rear wheels are still spinning too, but they are no longer touching blacktop. Polly lurches again as the car tips forward. Polly doesn't know what's going on, but whatever it is, it's not good. He twists around in his seat, and something sharp inside his chest pierces something soft, which bursts and starts to leak. He manages, nevertheless, to extend his right arm with his revolver. There is now a big hole punched through the bridge of the guy's black mask and two angry red welts on his forehead, but he's still there holding back the damn car. 
Now it rises at a steeper angle, and that Bakelite remote control device lands right into Polly's lap. He snatches it up, haphazardly pushing buttons. Clark Kent is more than passingly familiar with robots. In high school, he was a voracious reader of the scientific fiction stories he found in dime pulps at Pinky Wargo's cigar shop on South Main Street. The types of stories Clark liked most were about either alien invasions or robots. And, of course, a good many of the movie serials that Clark enjoyed as a young teenager had nifty robots shuffling through them. So, yes, Clark Kent is more than just passingly familiar with robots. Clark's fingers are curled under the rear bumper, and he is still holding the street coupe lifted a foot and a half off the ground. The rear tires spin futilely. There's a flash of red light, and Clark is blown out of his boots, literally, and sent hurtling backward toward First Avenue, across First Avenue, headed for the East River. He shoots down East 39th Street at a velocity in excess of a Major League fastball. Half of the threads that have kept the big red S zone into place have dissolved into ash. Clark smashes into the rocky bluff below into the south of the Tudor City apartments and is stunned into unconsciousness. As Clark is flung back down 39th Street, a hand clamps firmly down on Lois's shoulder and spins her. Willie Berg thrusts a press camera at her. Hey, take this. Now run for it, kid. Run! He shoves her away from Polly's Nash toward the curb, but she freezes in horrified fascination. <coughs> Willie scoops up Ben Yeager in a fireman's carry. Farther down the block, an English oak bursts into flame. The front stoop and enormous bay of a Gilded Age house explode into chunks of brownstone, glass, and weatherboard. Suddenly, coming from the robot, Ronald Coleman's voice recites the first sentence of Lois Lane's favorite childhood novel. My father's family name being Pirip, and my Christian name being Philip. My infant tongue could make of both names. Nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. Lois turns her head, and what she sees now, spinning around and around in the street, looks like the bastard child of an Electrolux and a knight in shining armor. So I called myself Pip, and came to be called Pip. A low brick wall explodes, a lawn fountain, a Ford Cabriolet. Then, Polly's Nash Lafayette blows up in front of them. Lois, come on! Finally, Lois and Willie both run from the hellish scene. While Carl Crusada was in the seminary, he knew he was nothing but a phonus balonus, an imposter postulant whose professed piety and so-called religious vocation were just means to an end. The end being safety in a world gone smash, a roof over his head, three squares a day, and clean clothes on his back. Although the clothing God knew left something to be desired. Being a parish priest was okay. He played a lot of basketball with the boys at St. Rocco's, always had time for an afternoon nap, and he got to hear confession. Hands down, it was the most interesting of the sacraments, although it quickly destroyed any lingering illusions that Carl still held regarding human beings. As he chauffeurs Lex Luthor this evening, Carl regales him with tales from the confessional box, and Mr. Luthor nods and smiles at everything. Naturally, Lex initiated the conversation. Carl wouldn't have dreamed of initiating anything when it came to the boss. For almost three hours they've been motoring around with no destination. Midtown, Uptown, Harlem, Inwood. Now they were on the drive back down Broadway. <laughs> you know, this guy used to come in every few months, a local committeeman that everybody liked because he was always taking baskets of food and stuff to the poor. He'd come in, kneel down, and go, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been ten weeks since my last confession. I had impure thoughts fifteen times, I lost my temper five times, and I strangled another prostitute last Thursday. You know how the Daily News would print all those scare stories about the white glove killer? This was the guy. <laughs> Human beings. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're something else we are. Yes, you are. At 22 minutes past 9, Carl checks the dashboard clock. Lex decides he's ready to head back to the Waldorf. I've thought my thoughts, Carl, and now I could use a little dinner. It's been a most satisfactory day. I'm glad, sir. The Lexbot. Perfect name. By this time next year, there'll be one in every household. Probably several. Won't that be something? And I'll be announcing a no-interest guaranteed loan program this winter so that even the most unfortunate among us will have at least one of his own. I can't wait to get mine. Don't be naive. Believe me, Carl, you don't want one. I wouldn't let you have one. Sir? You're too valuable. Th th thank you, sir. Do you know what I was doing while we took our nice cruise around the city? 
No, sir. I was making a list of who's to get the first hundred Lexbots that come off the assembly line. They'll all be gifts to prime the pump. Uh, and did you finish your list, sir? All hundred names? All hundred names, yes. And number one goes to the President of the United States. Number two I'll give to his ugly wife. Every Lexbot will have its own serial number, of course. Is that right? LaGuardia, I've decided, will have number nine. Even if he loses the election on Tuesday? He won't, Carl. Number nine goes to Fatty. Shirley Temple gets number 48. Clark Gable, 32. George Washington Carver, 73. George Washington Carver, sir. But he's a Negro. I don't discriminate, Carl. All human beings are the same to me. Yes, sir. Uh, may I ask a question? You may. If the president and the first lady get numbers one and two, who gets number three? Adolf Hitler. Carl hadn't expected that. He'd been thinking maybe Ernest Hemingway or Bing Crosby. The Lexbot will be an international phenomenon, Carl. Yes, sir. Of course. And number four will go with my compliments to Signor Mussolini. Number five to Comrade Stalin. Number six to General Franco. And number seven to King George. Or maybe I'll reverse that. Six to the sixth, eh? <laughs> While the limousine is stopped for a red light, Lex reaches into his top coat and takes out a small black socketed cube. He bounces it lightly in the palm of his hand. <sighs> Clark's impact with the granite bluff not only rendered him senseless and blank, but also left him wedged in a crevice of his own making. Clark slides down the face of the rock, lands flat-footed, finds his balance, and starts to walk. Is he limping? He's limping. Although it doesn't persist very long, it's nonetheless unnerving. He ignores the gathering crowd and crosses First Avenue, squeezing between the front fenders and rear bumpers of two or three automobiles, his head woozy. On 39th Street, he steps around metal scraps, hunks of tire, and a car bonnet. He stumbles over a massive piece of brick wall. He fixes his gaze on that whirling dervish 20 feet away and doesn't know what to do. But coming closer to it, at least the fog in his head grows fainter. His breathing becomes less shallow. Clark can feel it all returning. His vitality, his talents. <coughs> then his legs cave and he falls to his knees. When he lifts his eyes, the robot is right there. Then he's hurtling backward again, smashing through a house. Clark drops to the floor, whacking his ribcage on a radiator valve. Herman says hello. Herman says hello. Propping a hand on its warm coils, Clark uses the radiator to give him leverage and get back on his feet. He totters through the archway into the well-appointed living room. It glitters with broken glass. Going lightheaded again, he puts out a hand and clamps his fingers over the back of a Morris chair. Slumped in the chair is a dead woman with a small hole in one temple. A wide ribbon of blood runs from it down past her ear and underneath her jaw. Another dead woman is splayed out bloody on the floor. Clark looks from one corpse to the other. Taking his time, he walks carefully across the living room and sits in an upholstered chair. He leans forward and looks at his hands. They're shaking. He pins them between his knees. He thinks about Donnie Poor and that Negro prisoner cooked to death inside a vault. For two years, he's been trying to grow up, pay attention, make himself ready. And do you know what? It was a joke. He wonders if there's a back door he can use. Getting up, he looks around, but not at the dead women, then walks through a doorway into the kitchen. There are a plate of Toll House cookies on the table. No back door. Clark pulls out a chair, sits at the table, and glances mechanically at the glow-in-the-dark clock in the back panel of the electric range. It reads 923. Herman says hello. Herman says hello. Picking up a Toll House cookie, Clark regards it closely, as though inspecting it for imperfections. His mom used to make these. Butter, sifted flour, baking soda, salt, chocolate morsels. Anything else? Herman says hello. Herman says hello. He puts the cookie back on the pile. Folding his hands in his lap, he stares at the new-looking white Kelvinator with a basket-shaped motor on top. Diana Dewey had a new refrigerator, too. He doesn't think hers was a Kelvinator, though. But maybe. He remembers Diana's voice, her crooked smile, the silky texture of her skin. Your mother says hello! Your mother says hello! Hello, Mom. What are you doing just sitting there, Clark? I'm not sure, Mom. Don't you think it's pretty selfish? No, I guess I don't. Clark Kent! 
I'm sorry, Mom, but I don't know what to do. Clark, are you scared? Yes, ma'am. I suppose I am. That's good. That's good? I wouldn't want to think your father and I raised a fool. No, ma'am. Now get off that silly chair and go do something. Doesn't matter what, just do something, Clark. <sighs> the instant he springs, the air is raked with submachine gun fire. Volleys of bullets strike him at recoil, further shredding his tights, his trunks, and his cape, and snipping off the final stitch fastening the wedge-shaped emblem to his chest. The big ass goes skimming away. Clark then realizes he's inadvertently flown into the police response to the robot's rampage. Pencil-thin, streaky light shoots from the robot's head and the ends of its fingers. Clark spins in that direction and plows fists first into the robot. Then Clark lifts it off the street and carries it with him over the roofs of the police cars and down toward First Avenue. But that's not where Clark wants to go. He can see a crowd gathered there. So he bears down with his weight, and both he and the robot, Clark on top, crash into the street. Tumbling half a dozen times, Clark collides with a lamppost, his lower vertebrae taking most of the impact. The robot skates on its back down the street, then strikes the curb and sideslips across the pavement. The Lexbot topples over a low metal railing and down a flight of steps to the basement entrance of a brownstone. Clark picks himself up and shakes his head. You in the leotard, down on the ground with both your hands and back your neck, now! Clark turns his head slightly and looks over his shoulder. A dozen policemen, at least a dozen, are pointing their weapons at him across the bonnets and boots of radio cars. This is your last warning, circus boy. Get down on the ground! With a vague hand gesture, much the same a good host would use during a party if a guest offered to get up and fix his own drink, Clark continues on across the pavement. The cops don't shoot him. But a bluish-white light flashes ahead of him. Clark closes the short distance to the top of the areaway and then peers down the steps. Popping a molten, pimpled bulb from his camera's flash attachment, Willie Berg smiles up at him. Looking jailed, Lois Lane stands just inside the basement behind a decorative wrought iron security gate. A couple in bathrobes and pajamas flank her, peering cautiously out. The man is armed with a pewter candlestick, the woman with a coal shovel. Willie takes another picture of a badly dented, partly crumpled steel cylinder, maybe 18 inches long, that lists in a corner, half buried in a clump of dead leaves. The cylinder sporadically emits crackling blue sparkles. Check out the mechanical monster! What happened to it? Your guess is as good as mine. Oh, um, Superman? I want to introduce you to my good friend Lois Lane. Lois, this is Superman I was telling you about. And that's Mr. and Mrs. Pierce. Dave and Sally were kind enough to let us in during the fireworks. Clark goes down a few steps, nodding hello to all, but never taking his eyes off Lois Lane. She's going to recognize him. Of course she will. He'll never pull this off. Superman, huh? What's your real name? Clark feels the giddy, joyful pleasure of a practical joke successfully perpetrated. Let's talk about that some other time, shall we, Miss Lane? Clark feels cocky enough to swagger, but then, catching his own reflection in a lit-from-behind basement window, he is mortified. His hair sticks out and his face is streaked with grime, his clothes are in complete tatters, and where his emblem used to be, minuscule knots and twists of black thread shabbily outline its tri-cornered shape. His boots are gone, and he has white socks on. No wonder Lois Lane doesn't recognize him. Who would? The cylinder suddenly springs open and reassembles. Jeez! A shaft of red light cuts a neat furrow through Willie's thick hair, singeing it down to his scalp. Then the reconstituted robot's articulated fingers close around Willie's trachea and squeeze. Clark drives his left fist through the robot, back to front. It comes out, tangled with circuitry and spaghetti wires. He yanks it back inside, flexes open his fingers, and just grabs. And when he withdraws his hand, he pulls out still more insulated wire, more circuits, a spool of celluloid film, a tangle of paper tape punched with slots, and a small black socketed cube. <coughs> Clark has had enough of this. Plucking the gutted robot off the ground, he bends, crushes, twists, counter-twists, and otherwise compacts it till it is roughly the size of a grapefruit. A small ellipsoidal plate mark dislodges itself and hits the bottom step. Willie picks it up, and with Clark leaning over his shoulder, they inspect it together. <clears throat> Lex Box Sidekick S40, assembled in the United States of America, Luther Corp.
number, please? Yes, please, um, put me through to City Hall, New York City. Madam, maybe you should consider sleeping it off before you make any more phone calls. She was drunker than she'd been in a long while. Soda considered calling one of the big dailies in New York, but was afraid she would only get that same hateful operator again. Ditto for calling a cab. So she left the club around 7.30 and waited on South Orange Avenue for a public service bus. Although Soda had never been to City Hall before, it never crossed her mind that the mayor might not be there on a Sunday evening. He lived there, didn't he? She knew it was downtown, not far from the Woolworth building, so she meant to get off at the first stop in Lower Manhattan, Cortland Street. But thanks to the bottle and half of whiskey she drank just to have the courage to get on the train into the city, she missed Cortland and got off at the second stop, Church Street. Good enough. She'd find the place. She had to. She was determined to deliver the envelope and to deliver it tonight. After Soda had taken it from her safe this afternoon, she poured over just enough of its contents to get the gist. There was a ghost gang operating in New York City, and her Richard, his last name was Sandglass, she discovered, had rooted it out and gotten the goods on all of those dirty crooks, like a G-man in a Warner Brothers picture. Why hadn't he said he was a cop? Because she'd practically told him, don't be one? Or was she just flattering herself? Alexander Luther, a name that kept appearing on page after page, meant nothing to Soda because she never read the papers. <laughs> now, after Soda has dragged herself up the stairs from Hudson Terminal and is standing on the pavement in front of two bridged skyscrapers on Court Street, she is struck with a pang of terror. It's dark, it's cold, the streets are empty, and turning dizzily in a circle, she can't locate the Woolworth building. She is lost in a canyon of tall buildings, her stomach is churning, her temples are throbbing, and her cheeks are wet and chapped. I can't do this. So does instincts tell her to walk south. In fact, she heads due west, believing it's south, and shortly finds herself on Greenwich Street. Stepping off the curb, <laughs> her left ankle buckles and she goes down, whacking both kneecaps. <laughs> Why did he smile that way? <laughs> oh, now I'm lost and alone. I'm so alone. Clutching the envelope horizontally, she folds it around her face like a mask. <laughs> Are you ever going to take these things off? I'm not a criminal, I'm a reporter. There's a difference? The cop had just leaned into the front of the radio car to grab a long barrel flashlight, a notebook, and a fountain pen from the dashboard. Please, can't you take them off? Lois holds up her wrists, fettered by handcuffs that are not just heavy, but painfully tight, grooving her flesh. She cocks her head, looking miserable. Come on, be a good guy. Of all the things she has to worry about, being handcuffed, being scooped, Ben's condition, the way Superman stared at her and the way it made her feel, what primarily troubles Lois at the moment is this. She deliberately remained behind that locked security gate and let Willie Berg go back outside to inspect that robot-turned-cylinder. She is appalled at herself, deeply ashamed. Lois had stayed behind the iron gate because she was scared. Scared is not good, Lois. It's weak. And if there is one thing Lois Lane despises above everything else, it is being and being seen as weak. She turns to strike again at the side window with her handcuffs, but sees a flying wedge of police and fire department officials flanking a short, rotund, furiously gesticulating man in a flapping overcoat and a black sombrero. And I want every- Let me out of here! Pausing in mid-gesture, Fiorello LaGuardia glances irritably around and spots Lois. Would you please release Miss Lane so I may have a word, Chief? Twenty seconds later, Lois is sighing with relief as a key turns and her handcuffs snap open. Good evening, Lois. She feels an instant puerile gratitude that he called her by her first name. They've never spoken before, although she has attended half a dozen of his press conferences, even asked him a few questions. One of which, are you at all embarrassed to have sponsored Lex Luthor's entrance into city politics? He called impudent. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, and thank you. She makes a big show of rubbing her chafed wrists. At least some people know how to treat members of the press. Don't push it, Miss Lane. You were involved in a very damaging series of events here tonight. And for all we know, you're partly responsible, are you? Of course not! What do you know about that, that infernal device? Are you smiling? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Infernal device? That's funny. It was a robot. 
So they tell me. What do you know about it? It was in the luggage compartment of a car driven by the same person who shot Ben Yeager. And that's all you know? That's it. Lois doesn't deem it necessary to inform the mayor about the small obloid metal tag that Willie passed to her, and that is now concealed inside the left cup of her white cotton gambles brassiere. He can read about it like everybody else in tomorrow morning's Daily Planet. And what can you tell us about this strong man? Mr. Mayor, you've got those copy weightlifters in town. Have you thrown that? I've just been reminded there's a team of weightlifters in town from the Soviet Union. Did you happen to notice if this fellow spoke Russian? Mayor LaGuardia, he's not just some run-of-the-mill muscle man. He can fly! I mean, ask your cops. They had him surrounded and he I'm just... I'm having a difficult time believing all this. Welcome to the club. Mr. Luther? Leave, Carl. Uh, yes, sir, but can I do anything else before I... Um... Just leave. Now! Get out! Uh, yes, sir. What's going on, Lex wants to know. Mrs. O'Shea wasn't at home when he returned, and not a note. Polly's gone out, where, and is unreachable. What time will you need me in the morning, sir? But Lex doesn't answer. Seems, in fact, to have blotted Carl from his vision and his consciousness. What is going on? Something's wrong, but what? A grapefruit-sized ball of crumpled metal has smashed through the French doors, whizzing across the living room to embed itself four inches deep in the silver-papered wall behind the wet bar. That cop? <laughs> yeah, did you see that guy? With the nose, right? The, that cop with the red nose? Is he a riot or what? Like he was gonna have a heart attack. I bet he quits the force. I bet they make him! In that other one. You see him try to grab my cape? He tried to grab your cape? Which one? Big mustache? He tried to grab your cape! Man, it's lucky he didn't end up hitching a ride. I was afraid I'd drop you. You were? Well, I wasn't sure I had a good grip. It all happened so fast. You had a great grip. I was afraid I'd drop the stupid camera. Clark comes to a gentle rest on the flat, tar-papered roof of their tenement on St. Mark's Place. Clark places Willie gently down. Off a clothesline, he gathers up a pair of his trousers, a shirt, and black socks. Clark tugs his trousers on over his ruined tights. He retrieves his eyeglasses from the little pocket he sewed into his cape, and then stuffs the tail into his trousers. It feels lumpy. Does it look lumpy? It looks all right. Makes your rear end look kind of big. How big? Relax. It looks fine. Clark goes and sits next to Willie while he puts on his socks. <sighs> Can I borrow your shoes? And your belt? Willie makes a face. Okay. Belt and shoes. <clears throat> Can I ask you something? Mm-hmm. Who are you right now? <clears throat> what? Who are you supposed to be right now? Clark or Superman? <clears throat> uh, I'm not supposed to be anybody. It's all just... Because whether you know it or not, you're still talking in that deep voice. I am? You just changed it. But yeah, you were. Guess I should watch that. <clears throat> so where is this place? Willie points downtown and to the west. You can't miss it. It's got a big globe on the roof. <clears throat> Willie stoops and picks up his camera from the rooftop. He ejects a used flash bulb and lobs it. Then Willie snaps the film hat shut. Kind of thought we'd get a bigger reaction from the guy. What guy? What guy? Luthor! Oh, yeah, me too. Think we did a lot of damage? How much you think it'll cost to replace those doors? Willie drops the roll of exposed film into Clark's palm. Forget about the stupid doors, and don't scuff the shoes. Clark steps under the parapet. And don't let anybody see you flying around in those clothes. I won't. Clark doesn't move. Are you going to do this or not? I'm a little nervous. You just annihilated a robot. I think you can talk to the editor of the Daily Planet. Would you go already? I'm freezing to death up here. But well, wake me when you get back. Less than a minute after she is dropped off at Bellevue Hospital, Lois tosses a nickel into one of the pay telephones and rids her mind of everything except first graph, second graph, third graph. Daily Planet. Get me rewrite. This is Lois Lane. Hold on. Lois? Perry White. Recently hired away from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Perry White is the paper's new managing editor. And so far, Lois and he haven't hit it off so well. He thinks she's careless. She thinks he's stodgy. Perry, I asked for rewrite. This is about that pandemonium on 39th Street. Relax, we got it covered. But I was there. I know what happened at every... I'm pretty sure we do, too. <laughs> Say, do you happen to know a guy named Clark Kent? He's using you as a reference. What? He's there? Sitting right in front of me. Would you care to say hello? 
Perry, kick him out. I don't care what he's telling you, he wasn't anywhere near 39th Street. See you when you get here, Lois. No! Perry! It was my story! I was there! Perry! Lois very nearly leaves the hospital without first going upstairs to check on Ben. She's not cold-hearted, though. Steamed, yes. Stunned and brutally humiliated, check. But not cold-hearted. Sixth floor, intensive care. Flashing her press card, she races past the head nurse's station. The attending nurse is just stepping out into the corridor when Lois arrives in such an overwrought state that she doesn't recognize her old pal and former roommate. Honey, your coat, it's covered with blood! Don't worry, it's not mine, it's Ben's. How's he doing? Better than he should. What's he to you? Kind of a boyfriend, but not really. What are you doing here? I thought you were in California. I was, but here I am. How's Charlie? I'm not sure, but my guess is pretty nervous. It's a long story. How are you? At the moment, Skin, not so great. I nearly got run down by a car and incinerated by a robot. And now, I just found out I was scooped by a four-eyed farm boy from Kansas. A robot? Oh, that's a long story, too. But I gotta run. Where are you staying? A hotel for the time being. Need a roommate? I might. Call me. Or maybe I'll see you back here. Tell him I came by, all right? Sure. Hey, am I imagining things, or is he the same cop that used to stand guard on our mutual friend that time at Roosevelt? Same cop, yeah. Cute. I mean, not at the moment, but otherwise. Lois hurries back down the hallway. You could have at least taken a peek at Ben, she berates herself. Hey! I saw Willie out in Hollywood! He took pictures of me in my underwear. Lois glances sourly over her shoulder. <sighs> Maybe I don't need a roommate. The Daily Planet at Spruce and Nassau Streets exclusively occupies a 16-story building made of brick with a front facing of polished granite designed by Richard Morris Hunt. A revolving gilded globe of the Earth seems, in light both natural and artificial, to be suspended wondrously in mid-air 20 feet above the rooftop. While the Daily Planet remains located in a neighborhood that is a relic of the newspapering past, its grand old building with its light-filled offices, below-ground printing plant, and spacious marbled lobby, supposedly modeled after a ballroom in the Versailles Palace, are all turbines of activity and nervous energy at any time of the day or night. Here it is late on a Sunday evening. The sound of the giant rotary presses can be heard as far away as a quarter mile, and dozens of delivery trucks, big federals, are lining up along three sides of the building, waiting for tomorrow's first edition, the Night Owl, to come trundling out to the loading docks in bound wet bales. Around in front, taxi cabs come and go, dropping off and picking up reporters, photographers, freelancers, press agents. Delivery men from a score of different Jewish delicatessens and late kitchen restaurants hustle inside, lugging pasteboard cartons packed with bialy smeared with cream cheese, corned beef sandwiches, coffee and beer, and celery soda. Hold that elevator! The lobby is bedlam tonight. Unsavory looking men dashing for the elevators, punching the buttons impatiently, smashing into the riders who seem propelled out of the cars when the doors finally unseal. Carney Odes, who has operated the candy and cigar concession for three decades, has seen his share of nights like this one. Big news nights. War, peace, the stock market bust, the Lindbergh snatch, the Will Rogers smash-up, the Hindenburg, John Dillinger down. Carney's been trying for the past hour and change to get the lowdown on what's going on, hailing practically every pencil and pad man he's seen race by, even the ones who aren't his regular customers, but nobody has stopped. Business stinks. Carney snaps to attention when a cop house reporter veers over and scoops up a handful of cheap Florida cigars and a box of chiclets. Hey, Wilson, what's going on? Benny Yeager got shot. The loose off Patsy? No kidding. Who by? I heard it was a robot. What? Gotta run, Carn. A robot? Carney is still puzzling over that when a heavyset woman appears in front of him, red-faced and very bright-eyed, clutching a fat envelope and reeking of alcohol. And because Carney Oates has no truck with soakers, no truck at all, he glowers. Where do I go if I want to report something? It depends on what you want to report. Carney points to a disheveled man seated over there, clutching himself as though he's freezing. Now that's Mr. Spencer, who drops by three times a week to report an octopus sighting in the waters between the Battery and Governor's Island. Although he will admit it's possible it could be a giant squid, even a German submarine. 
Now, if you want to report cannibalism among the Hebrew citizenry, you can go sit down on that bench. Carney gestures at a rail-thin, gray-haired woman seated ramrod straight on a different bench against the same wall. And if you want to report a pink elephant, sister, why don't you just walk around the corner to McCutcheon's bar and tell it to the fine patrons you encounter there? The fat woman blinks at him. Seems as though she might burst into tears, then turns abruptly, stumbling when an ankle buckles, and walks purposely across the lobby to one of the uniformed guards. Carney Oates grins when the guard takes the hippo by an arm and steers her right over to Mr. Spencer's bench, plonks her down there, and wags a finger in her face. Glancing at a clock he keeps on a shelf, Carney sees that it's already midnight when he spots Lois Lane trotting briskly across the lobby. Hiya, sweetheart! What do you have to tell old Carney to brighten his lonely night? Lois ignores him and heads for an elevator. Claire Kent is sitting in Perry White's glass-enclosed office talking to both White and George Taylor when Lois slings the door open without knocking. Clark jumps to his feet. The perfect gentleman, that rat. Hello. Wow. You don't look any the worse for wear. George Taylor smiles and gives her a quick head to toe. <laughs> okay, maybe you do. I nearly got myself killed for this story. It's mine, not his. Lois, please, I would Shut up, you! George, I told him you'd give him a job if he came in with a front-page story, and now he's trying to swindle you. Swindler! He wasn't there! He wasn't there! Were you there? No, sir, but... Shut up, kid. Okay, he wasn't there. But he never said he was. However, and just in case this might be news to you, at least 50 other reporters were. Including a few of our own. But I was there first. Did you phone it in? <sighs> just... Do not hire that farmer. He's a fraud. Enough. He may well be. But are these? Grabbing a patch of damp prints from his desk, Perry smacks them into Lois's hand. She riffles through them. The car, the cape, the robot. The robot again, that time blurred, speed dramatically smudging its shape. Then him. Then him again. Him again. His hair like a bomb flash. His gymnasiast clothing in such tatters that he looks almost comical, and the print like a production still from a Hal Roach comedy. Him again, the big red S dangling by a thread or two. These are Willie's pictures. Lois tosses them all back on the desk. What is she going to say now? Does she have to talk? She puts a hand up to her lips. Can't she just leave? Where's a phone? She needs to call her father. I want a sidebar for the red eye edition. Both Taylor and White stare at her. For all she knows, Clark Kent does too. But she can't look at him. A sidebar? Uh, convince me. <sighs> then, as her two editors look on in amazement, only Taylor blushes. Lois undoes her top buttons, sticks a hand inside a brassiere cup, and plucks out the small metal plate she's kept hidden there for the past two hours. She holds it up, pinching it between her thumb and first finger so that her hand won't tremble. We finally got Lex Luthor dead to rights. She passes over the plate mark to George Taylor. His eyebrows go up, as do the corners of his mouth. Ah, uh, Kent, you'll have to excuse us. See the paymaster on your way out. They'll settle up. And Kent? Yes, sir? Lewis cringes at how suddenly hopeful he looks. It's pitiful. Tell your shy friend if he wants a job, he's got one. Otherwise, we'd be happy to look at anything else he'd care to show us. Yes, sir. Perry White shows Clark to the door. Nice meeting you, Kent. You too. And you too, sir. But I was wondering, Mr. Taylor, sir? Kent, we're really busy now. Of course. I'm sorry. But if... Well, if anything does come up in the way of a job for me... Uh... You get us a front-page story of your own, and I'll give you a job, all right? Now beat it! As Clark is stepping through the doorway, looking melancholic, looking very young, a copy boy ducks underneath his arm, scoots around him, and with near-triumphant brio... Slaps down a copy of the Night Owl edition on Perry White's desk. Ho oh, ho! There's your headline, folks. It's Superman! He's embarrassed and sore, angry and heartsick. More heartsick than angry. But that's stupid. How can he measure? How can he gauge? He's upset. Mostly about how she treated him. She really thought he'd sneaked around behind her back to scoop her. That he's the kind of guy who would do such a thing, is capable of it. She hates him. Clark is standing at the paymaster's window, two floors below the city room, third in line. 
It's 20 minutes past 12 by the wall clock. He doesn't want to plow into robots all the time. That much he knows. He wants to go to work in the morning like regular people. Have a desk, drawers full of rubber bands, his own typewriter. He wants to talk to guys at the water fountain. And girls. One in particular. Although at the moment, she's the last person on earth he'd talk to. A farmer. And just what's so wrong, Clark wants to know, with being a farmer? Do you like green vegetables? Do you like fruit? Do you like bread? Do you like cream of wheat? Then quit insulting farmers. There's nothing wrong with being a farmer. Son, step up, step up. The paymaster sits on a stool behind a banker's grill. He has on a green visor and almond-shaped spectacles, wears old-fashioned garters on his shirt sleeves. Clark passes him the voucher he got from Perry White. Signature here and initials there. Now the paymaster counts from a sheaf of bills. 100, 200, 300, and 20, and 5, and no cents. $325? Stand aside, son. Next! That's all right. I'm just waiting for Hayseed Harry. Excuse me. Stuffing the money into his pocket without counting it, Clark brushes past Lois, something that would have earned his mother severest reproach. Clark! I was only kidding. I'm kidding. He pushes through a pair of plate doors and crosses the hall to the elevators. Forgive me? Clark presses the call button. I'm sorry, okay? I just thought you'd, you know... Stabbed you in the back? Yeah! Clark puts a hand out to stop the doors from closing right away. He doesn't want to leave. I really am sorry. Okay, thanks. With a shrug, he turns to go. Clark, wait! I want to interview your friend. He turns and looks at her. Superman, can you arrange it? Clark steps into the elevator car and, without turning around, punches the button. It shatters into bits of hard plastic. All the way down, Clark stares at his vague, unhappy reflection in burled walnut. Crossing the lobby, he is waylaid by a very large woman smelling of alcohol. Can you help me? Are you a reporter? I wish. All right, lady, that's the last time you get to bother anybody tonight. A uniformed guard is dragging her away before he's even finished speaking. Out you go! That's all right. We're just having a conversation. It's okay, really. Then she's yours, mister. And no more trouble, you! What trouble? This is supposed to be a newspaper. I should have picked another one. We all wish you did. Aren't you the rudest thing? I only picked this one because I found a copy in the back of my cab. I, I thought it was like a sign finding a copy of the Daily Planet in the back of my cab, so I came here. I should have picked another paper. I'm sorry you feel that way, ma'am. I'm not sure I can help you, but if I can, I will. Thank you. To finally answer your question, I'm not a reporter. Well, that's what I need. No, but they don't make it easy for you. It's easier to get into Fort Knox. <laughs> Clark realizes two things. She's very pretty, and she's not drunk, no matter how cloying the alcohol smell. I'm not a reporter now, but I used to be. Clark is unsure why he feels a need, and he definitely does, to prolong this encounter. He feels sorry for her, yes, but that's not it. Would you like to sit down? I'm Edith Waters. Clark Kent. Good to meet you, Clark. Sure, we can sit. I'm exhausted. She leads him to a long, varnished bench occupied by a man with thick, snarled hair. His coat and trousers are filthy, his shoes are caked with tar, and he's tapping an envelope against one knee. Edith Waters curtly nods to him. Have a seat. Nobody here except us squirrels, right, Mr. Spencer? This is where they store the nuts. I have proof. We all have proof, darling. Just nobody wants to see it. Oh, I've been on quite an odyssey. Do you know what time it is? About 12.30, I'd guess. Originally, I was going to see the mayor, but I decided that probably wasn't such a great idea. Miss Waters, you were going to tell me why you needed a reporter. Edith lowers her head, twisting it to one side, and her demeanor hardens with alarming quickness. She curls her fingers around the sides of her envelope, but she doesn't say anything. She strokes her envelope now, almost fondly, as if it were the flank of a lapdog. When I give this up, that's it. He's gone. But that's why he left it with me. Just in case. Somebody gave you that? Who did? What is it? Clark catches himself, acting like a reporter. All that's left is when, where, and why. He could do this. He really could. Because he honestly doesn't want to go around beating up robots night and day, raising blisters on the back of a bully's hand. Edith? What's in the envelope? First, I have to tell you something else. My name is really Soda. Well, it, it's not really, but it's who I am. Silly name, isn't it? Not at all. I'm a singer, 
A singer? Well, I'd love to hear you one of these days. I'm a night watchman, Pire. Not anymore, but I used to be. They let me go after there was a barge collision. They said I fell asleep, but I didn't. I couldn't have. My eyes are always open. Last night I saw an octopus. Mr. Spencer, for the love of God, would you shut up? The envelope. When I give it up, he's gone. Maybe not. Clark has no idea what she's talking about. She unwinds the string and pulls from the envelope a sheaf of papers punched with three holes and bound together with brass fasteners. To the Honorable Fiorello LaGuardia from Richard D. Sandglass, Lieutenant NYPD. Edith, is this the man who gave you the envelope, Richard Sandglass? Why? Do you know him too? I've never met him, no, but I know who he... Was. Clark nods and puts an arm around her. Oh. She leans against him. <laughs> I'm so very sorry for your loss. That's how his parents taught him to express condolences to the bereaved. His mother also told Clark that he could add, he or she is in a much better place now. But he never has, he doesn't now, and he probably never will. For half an hour, he and Soda sit together on the nut bench. It is ten minutes past one when they take an elevator to the city room. Clark, who feels he already knows the lay of the land, confidently directs her to George Taylor's office. Mr. Taylor, Mr. White, I think you're going to want to see this. It is five minutes before two when both George Taylor and Perry White take turns, shaking Clark's hand and welcoming him as a new employee of the Daily Planet Company. It is a quarter past six, Monday morning. I knew you'd show up. It's the only reason I've stayed around. Can we get you anything? Soda pop? Glass of milk? They replaced the windows already. Just so that you'll know. So you don't make the same mistake in the future. They're called French doors. And why wouldn't they be replaced already? This is the Waldorf Astoria boy. They believe in service here. Look at that wall. Plastered, painted, better than ever. And I dare you to find even a sliver of glass in the Broadloom. I shouldn't have done that. No? I thought it was marvelous myself. Carl here is inclined to your position. I'll pay for the damages. He's offered to pay for the damages, Carl. Thanks for the offer, but it won't be necessary. Please, though, sit down. Get comfortable. Carl, why don't you put on a record? I don't want to listen to any records. And I'll stand, if you don't mind. I don't want to soil the furniture. You do look like a chimney sweep. Pardon my saying. When you came in just now, I said to myself, this poor fellow looks like some cross between a chimney sweep and Peter Pan. Do you recall Peter Pan came in that way too? By a little balcony and, and through the French doors? Didn't he? Surely you read Peter Pan. Was he barefoot as well? You do realize you're barefoot, don't you? I'm just here. There's sir. a picture of your boots in the mirror. So that explains the bare feet. And the missing patch. Or was that supposed to be an insignia? They ran a picture of that as well. I know why you're here, and we'll get to it. Are, are you in a big hurry? Not especially, and I'm expecting the police any minute. To tell you the truth, Mr. Luther, I'm surprised I got here first. Well, you're a pretty speedy lad. It says so in all the papers. Have you read them? I have. Carl was kind enough to bring them. Oh, will you stop glaring? A glass-topped coffee table is covered with early edition newspapers. Only the planet has a picture of Clark on its front page. The rest just have pictures of incinerated automobiles, demolished house fronts, his boots, and his insignia. Also on the table are half a dozen black socketed cubes. And in the center of the table, between the cubes and the newspapers, is the crumpled robot. Lex looks healthy, tanned, rested, and he's grinning. If you intend to keep up the vaudeville act, by the way, you have to get a replacement costume. I'll see what I can do. Something in asbestos, perhaps. I have resources. At the sound coming from the wall, Lex goes and presses a button under the fluted edge of a pie crust lamp table. Instantly it whirls away and is replaced by a shortwave radio set with both headphones and a microphone on top. Lex puts on the headphones, adjusting them over his ears. Excuse me, won't you? He leans close to the microphone. Yes? All right. Don't contact me here again after, let's say, half past six. Excellent. Very excellent. He flips the toggle back to its original position and throws down the headphones. Where were we? I need to tell you why I came here, and then I need to go. You can't go. We've just met. I came here... To meet me? No. Of course you did. 
But under the ruse of telling me that a duplicate copy of the dreaded sand glass file miraculously turned up last night, well, I'm sorry, boy, but that's old news. Telephones were calling me before the planet called the cops. Now sit down and quit fidgeting. Clark is taken aback. He's fidgeting? Carl, get that. I expect it'll be the police. Tell them I can't speak to them now. He used to be a priest, but he lost his faith. Or perhaps he never had any. Till now. Now, he believes in me. Give him time, and he'll believe in you, too. He'll believe in both of us, as will everyone else. Was I right? Yes, sir. They want you to come down to police headquarters right now. And if I don't? They're gonna come here and arrest you at 7 o'clock this morning. Which means they'll be here by 20 of, if not sooner. You think? Oh, Carl, Carl. Carl, why don't you go into my bedroom and bring out my luggage? Yes, sir. And set it down by the door? Yes, sir. I'm not going to let you leave. Don't be silly. I'm going to leave, but you are going to jail. What's that accent? Nebraska? Clark flinches. Missouri. Kansas. Off some farm, I'd wager. I know that you're trying your very hardest, boy, but I have to tell you, it's just not working. You still sound like a yokel. A warmth starts to rise in Clark's neck, moving up under his jaws, suffusing his cheeks, climbing through his temples, crawling into his scalp, making it prickle. He doesn't trust himself to speak again. Lex reaches over and touches the grapefruit-sized ball of crumpled metal. But it's all right that you're stupid. You'll have me for brains. With great difficulty, Lex hoists up the compacted robot. He staggers to one side, but manages to push it through the air at Clark, who catches it as though it weighed no more than a dime store gumball. Is there anything else you need me to do right now? Carl sets down a pair of strapped leather suitcases. Actually, there is. Why don't you go stand outside on the balcony? The balcony? Through the French doors there? The balcony? Yes, sir. You can keep an eye out on the street and let us know when any police cars arrive. Could you do that? Yes, sir. Paler than before, Carl steps out on the balcony. I'm sorry we keep being interrupted. That was a wonderful idea. Lex indicates the compacted robot in Clark's hand. But there'll be other ideas, as you'll come to realize the longer we're together. Together. I'm going to save you a lot of time, boy. Spare you the step-by-step -step stages of development I had to pass through to get to where I am. I regret none of it, of course, since it all led me here. But there's no reason you should go through it. Why repeat? And as stupid as you are, boy, you must realize that you have nothing in common with them. Them? He points to Carl, using him as an example. Them. Clark smiles at the metal ball. <laughs> It misses Lex's head by half an inch. It is smashed through an oil painting of a girl in a red hat watering flowers and is stuck into the wall. Lex turns and looks at it, then looks back at Clark. $150,000, Sotheby's. You need to learn self-control. I'll teach you. You're crazy. And you are so obviously stupid, but I'm willing to be patient with you. And what are we supposed to do together, exactly? I mean, after you've taught me everything. Rule the world? Go bother Hitler, why don't you? And leave me alone. Uh, Mr. Luther, there's about five, six, there's seven cop cars pulling up down front. Take me out of here. Now. You are crazy. I won't bother asking you now who injected you with what. There'll be plenty of time for all that later. But one look at you and I can see you don't have the brains to survive. I have those, boy. Mr. Luther, they're in the building. Luther comes and stands about four feet away from Clark. You need me. Why? You know why. Come on, boy. Don't call me that. M Mr. Luther, are we gonna go or what? Without taking his eyes from Clark's face, Lex raises an arm and points to the balcony. Get back out there, Carl, where I told you to stay. Yes, sir. Take me from here now. Police, open the door. Take me from here now, and I'll give you the world. Shall I let them in, or will you? You really are stupid. Then I guess that makes two of us. Carl! Carl steps back into the room. His face is ashen. You trust me, Carl, don't you? Yes, sir. But, but Mr. Luther, what do we... If you trust me, Carl, if you believe in me... Mr. Luther, what do we do? Police! Open the door now or we kick it in! 
Mr. Luther? Jump, Carl. Mr. Luther? Clark looks from one to the other, from Carl to Lex, from Lex back to Carl. Jump, and I promise you won't die. Mr. Luther? Jump! Carl steps out onto the balcony and simply flings himself over the rail. <laughs> by the time Clark catches him, he's already past the ninth floor. And by the time he delivers him back to Lex's apartment and lays him down on the longer of the two white sofas, Carl's heart has stopped. <sighs> Not again. Not again. Clark shakes him and pounds on his chest, angrily, furiously. He drops to his knees and presses his forehead against the couch cushion. Move! 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 Up! On your feet! When he looks around, Clark finds himself, for the second time in only a few hours, confronted by armed policemen. Others are moving swiftly through the apartment. Not in here! Not back here! Not anywhere. Lex Luthor is gone. And so is his luggage. You! One of the officers fishes handcuffs from his belt with one hand and grabs Clark's wrist with the other. Behind your back! Mutely, Clark does as he's told. Let's go! The cop grips Clark by his left arm. Move it! But Clark plants himself and refuses to budge. The cop tries dragging him. Another cop comes over and takes hold of Clark's right arm, and they both try dragging him. They finally stop trying and step back. You're under arrest, and I am hereby ordering you to submit to our custody. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. And are you willing to comply with my lawful command? Clark thinks about it. No. He snaps the handcuff links. He thinks to apologize, but does not. Then he walks to the windows, the stupid French doors. Nobody tries to stop him. Going out onto the balcony, Clark estimates how much leg thrust he'll need to clear the top of the Park Lane Hotel across the street. <sighs> Lex Luthor escaped from his apartment by means of a concealed wall panel, of course. Going directly to the other smaller apartment he maintained under a different name at the Waldorf Astoria next door to Cole Porter's, Lex changed his clothes, changed his appearance, sweeping maestro wig, Van Dyke beard, pinstriped suit, then left the hotel and walked calmly over to Grand Central Terminal, where he took a sleeper on the New Haven and Hartford line. From Connecticut, Lex took another train to Ohio. After withdrawing a briefcase full of cash and negotiable bonds from a long-term locker in Toledo, he pays a visit to a general science teacher at a small land-grant college in nearby Bowling Green. Great mind. Deplorable social habits. By the following day, Lex has persuaded the man to begin work developing a virtually indestructible fabric, as well as an evaporation ray and a precipitation ray. One that might dry up the ocean, one that might drown the whole world. Then Lex takes a hotel suite and sends out for the latest prospectus from the Radio Corporation of America and everything available concerning the creation of fully electronic television, which everyone knows is the next essential thing. He likes having options. As usual, he plans for both the long range and the short view. And in every plan that he makes, he includes Superman. Always. He hasn't felt this alive. This engaged since he shot those three gunmen in his mother's cemetery. Life is good. Our version of the story draws toward its conclusion a few minutes before 11 o'clock on Friday, the 4th of February, 1938, with the first night audience at the Henry Miller's Theater in New York City. The show just finished being performed is another of those scenery-less dramas currently in vogue, this one called... Our Town. It was written by Thornton Wilder, who is not in attendance. The show is over, and the cast are taking their bows. With her handkerchief, Lois presses out a tear that trickles down her cheek. Seeing that tear, John Kearney snaps closed his notepad and teasingly flicks it away. Oh, for Pete's sake, Lois, surely not you. She slaps his hand, reaches around behind her for her coat. He told her during intermission that he intended to crucify this pseudo-Chinese wreck of a play, and it is evident that he hasn't changed his mind. Since returning in December from Washington, D.C., a victim of WPA politics, Gurney has been writing theater criticism, some, however, call it carnage, for the Daily Planet while teaching journalism again at Columbia. Lois doesn't know how she feels about dating Professor Gurney, that is, John. He's handsome and worldly, not a cheapskate, and a very good kisser. 
Would you just listen to all this weeping and gnashing of teeth? It's only a play, ladies and gentlemen. A very bad play. Oh, will you shut up? As Lois is sticking an arm into her coat sleeve, she glances up, for about the 50th time this evening, to a Rococo-embellished formal box that juts over the stage. But Clark Kent's back is still turned to her. Not that she really wants to see his stupid mug. Seeing it every day at work is bad enough. She has made it abundantly clear that she has no interest in dating him. No interest in Clark, period. Now, if Clark's friend Superman asked her out, you'd better believe she'd say yes. You about ready to leave? I could use a drink. Tonight just happens to be Soda Water's 37th birthday, and she cannot imagine a grander, kinder, sweeter, more thoughtful gift than this. Box seats on her birthday. Are you all right? Sure. But Soda is not too sure of that. Clark's had a rough time of it lately, and since he came back last week from Kansas, he's been quiet and moody. Poor fidgety thing. Earlier, she noticed him frowning, straining as if the actors weren't speaking loud enough, which they most certainly were, when he turned to her. Do you hear a fire engine? A fire engine? No, I don't. And the next thing she knew, Clark was gone. Clark, thank you again so much. Uh, yes, thanks. I loved it. Did you love it? Yes. Oh, look, Clark. From here you can see the people backstage crowding around to peek out. You see them? See that skinny old man with the suspenders? Doesn't he look exactly like a guy you'd seen in those Dick Powell musicals? Doesn't he? Clark shrugs, then leans forward and gently rests his forehead on the ledge of the box. Soda strokes his back in a wide circle. Willie Berg is on assignment this evening for Life magazine. That's why he's backstage. Before tonight's performance, he spent two hours snapping candids of the actors. During the performance, Willie ate a sandwich and played a few hands of poker with the electricians, listened to old Pop tell a funny story about walking in on Ethel Barrymore with her clothes off, and then strolled around snapping pictures of stagehands. He is amassing a collection of pictures that he hopes eventually to exhibit in an art gallery and later collect into a book. Aren't they ever going to quit applauding old Pop? Ah, let the kids enjoy themselves. They deserve it. I guess. What's the play about, anyway? Boy meets girl, they get married, she dies in childbirth. What's so great about that? Old Pop makes a face and walks away. Willie looks past the actors and sees Clark up in a fancy schmancy box, arms folded on the railing, his face pressed against a forearm. Poor guy. Clark doesn't know what's come over him, but he just feels so sad, so hopeless and sad. He can understand the play making him feel sad, but hopeless? Grover's Corner was a lot like Smallville, but also a lot like the dozens of towns he and Willie had passed through, drifted into, drifted out of. And all of the characters, all of the people in the play, Clark recognized them all, had met them all and knew them all, young as he was. Those ordinary, ordinary, fortunate, ordinary people. He loved them, lived among them, but was not of them. Lex Luthor, at least, seemed to get it, but nobody else did. Okay, Willie, but Willie is a big-shot photographer now, always busy. Clark misses Willie's steady company, and no matter how often he lets her know that he's interested in her, not just as a girlfriend, which is hopeless, but as a friend, Lois Lane spurns him, but fawns over Superman. Sometimes Clark really hates Superman, but how can he hate Superman? He is Superman. Superman is doing just great, growing stronger and more coordinated by the day. Willie isn't around much anymore, and Lois won't give him a tumble. So who does Clark have in his life? Lex Luthor. In the third week of December, a package arrived at the Daily Planet for Superman. Clark said he'd see that he got it, and did. Inside was a beautifully made Superman costume. Clark read the note. Asbestos. As promised, Lex. The Luther-made uniform was identical to the one Diana Dewey had made, except that it came with a white black belt, and the red satin S appeared on a yellow, not a black background. Why had he changed it? And why had he made the costume in the first place? Lois, can we please go for a drink now? What are you looking at? John Gurney puts his face close to hers and follows her gaze directly up to the box seats. Somebody you know? Is something wrong with Clark? 
Not that she really cares. Let's get a move on if we're going to have that drink. I still have to go back to the office and build that cross to crucify this miserable excuse for a... Oh, will you just take a hike? Well... With a ferocious glare, Gurney snatches his coat and storms off, weaving up the aisle, uncivilly jostling the slowpokes, and then he's gone. And good riddance. Clark, how's about we go out and have ourselves a hamburger sandwich? That would make this the perfect birthday. Want to? I don't want to eat. I'm not hungry. Clark, we should go, hon. Why don't you let me sneak off to the powder room and you kind of pick yourself up, okay? A week ago, last Monday, Alger phoned. The farm not only had a telephone now, but also electric light in nearly every room. And told Clark, You better get home as soon as you can. Clark arrived at the farm early on Tuesday morning. He found his father, wasted and terribly weak, barely conscious. Clark sat quietly at Mr. Kent's bedside. Pa, I... I love you, son. I love you, too. And don't worry. Don't fret. You'll be fine. But I feel like a big phony. We all feel like that, son. Just go on out and... Do the best you can. I'm trying, but it's not working. Can I come home? Uh, no. No, son, you can't. It wouldn't be fair. To who? To whom? <laughs> Jonathan Kent's funeral was lightly attended, in no small measure because of his presumed heathenism, but also because he had brought a Negro into his home. He was buried in a plot next to his Martha's, in the churchyard. That same night, Clark returned there alone, and stood by the headstones under a black sky with a ribbon of cloud suspended across the cold ivory moon. I love you, Pa. Goodbye. Clark! Clark! All right, Lois thinks. If the silly lummox won't answer her, to hell with him. Clark, you okay up there? When she is not kidding herself, now for example, Lois will admit she's been a bitch to Clark Kent, and it's not something she much likes about herself. Okay, but he's just so... nice. And that's a serious problem. It's also a problem that he is so obviously nuts about her. A big problem. Take Superman. He's all business. And except for that one time on Halloween night, she hasn't seen as much as a trace of interest in those dark blue eyes. Not a flicker. You could call me Lois! But it was always Miss Lane. They've been running into each other at least once or twice a week. At the fundraising banquet for the Children's Aid Society, at that disastrous press conference when he threatened to beat up gamblers if they didn't behave, at a chemical factory fire in Brooklyn, a hostage-taking in Ozone Park, a train derailment in Yonkers. She just keeps running into him. And he keeps saving her life. But it's funny about that. She can't remember her life ever being in any real danger until he showed up. Since that robot broil, he's plucked her out of the East River after she was trussed up, tied to an anchor and rolled off the transom of a fishing boat, smugglers. He's caught her mid-plummet off Jenny Jump Mountain in New Jersey, escaped convict. He's lunged in front of her on 7th Avenue, scattering machine gun bullets, fur thieves that time. And it's always been... Are you alright, Miss Lane? Are you sure you're alright? Clark! Hey, Clark! I'm talking to you! How dare that Kansas cornball ignore her when she's trying to talk to him? Ugh. Without thinking about it, she stands on one leg and pulls off her shoe. Ugh. Then, the former shortstop for the girls' high school softball team pegs it toward the box. What? Clark looks straight down, dramatically startled, then immediately flustered to discover Lois standing there. His face is shiny with tears. With evident embarrassment, he whips off his glasses, drying his eyes against his shoulders. He tries a smile now. Lois just stares up, her arms and hands tingling oddly. Without those thick old man's spectacles, he looks so different. Almost like... Clark? And here at last is the point where our version of the story merges with all of the others. The point at which Lois Lane, with one shoe on and one shoe off, peers up at Clark Kent, whose glasses are once again back on his face, 
with a dawning but deeply deep suspicion that feels strangely gleeful, almost like affection. The point at which Clark Kent pushes a hand shyly, flusteredly back through his thick hair and smiles at Lois Lane. The point at which he is filled up with and surrounded by a plain and yet intricate awe. He came maybe a trillion miles to be here. This moment, this point in time, this point in space, feels both destined and deserved, earned and inevitable. He is in a theater on the island of Manhattan, in the city of New York, in the state of New York, in the United States of America, on the continent of North America, on the planet Earth, in the solar system, in the universe, in the mind of God. Whatever that means, somehow he got here. Somehow he did. And somehow Lois Lane got here too. She has the loveliest eyes he will ever see. And he wants to see those eyes every single day, forever. And if she won't love him, he still will love her. Love her all the more. And because he will, he will go on out and do the best that he can, like everybody else. Just like everybody else. This has been a graphic audio production of DC Comics, It's Superman. Superman and all related characters and elements are trademarks of and copyright DC Comics. Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. Novel written by Tom DeHaven. Narrated by Richard Rowan. With performances by Joel David Santner as Clark Kent. Eric Singdalson as Lex Luthor. Eric Messner as Willie Berg. Laura C. Harris as Lois Lane. Dylan Lynch as Jonathan Kent. Lily Beacon as Martha Kent. Thomas Penny as Sheriff Dutcher. Colleen Delaney as Helen O'Shea. Scott Graham as Polly Scaffa. David Jordan as Dick Sandglass. Kimberly Gilbert as Seal Stokowski. With Tracy Lynn Oliveira, Tim Getman, Stephen Carpenter, Katie Karkoff, Sasha Olenek, David Coyne, Alyssa Wilmoth, Christopher Sheeran, Patrick Bussink, Barbara Pinellini, Michael John Casey, Kenyatta Rogers, Andy Brownstein, Nanette Savard, Jonathan Church, Michael Glenn, Christopher Graybill, Jeff Allen, Will Cook, Matt McGee, Nick DePinto, Scott McCormick, Ken Jackson, Terrence Aselford, Faith Potts, Dwayne Beeman, Yasmin Twazon, Nora Ashradi, Daniel Corey, David Harris, Alexander Strain, Matthew Bassett, Deirdre Starnes, Gary Tells, Catherine Aselford, Thomas Hogan, and Mort Shelby. Directed and adapted for graphic audio by Scott McCormick. Produced by Rick Rowan and Dwayne Beeman. Executive Producers James Cutting, Mary Cutting, and Angie Cornett. Dialogue Editing and Graphic Audio Sound Design by Thomas Hogan. The Superman Theme and Additional Original Music by Thomas Hogan. If you enjoyed It's Superman, be sure to look for our other Graphic Audio Comics titles, including Superman The Never-Ending Battle and Superman and Batman Enemies and Allies. Available at roadstops everywhere at 1-800-670-5220 or at www.graphicaudio.net.